The Romance of Lust, a classic Victorian erotic novel by Anonymous. You are listening on YouTube channel named Let's Listen Something. Volume 1. Contents. The Novice Mrs. Benson Mary Mrs. Benson's Correspondence with Mrs. Edgerton Miss Evelyn Eliza. There were three of us Mary, Eliza, and myself. I was approaching 15, Mary was about a year younger, and Eliza between 12 and 13 years of age. Mama treated us all as children, and was blind to the fact that I was no longer what I had been. Although not tall for my age, nor outwardly presenting a manly appearance, my passions were awakening, and the distinctive feature of my sex, although in repose it looked magnificent enough, was very sufficiently developed when under the influence of feminine excitement. As yet, I had absolutely no knowledge of the uses of the different organs of sex. My sisters and I all slept in the same room. They together in one bed, I alone in another. When no one was present, we had often mutually examined the different formations of our sexes. We had discovered that mutual handlings gave a certain amount of pleasing sensation, and, latterly, my eldest sister had discovered that the hooding and unhooding of my doodle, as she called it, instantly caused it to swell up and stiffen as hard as a piece of wood. My feeling of her little pinky slit gave rise in her to nice sensations, but on the slightest attempt to insert even my finger, the pain was too great. We had made so little progress in the attachments that not the slightest inkling of what could be done in that way dawned upon us. I had begun to develop a slight growth of moss-like curls round the root of my cock, and then, to our surprise, Mary began to show a similar tendency. As yet, Eliza was as bald as her hand, but both were prettily formed, with wonderfully full and fat mounts of Venus. We were perfectly innocent of guile and quite habituated to let each other look at all our naked bodies without the slightest hesitation, and when playing in the garden, if one wanted to relieve the pressure on the bladder, we all squatted down together, and crossed waters, each trying who could piddle fastest. Notwithstanding these symptoms of passion when excited, in a state of calm I might have passed for a boy of ten or eleven. My father had left us but moderately provided for, and Mama, wishing to live comfortably, preferred giving me lessons along with my sisters at home to sending me to school, but her health beginning to fail, she inserted an advertisement in the Times for a governess. Out of a large number of applicants, a young lady, of the name of Evelyn, was selected. Some ten days afterwards she arrived, and became one of the family. We did not see much of her the first evening, but after breakfast the following morning, Mama accompanied her to what was considered our schoolroom, and said, Now, my dears, I place you under Miss Evelyn's care, you must obey her in all things, she will teach you your lessons, as I am unable to do so any longer. Then, turning to our new governess, I fear you will find them somewhat spoiled, and unruly, but there is a horse, and Susan will make you excellent birch rods whenever you require them. If you spare their bottoms when they deserve whipping, you will seriously offend me. As Mama said this, I observed Miss Evelyn's eyes appeared to dilate with a sort of joy, and I felt certain that, severely as Mama had often whipped us, if we should now deserve it, Miss Evelyn would administer it much more severely. She looked amiability itself and was truly beautiful in face and person, twenty-two years of age, full and finely formed, and dressed always with the most studied neatness. She was, in truth, a seductive creature. She made an instantaneous impression on my senses. There was, however, somewhat of a sternness of expression, and a dignity of carriage, which caused at once to fear and respect her. Of course, at first, all went smoothly enough, and seeing that Mama treated me precisely as she did my sisters, I came to be regarded as quite a child by Miss Evelyn. She found that she had to sleep in the same room with my sisters and myself. 
I fancied that on the first night Miss Evelyn did not approve of this arrangement, but gradually became familiarized with it, and seemed to think no more about it. When bedtime came, we all kissed Mama and retired early, as usual. Miss Evelyn followed some hours later. When she came in, she carefully locked the door, then looked at me to see if I was asleep. Why, I know not, but I was instinctively prompted to feign sleep. I did so successfully, notwithstanding the passing of the candle before my eyes. So she at once commenced undressing. When her back was turned, I opened my eyes, and greedily devoured her naked charms as they were gradually exhibited before me. The moment she turned round, I was again as if asleep. I have said that my passions had begun to develop themselves, but as yet I did not understand their force or direction. I well remember this first night, when a fine ripe woman gradually removed every particle of dress within a couple of yards of me the effect of each succeeding charm, from her lovely and beautifully formed bubbies to the taking off her shoes and stockings from her well-formed legs and small feet and ankles, caused my prick to swell and stiffen to a painful extent. When all but her chemise was removed, she stopped to pick up her petticoats that she had allowed to fall to her feet, and in lifting them, raised also her chemise, and exposed to my view a most glorious bottom dazzlingly white and shining like satin. As the light was full upon it, and she was still in a stooping position, I could see that below her slit she was well covered with dark hair. Turning round, to put her petticoats on a chair, and to take up her nightgown, she slipped her chemise from her arm, and letting it fall to the ground while she lifted the nightgown over her head, I had for some seconds a view of her beautiful belly, thickly covered with dark curly hair over the Mount of Venus. So voluptuous was the sight, I almost shuddered, so intense was my excitement. She now sat down on the bed to take off her shoes and stockings. Oh! What beautiful thighs, legs, ankles, and feet she had! I am now advanced in life, and have had many handsome and well-formed women, but I never saw limbs more voluptuously formed. In a few minutes the light was extinguished, and a rushing rill flowed into the night vase, very different from the gentle tricklings from myself and sisters as we often squatted down opposite each other and crossed water, laughing at the different sources from which they flowed. My sisters often envied me the power of directing the spurt where I pleased, so little were we from dreaming of the real intent of that projecting little instrument. I heard the charming creature get into bed, and shortly breathe hard. As for me, I could not sleep. I lay awake the greater part of the night, afraid to be restless, lest I should disturb Miss Evelyn and give her reason to think I had been observant of her undressing. When at last I dozed off, it was but to dream of all the charms I had seen. About a month passed thus. Every night Miss Evelyn became more and more at her ease, and confident of my mere childishness, often gave me glorious and lengthened glimpses of her beautifully developed charms, although it was only about every other night that I could enjoy them, for, as they always produced sleeplessness afterwards, the following night nature assured her rights, and I usually slept profoundly when I would have preferred continued gazing on the charms of my lovely governess. But, doubtless, those exhausting sleeps helped to throw her off her guard, and gave me better opportunities than I should otherwise have had. Once or twice she used the nightwear before putting on her nightgown, and I could see the rosy-lipped opening embosomed in exquisite dark curls, pouring out its full measure of water, showing a fine force of nature, and driving me wild with excitement. Yet it is singular that I never once thought of applying to my fingers for relief from the painful stiffness that nearly burst my prick asunder. Whether Mama had observed my very frequent projection of my trousers, or began to think it better I should not sleep in the same room as Miss Evelyn, I cannot say, but she had my bed removed into her own. However, I was so thoroughly treated as a mere boy by everyone in the house, that Miss Evelyn seemed to forget my sex, 
and there was at all times a freedom of carriage and an abandon in her attitudes that she certainly would not have indulged in if she had felt any restraint from considering herself in the presence of a youth of the age of puberty. In cold weather I used to sit on a low stool by the fire Miss Evelyn was seated in front, I had my lesson book on my knee, and she herself would place her beautiful feet on the high school fender, with her work in her lap, while she heard my sisters repeat their lesson, totally unconscious that for half an hour at a time she was exposing her beautiful legs and thighs to my ardent gaze, for sitting much below her, and bending my head as if intent on my lesson, my eyes were below her raised. Petticoats Her close and tight-fitting white stockings displayed her well-formed legs, for while confined to the house during our morning lessons she did not wear drawers, so that in the position she sat in, with her knees higher than her feet on the already high fender, and her legs somewhat apart to hold her work in her lap more easily, the whole glorious underswell of both thighs, and the lower part of her fine large bottom, with the pinky slit quite visible, nestled in a rich profusion of dark curls, were fully exposed to my view. The light from the fire glancing under her raised petticoats tinged the hole with a glow, and set me equally in a blaze of desire until I was almost ready to faint. I could have rushed headlong under her petticoats, and kissed and fondled that delicious opening and all its surroundings. Oh, how little she thought of the passion she was raising. Oh. Dear Miss Evelyn, how I did love you from the dainty kid slipper and tight glossy silk stocking, up to the glorious swell of the beautiful bubbies that were so fully exposed to me nearly every night, and the lovely lips of all that I longed to lovingly embrace. Thus day after day passed away, and Miss Evelyn became to me a goddess, a creature whom, in my heart of hearts, I literally worshipped. When she left the schoolroom, and I was alone, I kissed that part of the fender her feet had pressed, and the seat on which she sat, and even the air an inch above imagination placing there her lovely cunt. I craved for something beyond this without knowing exactly what I wanted, for, as yet, I really was utterly ignorant of anything appertaining to the conjunction of the sexes. One day I had gone up to my sister's bedroom where the governess slept, that I might throw myself on her bed, and in imagination embrace her beautiful body. I heard someone approaching, and knowing that I had no business there, I hid myself under the bed. The next moment Miss Evelyn herself entered, and locked the door. It was about an hour before dinner. Taking off her dress, and hanging it on the wardrobe, she drew out a piece of furniture, which had been bought for her, the use of which had often puzzled me, she took off the lid, poured water into its basin, and placed a sponge near it. She then took off her gown drew her petticoats and chemise up to her waist and fastened them there, straddled across it, and seated herself upon it. I thus had the intoxicating delight of gazing on all her beautiful charms, for when she tucked up her clothes she stood before her glass, presenting to my devouring glance her glorious white bottom in all its fullness, turning to approach the bidet, she equally exposed her lower belly and beautiful mount, with all its wealth of hair. While straddling over the bidet before she sat down, the whole of her pinky-lipped cunt broke on my enraptured sight. Never shall I forget the wild excitement of the moment. It was almost too much for my excited senses, fortunately, when seated, the immediate cause of my almost madness vanished. She sponged herself well between the thighs for about five minutes. She then raised herself off the bidet and for a moment again displayed the pouting lips of her cunt then stood fronting me for two or three minutes while she removed, with the rinsed sponge, the trickling drops of water which still gathered on the rich bush of curls around her quim. Thus her belly, mount and thighs, whose massy fleshed and most voluptuous shape were more fully seen by me than they had heretofore been, and it may easily be conceived into what a state such a deliberate view threw me. Oh. Miss Evelyn, dear, delicious Miss Evelyn. What would you have thought had you known that I was gazing on all your angelic charms, 
and that my eager eyes had been straining themselves to penetrate the richness of those charming pouting lips which lay so snugly in that rich mass of dark curling hair. Oh! How I do long to kiss them, for at that time I had no other idea of embracing and still less of penetrating them. When her ablutions were completed, she sat down and drew off her stockings, displaying her beautiful white calves and charming little feet. I believe it was this first admiration of really exquisitely formed legs, ankles and feet, which were extraordinarily perfect in make, that first awakened my passion for those objects, which have since always exercised a peculiar charm over me. She was also so particularly neat in her shoes little dark ones that were bijou to look at, I often took them up and kissed them, when left in the room. Then her silk stockings, always drawn up tight and fitting like a glove, set off to the greatest advantage the remarkable fine shape of her legs. Putting on silk for cotton stockings, she took down a low bodice dress, finished her toilet, and left the room. I crawled out from under the bed, washed my face and hands in the water of the bidet, and even drank some in my excitement. Some six weeks had now elapsed since the arrival of Miss Evelyn. The passion that had seized me for her had so far kept me most obedient to her slightest command, or even wish, and, from the same cause, attentive to my lessons, when not distracted by the circumstances already detailed. My example had also had the effect of keeping my sisters much in the same groove, but it was impossible this could last it was not nature. As long as all went smoothly, Miss Evelyn seemed to be all amiability. We fancied we could do as we liked, and we grew more careless. Miss Evelyn became more reserved, and cautioned us at first, and then threatened us with the rod. We did not think she would make use of it. Mary grew impertinent, and one afternoon turned sulky over her lessons, and set our teacher at defiance. Miss Evelyn, who had been growing more and more angry, had her rise from her seat. She obeyed with an impudent leer. Seizing her by the arm, Miss Evelyn dragged the struggling girl to the horse. My sister was strong and fought hard, using both teeth and nails, but it was to no purpose. The anger of our governess was fully roused, and raising her in her arms, she carried her forcibly to the horse, placed her on it, held her firmly with one hand while she put the noose round her with the other, which, when drawn, secured her body, other nooses secured each ankle to rings in the floor, keeping her legs apart by the projection of the horse, and also forcing the knees to bend a little, by which the most complete exposure of the bottom, and, in fact, of all her private parts too, was obtained. Miss Evelyn then left her, and went to Mama for a rod. In a few minutes she returned, evidently flushed with passion, and P.R.O.C.A.ed to tie Mary's petticoats well up to her waist, leaving her bottom and her pinky slit quite bare and exposed directly before my eyes. It was quite two months since I had seen her private parts, and I was well surprised to observe the lips more pouting and swelled out, as well as the symptoms of a mossy covering of the mount much more developed. Indeed, it was in itself more exciting than I had expected, for my thoughts had so long dwelt only on the riper beauties of Miss Evelyn that I had quite ceased to have any toying with Mary. This full view of all her private parts reawakened former sensations and strengthened them. Miss Evelyn first removed her own scarf, laying bare her plump ivory shoulders, and showing the upper halves of her beautiful bubbies, which were heaving with the excitement of her anger. She bared her fine right arm, and grasping the rod, stepped back and raised her arm, her eyes glistened in a peculiar way. She was indeed beautiful to see. I shall never forget that moment it was but a moment. The rod whistled through the air and fell with a cruel cut on poor Mary's plump little bottom, the flesh quivered again, and Mary, who had resolved not to cry, flushed in her face, and bit the damask with which the horse was covered. Again the arm was raised, and again, with a sharp whistle, it fell on the palpating buttocks below it. Still her stubborn temper bore her up, 
and although we saw how she winced, not a sound escaped her lips. Drawing back a step, Miss Evelyn again raised her hand and arm, and this time her aim was so true that the longer points of the rod doubled between the buttocks and concentrated themselves between the lips of Mary's privates. So agonizing was the pain that she screamed out dreadfully. Again the rod fell precisely on the same spot. Oh, oh, oh. Dear Miss Evelyn. I will never, no, never, do so again. Her shrieks were of no avail. Cut succeeded cut, yell succeeded yell until the rod was worn to a stump, and poor Mary's bottom was one mass of wheels and red as raw beef. It was fearful to see, and yet such is our nature that to see it was, at the same time, exciting. I could not keep my eyes from her pouting quim, the swelling lips of which, under the severity of the punishment it was undergoing, not only seemed to thicken, but actually opened and shut, and evidently throbbed with agony. But all this was highly exciting for me to witness. I then and there resolved to have a closer inspection at a more convenient opportunity, which did not fail me in the end. Meanwhile, her spirit was completely cowed, or rather, crushed. Indeed, we were all fully frightened, and now knew what we had to expect, if we did not behave ourselves. There was now no fear of any manifestation of temper, and we felt we must indeed obey implicitly whatever our governess chose to order. We instinctively learned to fear her. A very few days after this memorable whipping, some visitors arrived a gentleman and lady. The gentleman was an old friend of Mama's, who had lately married, and Mama had asked them to visit her on their wedding tour and spent a short time with us. The gentleman was a fine-looking man, tall and powerfully built, the lady rather delicate-looking, but well-shaped, with good breasts and shoulders, small waist and spreading haunches, well-formed arms, small hands and feet, and very brilliant eyes. I think it was about three days after their arrival that one afternoon I went into the spare room, which was occupied by these visitors, while there, I heard them coming upstairs. The lady entered first, and I had just time to slip into a closet and draw the door to, it was not quite closed, but nearly so. In a minute the gentleman followed, and gently shutting the door, locked it. Mrs. Benson smiled, and said, Well, my love, you are a sad teaser, you let me have no rest. Surely, you had enough last night and this morning without wanting it again so soon. Indeed, I had not, he said, I never can have enough of your delicious person. So come, we must not be long about it, or our absence will be observed. He seized her round the waist, and drew her lips to his, and gave her a long, long kiss, squeezing her to him, and moving himself against her. Then seating himself, he pulled her on his knee and thrust his hand up her petticoats, their mouths being glued together for some time. We must be quick, dear, she murmured. He got up, and lifted her on the edge of the bed, threw her back, and taking her legs under his arms, exposed everything to my view. She had not so much hair on her mount of Venus as Miss Evelyn, but her slit showed more pouting lips, and appeared more open. Judge of my excitement when I saw Mr. Benson unbutton his trousers and pull out an immense cock. Oh, dear, how large it looked, it almost frightened me. With his fingers he placed the head between the lips of Mrs. Benson's sheath, and then letting go his hold, and placing both arms so as to support her legs, he pushed it all right into her to the hilt at once. I was thunderstruck that Mrs. Benson did not shriek with agony, it did seem such a large thing to thrust right into her belly. However, far from screaming with pain, she appeared to enjoy it. Her eyes glistened, her face flushed, and she smiled most graciously on Mr. B. The two appeared very happy. His large cock slipped in and out quite smoothly, and his hands pressed the large glossy buttocks and pulled them to him at each home thrust. 
This lasted nearly five minutes, when all at once Mr. B stopped short, and then followed one or two convulsive shoves he grinning in a very absurd way at her. He remained quiet for a few minutes, and then drew out his cock, all soft, with slimy drops falling from it onto the carpet. Taking a towel, he wiped up the carpet, and wrapping it round his cock, went to the basin and washed it. Mrs. Benson lay for a few minutes longer all exposed, her quim more open than before, and I could see a white slime oozing from it. You can hardly imagine the wild excitement this scene occasioned me. First, the grand mystery was at once explained to me, and my ignorant longings now knew to what they tended. After giving me plenty of time to realize all the beauties of her private parts, she slipped down on the floor, adjusted her petticoats, and smoothed the disordered counterpane, and then went to the glass to arrange her hair. This done, she quietly unlocked the door, and Mr. Benson went out. The door was then relocked, and Mrs. B went to the basin, emptied and filled it, then raised up her petticoats, and bathed the parts between her legs with a sponge, and then rubbed all dry with a towel, all this time exposing everything to my ardent gaze. But, horror of horrors. She after this came straight to the closet and gave a slight scream on discovering me there. I blushed up to the ears, and tried to stammer out an excuse. She stared at me at first in silent amazement, but at last said. How came you here, sir, tell me. I was here when you came up, I wanted my football, which was in this closet, and when I heard you coming, I hid myself, I don't know why. For some minutes she seemed to consider and examine me attentively. She then said. Can you be discreet? Oh, yes. Ma'am. You will never tell anyone what you have seen. No ma'am. Well, keep this promise, and I shall try what I can do to reward you. Now, go downstairs. I went to the schoolroom, but I was greatly agitated, I scarcely knew what I was doing. The scene I had witnessed had complete possession of my thoughts. In years but a boy. The mystery now practically explained to me had awakened all the passions of a man. Instead of studying my lessons, my thoughts wandered to Mrs. B, thrown back on the bed with her fine legs and thighs fully exposed, above all, the sight of the pinky gash, with its fleecy hair at the bottom of her belly, which I had seen for some minutes all open and oozing out the slimy juice that followed the amorous encounter they had been indulging in. It seemed so much more developed than Miss Evelyn's. I felt sure that Miss Evelyn could never take in such a thick long thing as Mr. B had thrust into his wife, and yet it appeared to go in so easily, and moved about so smoothly, and so evidently to the satisfaction and utmost delight of both, as was proved by their ardent embracings, fond murmurs and voluptuous movements, especially just before they both ceased together all movement whatever. Then I thought, how delicious it would be to treat Miss Evelyn in the same way, and to revel with my stiff standing prick in her delicious quim, which in my mind's eye I saw before me as I had viewed it on her rising from the bidet, when I lay hid under the bed. Then I thought of my sister Mary's smaller, although attractive little quim, and I resolved, as that was the easiest to get hold of, to initiate her in all the newly discovered mysteries. I fully determined that my own first lesson, as well as hers, should be taken on her little fat chubby cunt. Then the recollection of its pouting and throbbing lips under the fearful flagellation she had undergone, began to excite me, and made my cock stand stiff and throb again. All the weeks of excitement I had now constantly been under had produced a wonderful effect on my pigo, which had become considerably more developed when in a state of erection. As you may suppose, with such distracting thoughts, I did not get on with my lessons. Miss Evelyn, for some reason or other, was out of humor that morning, and more than once spoke crossly to me for my evident inattention. At length she called me to her, and finding that I had scarcely done anything, she said. Now, Charles, 
I give you ten minutes longer to finish that sum, if not done in that time I shall whip you, you are exhibiting the mere spirit of idleness. I do not know what has come over you, but if persisted in, you shall certainly be punished. The idea of the beautiful Miss Evelyn whipping my bare bottom did not tend to calm my excitement, on the contrary, it turned my lewd thoughts upon the beauties of her person, which I had so often furtively gazed upon. It was close upon four o'clock, at which hour we always broke up for a run in the garden for an hour, and during this period I had resolved to begin instructing Mary in the secret mysteries I had so lately been a witness to. But fate had ordered it otherwise, and I was to receive my first practical lesson and be initiated on the person of a riper and more beautiful woman, but of this hereafter. At four o'clock I had done nothing with my task Miss Evelyn looked grave. Mary and Eliza, you may go out, Charles will remain here. My sisters, simply imagining that I was kept to finish my lessons, ran into the garden. Miss Evelyn turned the key in the door, opened a cupboard, and withdrew a birch rod neatly tied up with blue ribbons. Now my blood coursed through my veins, and my fingers trembled so that I could hardly hold my pencil. Put down your slate, Charles, and come to me. I obeyed, and stood before my beautiful governess, with a strange commixture of fear and desire. Unfasten your braces, and pull down your trousers. I commenced doing this, though but very slowly. Angry at my delay her delicate fingers speedily accomplished the work. My trousers fell to my feet. Place yourself across my knees. Tremblingly, with the same commixture of feeling, I obeyed. Her silk dress was drawn up to prevent its being creased my naked flesh pressed against her snowy white petticoats. A delicate perfume of violet and vervain assailed my nerves. As I felt her soft and delicate fingers drawing up my shirt, and passing over my bare posteriors, while the warmth of her pulpy form beneath me penetrated my flesh, nature exerted her power, and my prick began to swell out to a most painful extent. I had but little time, however, to notice this before a rapid succession of the most cruel cuts lacerated my bottom. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, Miss Evelyn. I will do the sum if you will only forgive me. Oh, 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 and see. Holding me firmly with her left arm, Miss Evelyn used the rod most unmercifully. At first, the pain was excruciating, and I roared out as loud as I could, but gradually the pain ceased to be so acute, and was succeeded by the most delicious tickling sensation. My struggles at first had been so violent as to greatly disorder Miss Evelyn's petticoats, and to raise them up so as to expose to my delighted eyes her beautifully formed silk-clad legs up to the knees, and even an inch or two of naked thigh above. This, together with the intense tickling irritation communicated to my bottom, as well as to the friction of my cock against the person of Miss Evelyn in my struggles, rendered me almost delirious, and I tossed and pushed myself about on her knees in a state of perfect frenzy as the blows continued to be showered down upon my poor bottom. At last the rod was worn to a stump, and I was pushed off her knees. As I rose before her, with my cheeks streaming with tears, my shirt was jutting out considerably in front in an unmistakable and most prominent manner, and my prick was at the same time throbbing beneath it with convulsive jerks which I could by no means restrain. Miss Evelyn glared at the projection in marked astonishment, and her open eyes were fixed upon it as I stood rubbing my bottom and crying, without attempting to move or button up my trousers. She continued for a minute or two to stare at the object of attraction, flushing scarlet up to the forehead, and then she suddenly seemed to recollect herself, drew a heavy breath, and rapidly left the room. She did not return until after my sisters came back from the garden, and seemed still confused, and avoided fixing her eye upon me. In two days afterwards, all disagreeable marks of this very severe whipping had disappeared. On the following day we were invited to pass the afternoon at the Grange, 
a beautiful place about two miles from us. The afternoon was fine and warm, we walked there, and arrived about four o'clock. Mr. and Mrs. Robinson were in the drawing room, but at once desired us to go in the garden and amuse ourselves with their three daughters, whom we would find there. We went at once, and found them amusing themselves on a swing. Sophia, the eldest, about nineteen, was swinging a sister about two years younger, a very fine, fully developed young woman. Indeed, all three sisters were finer women and more beautiful than the average of young ladies. Another sister, Agnes, was not seated, but standing on the board between the ropes. Sophia was making both mount as high as possible. They were laughing loudly, when we found them, at the exposure each made one in advancing, the other retiring. Agnes's light dress of muslin and single petticoat, as she retired and the wind came up from behind, was bulged out in front, and exposed her limbs up to her belly, so that one could see that her mount was already well furnished. The other, in advancing, threw her legs up, and exposed all the underside of her thighs and a part of her bottom, and you could just discern that there was dark hair between the lower thighs and bottom. As they considered me but a child, I was no check to their mirth and sport. On the contrary, they gave me a long rope to pull down the swing when at its highest, and I sat down on the grass in front for greater convenience. The fine limbs and hairy quims exposed freely before me from moment to moment excited my passions. None of them wore more than one petticoat, and they had no drawers, so that when they mounted to the highest point from me, I had the fullest possible view of all. My cock soon rose to a painful extent, which I really believe was noticed and enjoyed by them, I observed, too, that I was an object of attention to Miss Evelyn, who shortly seated herself in the swing, and allowed me to swing her with the end of the rope. I even fancied that she threw up her legs more than was at all necessary, at all events, she naturally, with the strong feelings I had towards her, excited me more than all the rest. We were as merry as could be, and we passed a delightful evening until eight o'clock, when it began to rain. As it continued, and became very heavy, Mr. Robinson ordered out the closed carriage to take us home. It was a brougham, only seated for two. Mary took Eliza on her knee, Miss Evelyn took me upon hers. I know not how it happened, but her lovely arm soon passed round my body as if to hold me on her knee, and her hand fell, apparently by accident, exactly on my cock the touch was electric. In an instant, my member stood stiff and strong beneath her hand. Still Miss Evelyn, who must have felt the movement going on beneath her fingers, did not remove her hand, but rather seemed to press more upon it. In my boyish ignorance, I imagined she was not aware of what was happening. The motion and jolting of the carriage over rough road caused her hand to rub up and down upon my erected and throbbing member. I was almost beside myself and to conceal my condition I feigned sleep. I let my head fall on Miss Evelyn's shoulder and neck she allowed this. Whether she thought I had really fallen asleep I know not, but I was quite sensible that her fingers pressed my swollen and throbbing cock, and I fancied she was measuring its size. The tight grasp she managed to gain, and the continued jolting of the carriage, brought me up at last to such a pitch state that a greater jolt than usual, repeated two or three times in succession, each followed by a firmer pressure of her charming fingers, caused me such an excess of excitement that I actually swooned away with the most delicious sensation I had ever experienced in my life. I was some time before I knew where I was, or what I was about, and was only made conscious of our arrival at home by Miss Evelyn shaking me to rouse me up. I stumbled up, but though partially stupefied, I fancied Miss Evelyn's eyes shone with a brilliancy I had never before observed, and that there was a bright hectic flush on her cheek. She refused to go into the parlor, but hurried to bed on pretense of a headache. When I retired to bed, and took off my shirt, I found it all sticky and wet in front. 
It was thus I paid down my first tribute to Venus. I thought long over this evident approach to familiarity on the part of Miss Evelyn, and went to sleep with a lively hope of a more private interview with her, when I trusted that her evident passion would initiate me in the pleasures to be derived from her beauteous body. But again fate intervened, and another, not less beautiful, more experienced, and more inclined for the sport, was to be my charming mistress in love's revels. Two days after this, Mr. Benson was unexpectedly called away on pressing affairs, which he feared might detain him three weeks. He left Mrs. B with us. As he had to be driven about nine miles to the town where the coach passed, Mama took the opportunity of going to the town with him. Mrs. B complained of not being equal to the fatigue, and Mama told Miss Evelyn she would like her company, and as the two girls wanted new shoes, they could go also, I was to remain at home, and Mama desired me to be quiet and attentive to Mrs. Benson, who, observing no one, said to me, with a peculiar look, I shall want you to hold my skeins, Charlie, so don't go out of the way, but be ready for me as soon as they are gone. She then went up to her bedroom, where Mr. B immediately joined her, no doubt to reenact the scene I had already witnessed from the closet on a previous day. They were fully half an hour occupied together. At length, all was ready, and off they went, leaving me to a fate I had little dreamt of. Mrs. B proposed we should go up to the drawing room, which looked out to the garden, and was nowhere overlooked. I followed her, and could not help admiring her fine figure as she preceded me in going upstairs. Although pale in complexion, she was well made, and very elegant in her carriage, and sat down on a low easy chair, throwing herself completely back, and crossing one leg over the other, apparently without being aware that she carried her petticoats up with the action, and exhibited the beautiful underleg up to the garter. I had never forgotten the day, when secreted in the closet, I had seen them completely exposed, and how charming they were. Her present negligent attitude, although far from the same exposure I speak of, was still, with the former recollection running in my head, enough to set my whole blood on fire. I have before remarked what a power beautiful and well-stockinged legs, and ankles and small feet, had upon my nervous system, and so it was now. As I gazed upon her handsome legs, ankles, and feet, I felt my prick swell and throb in a manner that could not fail to be perceptible to Mrs. B, especially as her head lay on a level with that part of my person as I stood before her. Although she continued knitting, I could see that her eyes were directed to that part of my person, and fixed upon the increasing distension of my trousers. In a few minutes she gave me a skein of worsted to hold, and desired me to kneel in front of her, so as to bring my hands down to the level of the low chair on which she was seated. I knelt close to the footstool on which her foot rested, it was raised up, and a very slight movement brought it against my person, at first rather below where my throbbing prick was distending my trousers. As she commenced to wind her ball, she gradually pushed her foot further forward, until the toe actually touched the knob of my cock, and occasionally moved it right and left, exciting me beyond measure. I flushed up to the very ears, and trembled so violently that I thought I should have dropped the skein. My dear boy, what is the matter with you, that you blush and tremble so, are you unwell? I could not answer blushed more than ever. The skein at length was finished. Charles, she said, get up, and come here. I rose and stood by her side. What have you got in your trousers that is moving? And here her busy fingers commenced unbuttoning them. Released from confinement, out started my prick stiff as iron, and as large as that of a youth of eighteen. Indeed. I was better hung than one boy selected out of five hundred of that age. Mrs. B, who had pretended to be perfectly astonished, exclaimed. Good gracious, what a pico! Why Charles, my darling, you are a man not a boy. What a size to be sure, 
and she gently handled it. Is it often in this state? Yes, ma'am. For how long? Ever since Miss Evelyn came. And pray, sir, what has Miss Evelyn's coming had to do with it? I I I I. Come now, Charles, be candid with me, what is it you mean where you say Miss Evelyn has caused you to be in such a state, have you shown her this, and has she handled it? Oh, dear no, never, never. Is it her face, her bosom, or her legs that have captivated you? It was her feet and ankles, ma'am, with her beautiful legs, which she sometimes exhibited without knowing. And do all ladies' legs and ankles produce this effect upon you? Oh, yes, ma'am, if they are neat and pretty. And what make you so excited now? It was the sight of your beautiful legs just now, and the recollection of what I saw the other day, ma'am, I stammered out, blushing more than ever. While this conversation was going on, her soft hand grasped my distended prick, and had commenced slowly slipping the loose skin over the swollen head, and allowing it to slip back again. I suppose, Charles, after what you saw in the closet, you know what this is meant to do. I muttered out an indistinct reply that I did, and I hung down my blushing face. You have never put it into a lady, have you? Oh. Dear no, ma'am. Would you like to do so? I did not answer, but sheepishly held down my head. Did you see what I had in the same place, when you were in the closet? I muttered, yes, ma'am. Would it afford you any pleasure to see it again? Oh, yes, so much. Mrs. B. Rose, went to the window, drew down the blind then gently turned the key in the door. Returning to the chair, and drawing well up her dress, petticoats, and chemise, she exposed all her person up to the middle of her belly, and sat down stretching herself backwards, and opening her thighs well. Well, my dear boy, look at it if you wish. I was no longer shy. Nature prompted me to an act of gallantry that gratified the lady immensely. Falling on my knees, I glued my lips to the delicious spot, pushing my tongue in as far as I could, and sucked it. It was quite spunky, I had no doubt but that Mr. B had fucked her two or three times just before leaving. This, however, made no difference to me. The attack was as unexpected as it was delightful to the lady. She placed both hands on my head and pressed my face against her throbbing cunt. She was evidently hotly excited, not only by what I was then doing, but by the scene, the conversation, and the handling of my prick, which she had been indulging in. She wriggled her bottom nervously below me, I continued to greedily lick her moist and juicy cunt. Oh, oh, dear Charles, what exquisite delight you are giving me. Oh, oh. And she pressed my face more fully into the gaping sheath and thrusting her bottom up at the same time, spent right into my mouth, over my cheeks, chin, and neck. Her thighs closed convulsively round my head, and for some moments she remained still. I continued to lick away, and swallowed the delicious spunk that still flowed from her. At last she spoke again. Oh, you darling Charles, I love you forever, but get up. It is now my turn to give you a taste of the exquisite pleasure you have given me. I raised myself, and she drew me to her, and gave me a long kiss, licking her own sperm from off my lips and cheek, and desiring me to thrust my tongue into her mouth, she sucked it deliciously, while her soft hand and gentle fingers had again sought, found, and caressed my stiff standing prick. She then desired me to lay myself on the floor with three pillows to raise my head, and lifting up all her petticoats, and striding across me, with her back to my face, she knelt down, then stooping forward, she took my standing prick in her mouth, and at the same time lowering her buttocks, brought her beautiful cunt right over and down upon my mouth, the pillows exactly supporting my head at the proper level, 
to command a thorough enjoyment of the whole, which now I had completely before my eyes. In the former sucking my own position hid everything from view beyond the rich mass of hair adorning her splendid mount of Venus, which I found to be much more abundant than it had appeared to me when I had seen it from the closet. When I applied my lips to the delicious gap, I found that she had the most beautiful silky light curls running up to and around her charming pink bottom hole, and losing themselves in the chink between the buttocks. I applied myself furiously to the delicious gash, and sucked and thrust my tongue in alternately. I could see by the nervous twitching of her buttocks, and the bearing down of her whole bottom on my face, how much she was enjoying it. I, too, was in an ecstasy of delight. One hand gently frigged the lower portion of my prick, while the other played with my balls, and her beautiful mouth, lips, and tongue sucked, pressed, and tickled the head of my excited prick. The more furiously I sucked her cunt, the more her lips compressed the head of my pico, and her tongue sought to enter the urethra, giving me almost overpowering delight. Such reciprocal efforts soon brought on the ecstatic crisis, I cried out. Oh, lady, oh, dear lady, let me go, I am dying. She knew well enough what was coming, but she had her own way and at the instant that she again poured down upon my mouth and face a plenteous discharge, her own rosy mouth received a torrent of my sperm. For some minutes we lay mutually breathless and exhausted. Then Mrs. B. rose, shook down her clothes, assisted me to rise, and taking me in her arms, and pressing me lovingly to her bosom, told me I was a dear charming fellow, and had enraptured her beyond measure. She then embraced me fondly, kissing my mouth and eyes, and desiring me to give her my tongue, sucked it so sweetly. Now, fasten up your trousers, my darling boy. When I had done so, the blind was drawn up, and the door unlocked. We sat down, I by her side with one arm round her lovely neck, and the other clasped in her hand. I am sure I can depend upon your prudence my dear Charles, to keep all this a profound secret from everyone. Your mama thinks you a child, and will suspect nothing. I shall take an opportunity of suggesting that you shall sleep in the small room adjoining my bedroom, and with which there is a door of communication. When everyone is gone to bed, I shall open the door, and you shall come and sleep with me, and I will let you enjoy me as you saw Mr. B do the other day. Will you like that? Oh, above all things, oh, yes. But you must also allow me to kiss that delicious spot again that has just given me such pleasure. Will you not, ma'am? Oh, yes, my darling boy, whenever we can do so safely, and unobserved, but I must impress upon you never to seem very familiar with me before anyone or to take the slightest liberty unless I invite you to do so. Anything of the sort would certainly draw attention, and lead to our detection, and at once put an end to what I mean shall be a delightful connection for you as well as myself. I, of course, promised the most perfect obedience to her very prudent directions. The ice was broken, and we allowed no ceremony to stand between us. I grew again very excited and would fain have proceeded at once to try again to fuck her as well as suck her, but she was inexorable, and told me I should only spoil the pleasure we should afterwards have in bed. The day passed like an hour in her charming society. The carriage brought Mama and party to dinner. Mama hoped I had behaved well, and been attentive to Mrs. B in her absence. She answered nothing could be better and that I was quite a model youth so gentle and so obedient. My mother found that she had caught cold, and had febrile symptoms after dinner. Mrs. B persuaded her to retire to bed, and accompanied her. When in her room, she apparently noticed, for the first time, my little bed. She took the opportunity of suggesting that it would be much better to remove it to the small room, so as to leave my mother in perfect quiet which my coming to bed might disturb. This was said in such an innocent natural manner, 
that no suspicion was excited on the part of Mama or anybody else. Mama only making the objection that my early rising might by my noise disturb Mrs. B in the next room. Oh, no, I am not so easily disturbed, besides he has been so well behaved all day, that I am sure, if I tell him to be quiet in the morning, he will not fail to do so. So it was settled, and my bed was at once removed to the little room. I know not what Miss Evelyn thought of this, at any rate, she made no remark, and I went to bed early. It will easily be conceived that I did not go to sleep. The hours struck one after the other, and no appearance of my amiable instructress. The remembrance of all her charms was ever present to my mind's eye, and I longed once more to dart my tongue into her moist and juicy cunt, as well as to try the new method that was to initiate me into the real secrets of Venus. The long delay of her coming put me in a perfect fever. I tossed and tumbled in bed, my prick throbbed almost to bursting. Fortunately, I had never fricked myself, and that resource never occurred to me, or I might have rendered myself quite incapable of enjoying the raptures my beautiful benefactress afterwards entranced me with. At last I heard voices and footsteps on the stairs. Mrs. B bid Miss Evelyn good night, and the next minute her door was opened, closed again, and the key turned in the lock. I had taken the precaution to do so with my door. I heard her use the night vase, and then she opened my door, at once coming to my bedside. Seeing me awake and quite flushed, she kissed me, and whispered. Have you not been to sleep, Charles? No, ma'am, I answered, in the same subdued tone, I could not sleep. Why, dear boy? Because I was going to sleep with you. Her lips pressed mine and her soft hand, thrust under the clothes, sought for and caressed my stiff standing prick it was as hard as iron. Poor boy, I am afraid you have been suffering. How long has it been in this state? All the evening, ma'am, and I did think you were such a long time in coming. Well, Charles, I could not come sooner without causing suspicion I thought Miss Evelyn was suspicious so I pretended to have no desire to go to bed, and even when she showed evident symptoms of drowsiness after her long ride, I rallied her upon it, and begged her to sit up with me yet a little, until at last she could hold out no longer, and begged me to let her retire. I grumblingly complied, and she is thrown completely off any scent on our account, as she could never suppose I was impatient as you to come here. I shall undress as fast as possible, and then do my best to relieve you of this painful stiffness. Get up, shut this door, and come to my bed. My room has an inner bay's door, and we shall there be certain of not being overheard. I instantly complied, and she commenced undressing. Every detail of her charming toilet was devoured by my greedy eyes. Her smooth, glossy, and abundant hair arranged in braids, was neatly fastened in under a coquettish lace cap with pretty blue ribbons. Her chemise de nude of the finest, almost transparent cambric was edged with fine openwork. She looked divine. The drawers of the commode contained scent bags of that peculiar odor which is generally found to perfume. The persons of the most seductive women. In another moment she was in bed, clasping me in her arms. Now, Charles, you must be a good boy, and make no noise, and allow me to teach you your first love lesson, see I will lay myself down on my back, thus do you place yourself on your knees between my outspread thighs there, that is a darling now let me lay hold of your dear instrument. Now lay yourself down on me. I placed myself on her beautiful smooth and white belly and pressed against the hair of her mount. With her long taper fingers she guided my prick I trembled in every limb and almost felt sick with excitement but when I felt the delicious sensation caused by the insertion of my skinned pintle between the smooth warm oily folds of the lady's cunt I gave but one shove which carried me up so that I swooned away on her belly and milk white bosom. When I came to myself I still lay on her belly, enfolded in her lovely arms, 
my prick sheathed up to the cods in her delicious cunt, which was throbbing in the most ecstatic way and pressing and closing with every fold on my prick which had hardly lost any of its pristine stiffness, as my eyes began to discern her features, an exquisite smile played upon my darling companion's lips. You sad rogue, she whispered, you have given me a baby, what have you been doing to make you spend so soon, and in such a quantity? Did you like it? Oh, dearest madam, I have been in heaven surely no joy can be greater than you have given me. But you do not know as yet everything that is to be done, and to how much greater an extent the pleasure may be enhanced by mutual efforts, move your instrument gently in and out there, that is delicious, but not so fast. Good, is it not nice? And she moved in unison with me, meeting each slow thrust down by an equal movement upwards, and squeezing my prick in the most delicious manner internally, as she retired again to meet succeeding thrusts in the same way. Oh! It was ecstatic my prick, swollen to its utmost size, seemed to fill her exquisite vagina, which although capable of easily accommodating the larger prick of Mr. B, appeared to be sufficiently contracted to embrace tightly with its smooth and slippery folds my stiff throbbing prick. So we continued, I shoving myself into her, and she upheaving her beautiful bottom to meet me. My hands removed everywhere, and my mouth sucked her lips and tongue, or wandered over her pulpy breasts sucking their tiny nipples. It was a long bout indeed, prolonged by Mrs. Benson's instructions, and she enjoyed it thoroughly, encouraged me by every endearing epithet, and by the most voluptuous maneuvers. I was quite beside myself. The consciousness that I was thrusting my most private part into that part of a lady's person which is regarded with such sacred delicacy caused me to experience the most enraptured pleasure. Maddened by the intensity of my feeling I at length quickened my pace. My charming companion did the same, and we together yielded down a most copious and delicious discharge. Although I retained sufficient rigidity to keep him in his place, Mrs. B would not allow any further connection with her, and she made me withdraw, and bade me go to sleep like a good boy, and she would give me a further lesson in the morning. Finding that she was determined on this point, and that she disposed herself to slumber, I felt I was obliged to follow her example, and at last fell fast asleep. It might be about five in the morning, quite light at that time of year, when I awoke, and instead of finding myself, as usual, in my own little bed I found my arms round the person of a charming woman, whose large plump smooth bottom lay in my lap, pressing against my belly and thigh. I found my prick already in a rampant state, and it at once began throbbing and forcing its way between the delicious cheeks of her immense bottom, seeking the delightful sheath it had so enjoyed the previous part of the night. Whether Mrs. B, was asleep or not, I do not know, but am inclined to think she really was so, from the muttered mistake she made in waking. She was probably dreaming, for she mechanically raised her thighs. I pressed my prick stoutly forward against her luxurious body, knowing that the entrance to the temple of pleasure which had so entranced me the night before lay in that direction. I found more difficulties than I expected, but at length began to penetrate, although the orifice appeared much tighter than on the previous evening. Excited by the difficulties of entrance, I clasped the lady firmly round the waist and pushed forcibly and steadily forward. I felt the folds give way to the iron stiffness of my prick, and one half of it was fairly embedded in my extremely tight sheath. I put down my hand to press my prick a little downwards to facilitate the further entrance, you may imagine my astonishment when on so doing I found myself in the lady's bottom hole, instead of her cunt. This at once explained the difficulty of entrance. I was about to withdraw and place it in the proper orifice when a convulsive pressure of the sphincter caused me such exquisite satisfaction by the pressure of the folds on the more sensitive upper half of my prick, which was so delicious, and so much tighter and more exciting than my previous experience of the cunt that I could not resist the temptation of carrying the experiment to the end. Therefore, 
Thrusting my two fingers into her cunt, I pressed my belly forwards with all my might, and sheathed my prick in her bottom hole to its full extent. Mrs. B at this awoke, and exclaimed, Good heavens! Fred, you hurt me cruelly. I wish you would be content with my cunt, I shall be unable to walk tomorrow. You know it always has that effect. It is downright cruel of you but since you are in, stay quiet a little, and then continue to frig me with your fingers, as you know that eventually gives me great pleasure. She calls me Fred, what can she mean? I was, however, too agreeably situated to speculate on anything, but as I was now buried within her bottom hole, I lay quiet for a few minutes as she had requested, and as her complaints subsided, and I felt a slight reciprocating movement, I, too, moved within her, working at the same time my two fingers in her cunt. By this time she was wide awake, and became conscious of who was her bedfellow. What are you about, Charles? She exclaimed, Do you know where you are? I did not know I was doing anything wrong. Doing wrong, indeed. My, a lady's bottom hole was never intended for a pigo. How came you to put it in there? I cannot tell, I did not do it on purpose. I thought I was going into the same delightful place I was in last night. All this time I was moving my prick in and out of one aperture, and my fingers were working away in the other. The tightness of the sheath round my prick was delicious beyond anything I could conceive, and I think, from the way the lady conducted herself, she liked it as much as I did. At any rate, she permitted me to go on until I had a delicious discharge, and she herself spent all over my hand. When the bout was over, she jumped out of bed, went to the basin, and with a sponge purified herself. After which, she said, My dear boy, you had better come and wash yourself, too, and take care not to make a mistake of this kind again, as it is sometimes attended with disagreeable consequences. It was now perfect sunny daylight, and my enchanting mistress looked so lovely in her almost transparent cambric nightshirt that I was emboldened to ask her to let me see her perfectly naked in all her glorious beauty of form. She gratified me at once, but laughingly, pulled off my nightshirt, and said. I, too, must have the pleasure not only of contemplating your promising youthful charms, but of embracing your dear form disencumbered of all the superfluities of dress. We clasped each other in a most enrapturing embrace, and then my lovely and engaging companion allowed me to turn her in every direction so as to see, admire, and devour every charm of her exquisitely formed body. Oh! She was indeed beautiful shoulders broad, bosom, or rather upper neck, flat, not showing any projection of the collarbone, bubbies firm, well separated and round with most exquisite rosy nipples not much developed, a perfect waist, small naturally, with charming swelling hips, and an immense bottom it was almost out of proportion, large, but oh, how beautiful! Then her belly, undulating so enticingly, and swelling out, the lowest part into a very fine and prominent mons venerous, covered with a thick crop of silky and curly light hair, then the entrance to the grotto of Venus had such delicious pouting lips, rosy, but with hair still thick on each side, which is often not the case even with women who have a sufficient tuft above, how beautiful where it exists as it did in this charming and perfect woman, continuing in beautiful little curls not only, down to but around her lovely pinky and puckered little bottom hole, the delights of which I had already, in this infancy of my love education, tasted and enjoyed. Her two alabaster thighs, worthily supporting by their large well-rounded fleshy forms, the exquisite perfections of the upper body, I have already described. How beautiful, elegant and elongated her legs were, rising from well-turned ankles and most tiny beautiful feet. Her skin was white as milk, and dazzlingly fair and smooth. To my young eyes she was a perfect goddess of beauty. Even now, in advanced life, 
I can remember nothing that, as a whole surpassed her, although I have met many with points unsurpassingly beautiful some carry it in the bosom, some in the general carriage, some in the mount of Venus and bottom together, and some in legs and thighs, but this divine creature, without having the appearance of it when dressed, was, when stripped, perfect in all her parts as well as beautiful in face caressing and voluptuous. By nature, and lending herself, with the most enchanting graces to instruct me in all the mysteries of love, and let me say, of lust also. We caressed each other with such mutual satisfaction that nature soon drove us to a closer and more active union of the bodies. Fondly embracing one another, we approached the bed, and being equally excited threw ourselves upon it, and, in the exquisite contact of our naked flesh, enjoyed a long, long bout of love, in which my most charming companion exhibited all the resources of amorous enjoyment. Never shall I forget the luxury of that embrace. She checked my natural tendency to rush at once to a completion. I think we must have enjoyed the raptures of that embrace fully half an hour before bringing on the grand finale, in which my active companion showed the extraordinary suppleness of her delicious body by throwing her legs over my back, pushing my bottom forward with her heels, and raising and sinking her bottom in unison with each thrust of my terribly stiff prick, which seemed to swell and become thicker and harder than ever. In retiring from each thrust, her cunt seemed to close upon my prick with the force of a pair of pincers. We both came to the ecstatic moment at the same time, and both actually screamed with delight, my ardent mistress in her fury of excitement actually bit my shoulder and drew blood, but I felt it not I was in the seventh heaven of delight, and lay for long almost insensible on her beauteous body, clasped in her loving arms. On coming to our senses. Oh, my beloved boy, she said, never, never, have I experienced such pleasure. You are a perfect angel. I only fear I shall come to love you too much. We turned on our sides without dislodging the dear instrument of our enjoyment, and my lovely friend prattled on and delighted me with her toying, embracing, and gaiety. My prick had once more swelled up, and I wished to quietly enjoy a fuck in the luxurious position in which we lay, but my lovely friend said. That must not be, my dear Charles, I must consider your health. You have already done more than your age warrants, and you must rise and go to your bed to recover, by a sound sleep, your strength. But feel how strong I am, and I gave a forcible thrust into her glowing and well-moistened sheath. But, though she certainly was greatly excited, she suddenly turned round and unseated me, and drew away from me, refusing to take it again. As she was quite naked, the movements of her beauteous form were most graceful and enchanting, and one leg being thrown backwards left her lovely cunt full in view, and actually gaping open before me. Seized with the strongest desire to suck and kiss it, as I had done the night before, I begged that at least she would grant me that last favor, as it could not in any way do me harm. To this she readily consented, and lay down on her back, opening her glorious thighs, and with a pillow under her bottom so as to raise up her cunt into a better position for me to gama hutch her, as she called it. Before letting me begin, she said. My dear Charles, do you see that little projection at the upper part of my quim, that is my clitoris, and is the site of the most exquisite sensation, you see it is rather hard, even now, but you will find as you titillate it with your tongue or suck it, that it will become harder and more projecting, so apply your lips there. I did as my lovely mistress desired, and soon found it stiffen and stand up nearly an inch into my mouth. The convulsive twitches of her buttocks, the pressure forward of her hand on my head, all proved the exquisite felicity my lovely friend was enjoying. I slipped my hand under my chin the position was awkward, but I managed to thrust my thumb into her cunt. My forefinger was somewhat in the way but finding it exactly opposite the rosy hole of her bottom, and all being very moist there, I pushed it forward and it easily entered. I could not move my hand very actively, 
but I continued to gently draw my finger and thumb a little back together, and then thrust forward again. It seemed to add immensely to the pleasure I was giving her, her whole body quivered with excessive excitement. My head was pressed so firmly against her cunt that I had difficulty in breathing, but I managed to keep up the action of tongue and fingers until I brought on the exquisite crisis her buttocks rose, her hand pressed hard on my head and her two powerful and fleshy thighs closed on my cheeks on each side and fixed me as if in a vice, while she poured down into my mouth and all over my chin, neck and hand a perfect rush of sperm, and then lay in convulsive movements of enjoyment, hardly knowing what she was doing. As she held me so fast in every way, I continued to lick up the delicious discharge, and continued at the same time to pass my tongue over her clitoris. This, by producing a new excitement, brought her senses round. So relaxing her hold of me with her thighs she said, Oh, my darling Charles, come up to my arms that I may kiss you for the exquisite delight you have given me. I did so, but took care in drawing myself up, to engroove my stiff standing prick in the well moistened open cunt that lay raised on a pillow so conveniently in the way. Oh, you sad traitor, cried my sweet companion. No, I cannot, I must not allow it, but I held her tight round the waist, and her position was too favorable for me to be easily unhorsed. Ah, you must not, my dear boy. If you will not consider yourself, consider me. I shall be quite exhausted. I shut her mouth with my kisses and tongue, and soon the active movements I was making within her charming vagina exercised their usual influence on her lubricity, so as to make her as eager for the fray as myself. Stop, my dear Charles, and you shall have it in a new position, which will give you as much more pleasure as it will me. You are not going to cheat me, are you? Oh, no, my darling, I am now as much on fire as you are withdraw. I obeyed, half in fear. My fair mistress turned herself round, and getting on her hands and knees, presented to my ardent gaze her magnificent bottom. I thought she meant me to once more put it into the rosy little orifice, and said so. Oh, no, she replied, not there, but putting her hand under her belly, and projecting it backwards between her thighs, she said. Give it me and I will guide it into the proper place. Before doing so I stooped forward and pushing my face between the glorious cheeks of her bottom, sought and found the lovely little orifice, kissed it, and thrust my tongue in. Oh, don't Charles, dear, you tickle me so, then flinching, and squeezing her buttocks together, I had nothing for it but to put my prick in her hand. She immediately guided it to and engulfed it in her burning cunt up to the very hair. I found I apparently got in fully an inch further this way the position also gave my beautiful instructress more power of pressure on my prick than her glorious buttocks, heaving under my movements, and exposed in all their immensity, was most exciting and beautiful. I seized her below the waist with a hand upon each hip pressing her magnificent backside against me each time that I thrust forward. Oh! It was indeed glorious to see. I was beside myself, and furious with the excitement the view of all these charms produced upon me. My charming mistress seemed equally to enjoy it, as was evinced by the splendid movements of her body, till at last overcome by the grand finale, she sank forward on her belly, and I followed on her back without losing the position of my throbbing prick within her. We both lay for some time incapable of movement, but the internal squeezing and convulsive pressure of her cunt on my softened, but still enlarged prick, were exquisite beyond imagining. At last she begged me to relieve her. Getting out of bed, she sighed deeply, kissed me tenderly, and said, My dear Charles, we must not be so extravagant in future, it will destroy us both come, let me see you to your bed. The sight of my lovely mistress standing naked in all the glory of her beauty and perfection of form began to have its usual effect upon my prick, which showed symptoms of raising his head again, she gave it a pat, 
stooped down, and for a moment plunged its head into her beautiful mouth, then seizing my nightshirt, she threw it over my head and conducted me to my own bed, put me in, tucked me up, and tenderly kissing me, left the room, first unlocking my door and then locking the door of communication between the two rooms. Thus passed the first glorious night of my initiation into all the rites of Venus, and at the hands of a lovely, fresh, and beautiful woman, who had only been married long enough to make her a perfect adept in the art. Never, oh never, have I passed such a night. Many and many a fine woman, perfect too in the art of fucking, have I enjoyed, but the novelty and the charm, the variety and the superiority of the teacher, all combined to make this night the N.E. plus ultra of erotic pleasure. It need not be said that, exhausted by the numerous encounters I had in love's battlefield, I fell into a deep and sound sleep, until aroused by being rudely shaked up. I opened my eyes in astonishment. It was my sister Mary. She threw her arms round my neck, and kissing me, said, You lazy boy, do you know they are all down at breakfast, and you still asleep? What has come over you? Oh. I said, I got frightened with a horrible dream, and lay awake so long afterwards that when I did sleep, I overslept myself. Well, get up at once, and pulling the clothes quite off me, she laid bare my whole private parts, with my cock, as usual in youth on waking, at full stand. Oh. Charlie, said Mary, fixing her eyes upon it in astonishment at its thickness and length. How your doodle has grown, and she laid hold of it. Why it is as hard as wood, and see how red its head is. Without her. Knowing why, it evidently had its natural effect on her sense, and she flushed as she squeezed it. Ah, my dear Mary, I have learned a great secret about that thing, which I will tell you the first time we can be quite alone and secure from interruption. Just now there is no time, but before you go downstairs, let me see how your poor little Fanny is. We had been used to these infantile expressions when in our ignorance and innocence we had mutual examinations of the difference of our sexes, and my sister was still as ignorant and innocent as ever. So when I said that I had not seen it since it was so ill-treated in the terrible whipping she had received from Miss Evelyn, she at once pulled up all her petticoats for me to look at it. Lie back for a moment on the bed. She complied. I was delighted. The prominence her mons veneris had assumed, the increased growth of moss-like little curls, and the pouting lips of her tiny slit all was most promising and charming. I stooped and kissed it, licking her little prominent clitoris with my tongue, it instantly hardened, and she gave a convulsive twitch of her loins. Oh! Charlie, how nice it is! What is it you are doing? Oh, how nice! Oh! Pray go on. But I stopped, and said. Not at present, my darling sister, but when we can get away together I will do that and something much better, all connected with the great secret I have got to tell you. So run downstairs, and tell them why I had overslept myself, but not a word to anyone about what I have told you. I will be down in a trice. She went away, saying. Oh. Charlie, dear, what you did just now was so nice, and has made me feel so queer, do find an early opportunity of telling me all about it. Very few minutes suffice to finish my toilet and bring me to the breakfast table. Why, Charlie, broke out my mother, what is this horrid dream? I can hardly tell you, my dear mother, it was so confused, but I was threatened to be murdered by horrid looking men and at last taken to high rocks and thrown down. The agony and fright awoke me, screaming, and all over perspiration. I could not sleep for hours after, even though I hid my head under the clothes. Poor child, said Mrs. Benson, who was quietly eating her breakfast. What a fright you must have had. Yes, ma'am, 
and at the same time, as I awoke with a scream, I was afraid I might have disturbed you, for all at once I remembered I was no longer in Mama's room, but next door to you. I hope I did not wake you. Oh, no, my dear boy, I never heard you, or I should have got up to see what was the matter. So it passed off, and no further observation was made about it, but I once caught Mrs. Benson's eye, and the expression in a slight nod was a sign of approval of my story. After breakfast we went as usual to the schoolroom. I thought Miss Evelyn was kinder in her manner to me than usual. She made me stand close to her when saying my lessons, occasionally letting her left arm fall round my neck, while she pointed to my book with the finger of the right, and there was always a certain pressure before raising her arm again. These little caresses were frequently repeated, as if she were wishing either to accustom me or herself to a habit of it, so as, doubtless, gradually to increase them to something more definite. I could not help feeling what a different effect these endearments would have had 24 hours earlier, but now, momentarily satisfied passions, and the new love that had seized me for Mrs. B, prevented at first the inevitable cockstand that would otherwise have been produced by these approaches of Miss Evelyn. Not that I had given up all desire to possess her. On the contrary, my last night's instruction only made me more anxious to have Miss Evelyn too. Therefore, I by no means repulsed her present caresses, but looked up innocently in her face, and smiled affectionately. In the afternoon she was more expansive, and drew me to her by her arm round my waist, and pressed me gently to her person, saying how well I was attending to my lessons, and how sorry she was to have been obliged to punish me so severely the week before. You will be a good boy in future, will you not, dear Charlie? Oh, yes, as long as you are so kind to me. I love you so much, and you are so beautiful when you speak so kindly to me. Oh, you little flatterer. And she drew me to her lips and gave me a sweet kiss, which I returned with eagerness. I felt my prick had raised itself up to its full extent as these caresses were exchanged, and as Miss Evelyn held me tight pressed against her thigh she must have felt it throbbing against her. That she did so, I have no doubt, as her face flushed, and she said. There, now, that will do, go to your seat. I obeyed, she rose in an agitated manner, left the room, and was absent for a quarter of an hour. I had no doubt but that she was overcome by her feelings, and I thought to myself she will manage to have me some of these days. I could afford to leave it to her own discretion, as my charming mistress of last night was there to keep me in exercise and cool the effervescence of passion under which I should otherwise have labored. Nothing particular occurred during the day, Mrs. B was apparently indifferent about me, and never sought to approach or be in any way familiar, I studied her looks and followed her example. Mama sent me early to bed as she feared I had not had sleep enough the previous night by reason of my bad dream, and hoped I should have no more of the kind. This time my beautiful mistress found me sound asleep when she came to bed. She did not awake me until she had completed her night toilet, and was all ready to receive me in her arms. I sprung up, and in an instant, without a word being said, had her on her back and was into her delicious cunt as far as I could drive my stiff standing prick. My energy and fury seemed to please and stimulate the lady, for she replied to every eager thrust with as eager a spring forward. In such haste matters were very speedily brought to a crisis with mutual sighs, and o's and dos, we sank exhausted, and lay for a very short time, when charming Mrs. B said. Why, Charles? You are quite wild to me, what a hurry you have been in, but it was very nice, and I forgive you, but you must be more rational in future. Oh, my beloved mistress, how can I help it, you are so beautiful, and so good to me, I quite adore and love every part of your charming body. I know I was too impetuous, but I must make it up by kissing and fondling the dear source of all my joys. She did not resist 
but let me do as I liked. Pushing myself down the bed, I applied my lips and tongue to her lovely cunt, all wet with our mutual discharge, which was so sweet to the taste that I first began licking between the lips, and then applied myself to her excited clitoris, and with my finger and thumb working as on the previous morning I threw her into an ecstasy of delight, until again she had a delicious discharge. Then creeping up, I thrust my prick into her well-moistened and velvety cunt as you may imagine it was rampant as ever after my mouth contact with the exquisite quim I had been sucking. Stop, Charles, darling, I will show you another position, where you can lie easily with your dear delightful prick up to the hilt in the sheath you have so charmingly excited. Here, lie down by my right side on your side. She lay down on her back and throwing her right leg over my hips, told me to bend my knees forward and open my legs, or rather lift up my right leg. She placed her left thigh between my thighs, then slightly twisting her bottom up towards me brought the lips of her cunt directly before my prick, which she seized with her delicate fingers, and guided safely into Venus's grotto. I gave one or two shoves, and she a heave or two, to house him comfortably. And now, she said, we will take it reasonably in this way, we can go on, or stay occasionally, embrace, cuddle, or talk, just as we please. Are you quite comfortable? Oh, deliciously so. I replied, as my hand wandered all over her beautiful belly and bubbies, and then my mouth sucked the last. There, darling, that will do for the moment, I want to have some talk with you. First, let me thank you for your very discreet behavior this day, it quite justifies the confidence I had in you. Your story of the dream was capital, and just suited the purpose. I hope, my dear Charlie, that under my auspices you will become a model lover your aptitude has already proved in several ways. First and best, with all the appearance of a boy, you are quite a man, and even superior to many. You have already shown great discretion and ready wit, and there is no reason to fear that you will become a general favorite with our sex, who soon find out who is discreet and who is otherwise discretion is the trump card of success with us. Alas! Few of your sex understand this. Let me impress one lesson on you, my dear Charles. You and I cannot continue long on our present footing. My husband will return and carry me away, and although circumstances will throw us at intervals into each other's arms for you may be sure you will be always welcome to me yet my very absence will force you to seek other outlets to the passions I have awakened and taught their power. I have one piece of advice to give you as to your conduct to newer lovers for have them you must, my dear Charles, however much you may fancy yourself now attached to me, with these let them all for some time imagine that each possesses you for the first time. First of all, it doubles their satisfaction, and so increases your pleasure. Your early discretion causes me to think that you will see all the advantages of this conduct. I may add that if they suppose you have had previous instruction, they, if they are women, will never rest until they have drawn from you the secret of your first instructress. You might. Of course, tell some tale of a cock and a bull, but in searching for the truth and cross-questioning you when you are least aware of it, they will lead you into contradictions, and the truth will at last be ferreted out. Now this would be unjust to me, who have risked a good deal to give you the delightful instructions of last night, and, as I hope, of many more. So you see, my dear Charles, in all early cases you must enact the part of an ignoramus seeking for instruction, with vague ideas of how to set about it. I hope, while I am near you, she added, no such occasion will arise, but I feel certain, with your passions and your power, dear, darling fellow push away I, I, I feel for sair certain they will a-r arise. Thus ended the very wise and excellent advice this charming woman was giving me. Do not imagine that I did not pay great attention, and, indeed, her very reasonable maxims became the guide of my afterlife, 
and I owe to them a success with women rarely otherwise obtained. Her sensible remark had been drawn out to such a length, that my prick had so far rebelled that he had throbbed inside of her delicious cunt so forcibly as to produce a happy movement of her body that interrupted and cut short her words. Charlie, my darling, pass your middle finger down and rub it on my clitoris, and then suck the nipple of my bubby next you, and work away with your glorious prick. I did as desired. She seconded me with an art quite peculiar to herself, and at last we both died away in that love's death which is so overpowering and so delicious. The glorious position we were in rendered it almost impossible to lose ground, spend as often as you please, but if my prick had been one that would have shrunk to nothing, the wonderful power of retaining it within her possessed by my delicious mistress would have prevented the possibility of exit. In after nights I have often fallen sound asleep with it entirely engulfed within her, and awoke hours afterwards to find her extraordinary power of retention had held him firm, notwithstanding his having shrunk up to a mere piece of dowy flesh. In this instance, after recovering our senses, I still retained my place, and we recommenced our conversation, my lovely instructress giving me many and most useful hints for my afterlife. I have often since dwelt on the wisdom of all she so charmingly taught me, and wondered how so young a woman could have so thorough a knowledge of her sex and the world. I suppose love is a great master and inspired her on this occasion. I may here remark that for forty years afterwards this charming woman and I remained the fastest of friends after being the most ardent of lovers. She was the depository of all my erotic extravagancies, and never showed any jealousy, but really enjoyed the recital of my wildest love combats with others. Alas! Death at last took her from me, and I lost the mainstay of my existence. Forgive this digression but I am writing long after these events, and sorrows will have their vent. Woe is me! To return to present joys. We continued talking and toying, until I was again anxious to commence love's combat. My prudent mistress wished me to finish for the time, and to sleep and refresh ourselves for renewed efforts, but youth and strength nerved me for the fight, and being securely fixed, I held her as in a vice with my thighs around only one of hers that could have allowed her to escape. Passing my finger down on her stiffened clitoris I so excited her that she had no wish but to bring matters to a crisis. Stop, my dear, she said, and we will renew our pleasure in another attitude. So withdrawing her leg off my loins, she turned on her side, so as to present her glorious buttocks before me, and pressed them into my belly and against my thighs which seemed to introduce my prick even further than he was within before. Besides, in all these positions, where a woman presents her splendid backside to you, it is always more exciting, and has a greater hold of you than any other way. We did most thoroughly enjoy this splendid fuck, and without withdrawing, both fell into the sweetest imaginable slumber. This was one of those occasions in which, having fallen asleep engulfed, I awoke some five hours later, to find my prick still lightly held within the velvety folds of one of the most delicious cunts ever created for the felicity of man, or, I may say, woman either. You may easily imagine how soon my prick swelled to his wanted size on finding himself still in such charming quarters. I let him lay quite still, barring the involuntary throbs he could not avoid making and bending my body away from my lovely mistress, I admired her breadth of shoulders, the beauty of her upper arm, the exquisite shoot of her loins, the swell of her hips, and the glorious projection and rotundity of her immense buttocks. I slowly and gently pushed in and out of her juicy sheath, until, awakened by the exquisite sensations of my slow movements, all her lubricity was excited, and we ended one of our most delicious encounters, finishing, as usual, with a death-like exhaustion. She declared I had done enough for one night, and jumping out of bed, compelled me to betake myself to my own room, where, I must confess, I very shortly slept as sound as could be, without at the same time oversleeping myself. 
Thus passed several successive nights, until the full of the moon, when one day Mrs. B complained of headache and feeling unwell. I was very much alarmed, but she took occasion to tell me it was quite natural, and she would explain to me how it was so at night. I was obliged to be content with this. At night, she came and sat on my bed, and told me all the mysteries of the case. How women, not with child, had these bleedings monthly, which, so far from being hurtful, were a relief to the system, and that they happened at the full or the new moon, generally at the former. Further, that all connection with men must cease at such a time. I was in despair, for my prick was stiff enough to burst. However, my kind and darling mistress, to relieve me from the pain of distension, took my prick in her mouth, and performed a new maneuver. Wetting her middle finger with her saliva, she thrust it up my bottom hole, and worked in unison with the suction of the knob, and the fricking of the root of my prick with the other hand. I had a most exquisite and copious discharge, the pleasure being greatly enhanced by the action of the finger up my fundament. My charming mistress swallowed all I could give her, and did not cease sucking until the last drop had exuded from my throbbing prick. I was obliged to be satisfied with this, and my mistress informed me I could have no more enjoyment for four or five days, which, to my impatience, was like condemning me to as many ages of hope deferred. I observed, while she was kissing me, that her breath had a peculiar odor, and I asked her what she had been eating. Why do you ask, my dear boy? Because of the difference of your breath, generally so sweet and fragrant. She smiled and said it was all from the same cause she had just been explaining to me, and was very generally so with women at that period. I mention this because it was the means of my discovering that Miss Evelyn was exactly in the same state. She had continued her endearing caresses without proceeding much further than I have already described, except more frequently kissing me. She now always did so on first entering the schoolroom, and also when we were dismissed. I suppose to prevent an observation or inference, she had adopted the same habit with my sisters. On this day, having drawn me with her arm round my waist close to her, when she kissed me I felt the very same odor of breath that I had observed in Mrs. Benson. She too was languid that day and complained of headache. I also observed a dark line under her eyes, and on afterwards observing Mrs. B, saw precisely the same so I became convinced they were unwell from the same cause. Mrs. B had told me that most women were so at the full of the moon which was then the case. The next day my mother proposed to drive to town, and probably knowing the state of the case, asked Mrs. B and Miss Evelyn to accompany her, as she thought the airing would be beneficial. They at once accepted my younger sister cried out, Oh, Mama, let me go with you also. Mary interposed, and thought she had the best right but Lizzie said she had spoken first. I managed to give Mary a wink and a shake of the head, which she instantly comprehended so gracefully giving way, although with apparent reluctance, it was arranged that Eliza should accompany the ladies. I now felt my opportunity was at hand to initiate my darling sister into the delightful mysteries that I had just been myself instructed in. At eleven o'clock the carriage drove up, and we stood looking after them until they were lost to sight. Then returning into the parlor, Mary threw her arms round my neck, and kissing me, said. Oh. I am glad, Charlie, you winked to me, for now you know we can do as we like, and you can tell me all about this secret, and you must kiss my little Fanny as you did before, it was so nice. I have thought of nothing else, but how to have it done again. Well, my darling, I shall do all that, and more, but we cannot do so here. I tell you what we will do we will pretend to go for a long walk in the country, but instead of that, we will pass through the shrubbery into the orchard and hazelwood, and so gain the little remote summer house, of which I have secured the key, there we shall be safe from all observation. 
This little summer house was at some distance from the house, and in a lonely corner of the orchard, raised on an artificial mount, so that its windows should command a lovely view beyond the walls of the grounds. It was about ten feet square was beautifully sheltered, and the ladies in summer took their work there, and occupied it for hours every fine day, so it was furnished with tables and chairs, and on one side a long couch without a back. It had already entered into my idea that this was the spot I should contrive to get to with Mary little thinking how chance would throw so glorious an opportunity in my way so soon. It was always kept locked to prevent it being used by the servants, gardeners, or others. I knew where the key was kept, and secured it when the ladies were dressing for their drive so after staying sufficiently long to prevent any suspicion, and saying then we were going for a long walk in the country, so as to prevent them seeking for us at the summer house if any visitors should chance to call, we sallied out, but re-entered the grounds where we could not be observed, and speedily gained the spot we had in view entered and locked the door. Then I drew down the blinds, threw off my coat and waistcoat, and told Mary to take off her shawl and bonnet, and outer gown. But why all this, Charlie, dear? First, my darling all those are in the way of kissing and toying with your charming little Fanny, and next, I don't want anything to appear tumbled when we go back. This was enough, and she did everything as I desired, indeed, more, for she took off her petticoat and little corset, saying she would be cooler thus. So, following her example, I took off my trousers, saying she would be better able to see and play with my doodle. When these preliminaries were accomplished, I drew her on my knees first pulling up her shift in my own shirt, so that our naked flesh should be in contact. Seeing that her chemise fell off from her bosom, I first felt her little bubbies, which were beginning to develop themselves, and had the tiniest little pink nipples that even my lips could hardly get hold of. She had pulled up my shirt to look again at the great change that had occurred to my prick of course, our preliminaries had already excited it to a stiff standing position. Oh, Charlie, what a size it is to be sure, and how nice to pull this skin over its head, look how it runs back again. Oh, how funny. It was time to stop this, or she would have soon made me discharge. Well, then, what is this great secret, and what has it to do with your doodle and my fanny? I will tell you but you must never say a word to a soul not even to Eliza, she is too young yet. Well, go on. I was one day seeking something in the closet in Mrs. Benson's room, when I heard them coming, and had only the time to slip into the closet. They entered, locked the door, and Mr. B laid her on the bed, and lifted up all her petticoats so that I saw her fanny quite surrounded with hairs, as yours will be by and by. Mr. B, stooped down, and applied his tongue as I did to you the other morning. Oh, yes, and it was so nice, Charlie. That is exactly what Mrs. B said when he had done. Then he pulled out his doodle, such a size, much bigger than mine, and whipped it into her fanny. I was quite frightened, and thought he must have killed her. But no, it went in quite easy and she hugged and kissed him while he pushed it up and down for some time, till they both stopped all at once. He then drew it out, hanging down all wet, and asked if it had not given her great pleasure. Delightful, she said. I have now got used to it, but you know you hurt me, and made me so sore the first time you did it. After this they left the room, and I got away without being discovered. But I found out what our two things were made for, we will do as they did, so lie down on the couch whilst I kneel at the end, and begin in the way I kissed it the other morning. Oh, Charlie, if it is all like that, I shall be so pleased with it. Down she squatted, drawing up her chemise. My hand wandered all over her charming belly and mount. Then kneeling down, and putting her legs over my shoulders, and my hands under her thighs and bottoms, I applied my tongue at once to her little clitoris, 
which I found was already stiff, and showing its head at the upper part of her pinky slit. The action of my agile tongue produced an instantaneous effect her loins and thighs heaved up her bottom to press her little pouting cunt against my face. Mechanically she put her hand on my head, and muttered terms of endearment. Oh, darling Charlie, how delicious. Oh. Do go on. It is so nice, and see. I wanted no stimulant, but licked away until, with shortened breath, and greater heavings of her body, she began to stammer. Oh, oh. I feel so queer ah, stop, I am going to faint I, 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 can't can't bear it any longer oh, oh. Her limbs relaxed, and she died away in her first discharge, which was very glutinous and nice, but only scanty in quantity. I let her quiet until she came to, then looking in her face, and smiling, I asked her how she liked it. Oh. I was in heaven, dear Charlie, but I thought it was killing me it was almost too much to bear nothing could be more delicious. Oh, yes. I replied, there is something more delicious still, but, I must kiss you in this way again before we try the other, the more moist the inside is the easier I shall get in. But, Charlie, you don't mean to say you will ever get in your doodle, now that it has grown so big. Well, we will try, and if it hurts you too much we can stop. So I began again to gama hutch her, this time it took a longer effort to produce the ultimate result, but apparently with still greater effect, and a more copious discharge. Her little cunt being now relaxed, and well moistened with her own discharge and my saliva, and well inclined to receive my prick, I spat upon it and lubricated it from head to root. Then rising from my knees, I stretched myself over Mary's belly, and gently directing my prick, and rubbing it up and down first between the lips, and exciting her clitoris by the same action, I gently and gradually inserted its head between the lips of her charming little cunt. There was less difficulty than might have been expected, the gamma hutching and double spending had relaxed the muscles, and her passions being excited also acted on her organs of generation, at all events, I got in the head, and about two inches of its length without her murmuring anything beyond. How big it feels it seems to stretch me so. All this was exciting me dreadfully and it was only by the greatest effort that I did not thrust rudely forward. I now felt I was pushing against some obstacle, I thrust hard and hurt her. She cried out, begged me to stop. I was so near the finale that I felt I must go on. So, plunging forward, I rushed, at the impediment, and made her cry out most lustily. Probably another push would have decided my position, but nature could hold out no longer, and I yielded down my erotic tribute to her virginal charms, without having actually deflowered her. So far, perhaps, it was fortunate, because I poured into her a torrent of sperm which was not only balm to her partially wounded hymen, but so relaxed and lubricated the interior of her cunt as greatly to facilitate my after efforts. I lay quiet still for some time, and the gradual swelling out and throbbing of my prick reawakened her young passions. She said. Charlie, my dear, you said that it would prove delicious in the end, and I can feel it is becoming so. I have no more pain, and you shall go on just as you like. As my prick stiffened at her endearing words and involuntary pressures, and as I had it completely under control, since I had taken the edge off its immediate appetite by the last discharge, I held it literally well in hand, and as I had lost no ground by withdrawing, I started with the advantage of possession. First I slipped my hand down between our two bellies and began fricking her clitoris, which immediately excited her passions to the highest pitch. Oh! Charlie, dear, now push it all and I do so long for it and I don't care how it hurts me. I had been giving short thrusts more to stimulate her passions than to alleviate my own, and as she was totally unaware of what was going to happen, she widened her thighs and heaved up her bottom, expanding her vagina in the act. 
I gathered my strength together, and as my cock was standing as stiff as iron, I suddenly drove it forward, and felt that I broke through something, and gained two inches more insertion at least. The effect on my poor sister was most painful, she shrieked out lustily, strove hard to unsheath me, wriggled her body in all directions to effect this, but I was too securely engulfed for that, and all her struggles only enabled me the more easily to sheath him up to the very hairs. So excited was I by her tears and screams, that I was no sooner there than a torrent of sperm burst from me, and I lay like a corpse on her body, but perfectly maintaining the ground I possessed. This death-like quiet lasted some minutes, and, to a certain extent, assuaged the violence of the pain I put poor Mary to. Doubtless, also, the balmy nature of the ample quantity of sperm I had shot up to her womb helped to soothe her suffering. At all events, when we were both able again to converse, she unbraided me with the agony I had caused her, and wished me to get off her at once, but retaining the advantageous possession of her very tight and delicious sheath, I told her all was now over, and we might look forward to nothing but enrapturing pleasure. Some minutes had elapsed in these remonstrances on one side, and coaxings on the other, when I suddenly felt her charming little cunt actually throb upon and give an involuntary squeeze to my prick, which was still throbbing her. He was far too ready to stand at any time, still more when engulfed in the exquisite young cunt he had just initiated into love's mysteries breath he stood stiff as ever, and Mary, at first with a shudder of fright, then with all the energy of awakened passion, began to move her body under me. I held off from any interference, feeling certain that, if the desire came naturally to her it would doubly enhance my own pleasure. My foresight did not fail me. Mary's passions became fully aroused, and when so, the trifling soreness passed out of mind, and we actually had a most delicious fuck in which my prick appeared as if in a vice, and Mary wriggled her backside almost as well as the more artistic movements of Mrs. Benson. All things must come to an end, but this did so amid screams of delight on both sides. This single bout began and finished the education of my darling sister. She hugged and fondled me afterwards, declaring I was quite right in telling her pleasure followed pain for nothing could exceed the enrapturing nature of the sensation my prick had produced. She thought now that it was not a bit too big, but just made to give the utmost satisfaction. We remained locked in each other's arms, my prick still engulfed in its tight and exciting sheath. We fondled and prattled, until it became again in a state of violent erection, equally stimulating her tight little cunt, so that we were forced to recommence our love encounter. I found that my dear little sister possessed naturally the power of throbbing on or nipping a prick, which the French call casse-noisette. It is a great gift and adds immensely to the man's pleasure, and I should think to the woman's too. In my sister's case it began from the very first complete insertion of my prick and the years that I afterwards continued to fuck her added nothing to this delicious accomplishment, except in the variety of positions in which it could be exercised. The dear girl was in ecstasies at the pleasure she had received, and at the pain which seemed to be past. Oh! She was so sweetly caressing that I could not withdraw from her, and we fondled and toyed until again my cock rose to his first vigor, and she nothing loath, began her new and naturally taught gift of bottom-up heavings and cunt pressures until again we sank exhausted in the death-like ending of love's battles. On recovering our senses, I was obliged to withdraw and relieve my sister of the dead weight of my body on her person. It has always struck me as extraordinary how the most delicate women will support a heavy man on their persons, not only without flinching, but even with ease and pleasure but so it is. On rising and withdrawing, we were both alarmed to see that my prick was all bloody, and that blood and semen were oozing from her cunt. We had no idea this would be the case and at first I was as frightened as she was. A moment's reflection showed me that it was only the natural result of forcing my way in, and that the pleasure since enjoyed proved it to be of no consequence. 
I soon convinced and calmed my sister on the point fortunately the sofa covering was red, and applying my handkerchief, I wiped up all the semen mixture, and, in fact, no marks remained, the same handkerchief wiped all results from Mary's dear little cunt, and as her shift had been kept well up, fortunately no stains appeared upon that. We now ate some luncheon and drank some wine that we had prudently brought with us. We then began playing and romping together she wanting always to get hold of my prick, and I to pull her about in every way. It was gloriously warm weather, so I proposed we should off with everything. In a trice we were as naked as we were born, and flew into each other's arms in a frenzy of delight, then we had a mutual thorough inspection. My darling sister gave every promise of becoming a magnificent woman her shoulders were already white her arms well shaped, although still thin her waist small the swell of the hips already well developed as to her bottom, it stuck out well and hard behind, quite charming to see, and giving promise of very ample dimensions hereafter. I made her kneel on the low couch, with her head well up and her thighs open, kneeling behind, I gama hutched her until she spent, then rising, shoved my prick into her cunt, in her then position, and had a downright good poke, which she, too, found was a way that gave her extra excitement. We passed thus some hours in mutual delights. I taught her the side fuck which had so charmed me with my delightful instructress, and I found dear Mary even an apter scholar than myself had proved. The afternoon advancing, we dressed, and eradicating all signs of what we had been doing, returned to the house, mutually promising to keep thoroughly secret all that had passed and agreeing that no sign of unusual familiarity should escape us. I strongly advised Mary to get some warm water and bathe her cunt well, for, as may be supposed, I had taken the opportunity of teaching her the true erotic language as applied to the organs of generation of both sexes, and the name of the connection itself, fucking. Thus delightfully ended the first lesson in love taught to my sister, and such was my first triumph over a maidenhead, double enhanced by the idea of the close ties of parentage between us. In after life, I have always found the nearer we are related, the more this idea of incest stimulates our passions and stiffens our pricks, so that if even we be in the wane of life, Fresh vigor is imparted by reason of the very fact of our evasion of conventional laws. We had both returned to the drawing room for more than an hour before the arrival of the ladies. Dear Mary complained of feeling sore and stiff in every limb. I had advised her to lie down on the sofa and try to sleep. I did the same, and happily we both dozed off, and never awoke until the loud rat-tat of arrival at the house door roused us up. I told Mary to hide all appearance of pain, and only to say, as an excuse for going early to bed, that we had gone further afield than we at first intended, and that she was very tired. We were both sent early to bed, for I was still treated as quite a boy, and I was sound asleep when my charming Mrs. B woke me up by her warm caresses. I could well have spared them that night but when did one of my years not respond to the endearments of the woman he loved, and who yielded all to him? She sucked me dry as usual, and I slept soundly till morning. The next three days passed without anything to record. Mary did not allow her real soreness to appear, but heroically went through her sufferings, for she told me afterwards she felt very severe pains all over, doubtless her whole nervous system had been overexcited and this was the natural reaction, it was so far fortunate that not a shadow of a chance of our having fresh connection occurred, so she had time to perfectly recover from the ill effects of her first initiation into the erotic raptures. I continued to have the relief each night of the charming mouth of my loved and beautiful instructress. At last, the abominable menses, as she called them, were past and gone. For a full twenty-four hours after, she would not allow me to reassume all the privileges she had previously granted, and admit me to share her bed. She told me this was necessary to prevent any recurrence, and also that in some cases a virulent white discharge occasionally followed for some hours, sufficiently acrid to affect my local health, 
and that, she added, was now too precious in her estimation to risk it in any way. I thought it hard at the time, but it was only another proof of the thoughtful wisdom of this estimable woman. At last, I was again in full possession of her charming person. Oh! How we did revel in all the luxuries and lubricity, almost every night my enchanting friend found some new position to vary and enhance our erotic raptures. One new dose was laying me down flat on my back, then straddling over me, she sank on her knees, and with body erect, lifted up or rather bent back my stiff standing prick, until he was fairly below her open cunt, then guiding it exactly to the proper entrance, she sank her body slowly down upon it until fully engulfed, hair crushed hair, then as slowly raising again, she drew off until all but the nut was uncovered, to again sink down. In this position we could both see the whole process. At length, becoming too excited, she sank on my bosom, then one arm and hand pressed her splendid buttocks down on my throbbing prick after every elevation of her magnificent backside while my other hand, doubling round behind her, introduced the middle finger up her charming bottom hole, and worked in and out in unison with both our heaving movements, until stopped by the grand crisis when death-like languor overcame us both almost at the same moment. I must not forget to mention that from time to time I paid a visit to the small and rosy orifice that lay so near to the more legitimate altar of Venus. It was a variety of enjoyment that my lovely mistress acknowledged to me she at times felt much inclined to enjoy, but only after having the front path of pleasure well fucked and lubricated with sperm, which alone caused the other mucous membrane to feel inclined that way. I will here insert a characteristic letter from my loved mistress to her intimate and bosom school friend, with the reply thereto. It was several years before they were shown to me, and some time after I had possessed both the charming writers, for we all three became fast friends, indeed, I may call myself or rather my prick, the pivot on which their friendship turned, yet there never was the shade of jealousy on either part but in these remarks I am anticipating what I may, perhaps, be hereafter tempted to describe more fully. I give these letters now, because they immediately refer to the events I am at present relating. They show the secret working of my loved mistress's mind, and the voluptuous nature of her temperament, and the satisfaction that my delicious initiation had given. Her affectionate and flattering remarks, relating to myself, are greater than I deserved. The following is the first letter addressed to her friend. MRS Benson to the Hon MRS Edgerton. Dear Carrie, I am about to keep my promise, and give you an account of our honeymoon. You, my dear, must be equally faithful, and reply as frankly as I am now about to write to you. Two giddier girls than you and I never entered the bonds of matrimony or more earnestly longed for the sights connected with it. Well, after the usual breakfast, we left by rail for Leamington, where we were to pass our first night. We had a coop to ourselves, and beyond seating me on his knee, and kissing me, Fred behaved with much decency and propriety. We arrived and dined. The hour between tea and bedtime was sufficiently tedious, as both of us were naturally much preoccupied. My husband wrote a letter to Mama, telling her of our safe arrival, and of his intense happiness. After which he asked me if I would go to bed, in the most matter-of-fact way imaginable. I murmured an affirmative, scarcely knowing what to say. He rang for a candle, and told me he would follow shortly. It seemed like a dream to me, the maid showed me to a room containing a large four-post bedstead, heavily hung with curtains, and provided with old-fashioned furniture. I seated myself on the edge of the bed and began to meditate. I sat thus, for, I dare say, ten minutes, and then commenced undressing. I had put on my nightgown, and removed everything but my stockings, when I heard footsteps approach the door. I opened and my husband entered, closed it, and turned the key. Oh! Carrie, I did feel so funny. 
I was undressed in a bedroom with a man, and that man had a right to my person. He seated himself in an armchair, and drew me on his knee. Nothing but my thin nightgown separated my bottom from his bare knee, for he had quite undressed in an adjoining room and had nothing on but his shirt under his dressing gown, which flew open as he sat down. He drew my lips to his, and kissing me, thrust his tongue between them, while his hand first caressed and squeezed my bosom, which, you know, is pretty full and well developed, it then wandered down upon my thigh, pressed and felt the fleshy form. Little by little he approached my belly, and for a moment pressed my mount. These preliminaries are at all times exciting, but now they made me almost ill, so great was my confusion. Seeing this, he drew up my nightgown, and placed his hand, first on my naked thigh, then on my mount, and you know, Carrie dear, what a forest I have got there. He seemed delighted with it. His fingers played with the silky curls, drawing them out to their full length, so long that it appeared to surprise him, and his eyes sparkled, and his face showed much excitement. Open your thighs, dearest, he whispered. I obeyed mechanically, and his middle finger forced itself between the lips of my cunt, and commenced rubbing my clitoris. You know, by experience, what an excitable one it is and to what a size it develops itself when excited. Again Fred seemed delighted with his discovery. Does that please you, my darling? Yes, I faltered out. He thrust his finger up my cunt, then rose up, threw off his dressing gown, took me in his arms, and lifted me on the bed, placing a pillow under my head. Then letting my legs fall over the sides, he knelt on the floor, and separating my thighs with his arms, stooped and kissed my quim. He did more, he sucked and then licked with his tongue my already excited clitoris. It set me on fire, and I could not avoid showing it by the convulsive twitchings of my loins and buttocks. Do you like that, my love? Oh, yes, so much, so very much. I was nearly mad with the excitement he was putting me into. He again stood up, and lifting my legs, his hands pressed them again and again. What delicious legs, he exclaimed. I could see his shirt bulging out. He leant forward, and with his arms under my legs, lifted them well up, and I felt a stiff thick thing pressing against my cunt. His left hand opened the lips, his right hand guided it between them, and a cruel push lodged its great head completely within. Neither you, or I, Carrie, were strictly virgins, our fingers and other means had opened our vaginas to a certain extent. We had played too many tricks together to have left our maiden heads quite intact, so that the passage was less difficult than it might have been. Nevertheless, it had never been penetrated by the male organ, and that of my husband was of the largest. I experienced, therefore, a great deal of pain, and cried out. Oh, my dear Fred, you hurt me dreadfully, what are you doing? Doing, my darling, why, I am getting into you. Have a little patience, and I will make you mad with pleasure. Another determined thrust sent him halfway, and then with another, still more violent, he lodged himself up to the hilt within. I screamed with real pain, and struggled to free myself. Good heavens, sir, you are killing me, I will not endure such treatment. He heeded me not, but holding me fast by the thighs commenced shoving in and out furiously. A sensitive woman never receives an insertion of this kind with impunity. The friction began to excite feelings that first deadened the pain of entrance, and then began to awaken the delicious sensations of lubricity. The enjoyment I began to experience was delicious, and I could not refrain from heaving up to meet his thrusts. That is right, my angel, was I not correct in saying it would soon turn from pain to pleasure? Do you not enjoy it now? Yes, but you make me feel so funny. I don't know what it is. His increased and rapid movement filled me with delight, 
I bounded up and down in response to his thrusts, and felt so queer when, all of a sudden, he gasped for breath, stopped, and I felt a greater and stiffer swelling of his instrument, and then a gush of hot liquid dashed against my womb, which continued running for some seconds. This, Carrie, was my first experience of what a man can do for us. Withdrawing his huge affair for he since admits he is larger than most men letting go my thighs he pressed down upon me, and tenderly embraced me, and said that I had behaved admirably, in future there would be no more pain, and from what he had already experienced he felt sure I was made for the fullest enjoyment that husband and wife could indulge in. After a little fondling, he rose, drew off my stockings, and helped me into bed, immediately following me. On throwing back the clothes to enter the bed, he said he must kiss the dear little hairy thing that had given him such pleasure. He kissed and toyed with it admiring the profusion of hair on my mount, the whiteness and beauty of my belly, and then, bearing my breasts, admired, kissed, and sucked them. All this not only excited me, but I could see very well it had again caused his affair to stick out. Seeing that I was timidly glancing at it, he seized my hand, and made me lay hold of it, showed me how the skin covered and uncovered its head, then becoming rampageous, he got on my belly and between my thighs, and again introduced his cock to where it had already given such pleasure. He still rather hurt me, and made me smart for a little while, but as the interior was well lubricated by his former discharge, the penetration was easily accomplished. Went up to the hilt, and the two hairs were closely joined, he paused, and said. We will take it less impatiently this time, that my darling Bessie may enter into all the joys of fucking, for that is what we call it my dear, so I shall go slowly to work until my darling's passions awake and urgently call for more rapid movements. He did so, and gradually produced the most lascivious excitement in my whole body. I writhed beneath him in the utmost ecstasy, threw my arms round his body, and hugged him to me. Oh, you are an angel, he cried, and made for enjoyment. Throw your legs also over my back there, that is it and now I will hasten my movements, and we will die away together. Oh, the delight he gave me was inexpressibly delicious, his rapid and eager thrusts were as eagerly met by the upheaving of my bottom to reciprocate them. The grand crisis seized us simultaneously, and we sank momentarily exhausted in each other's arms, leaving the dear exciter of such joy soaking within. My dear husband was so pleased, he kissed and fondled me in the sweetest manner, telling me that never woman before had yielded him such intense pleasure, that nature had prompted me to as much enjoyment as if I had been already married a month. We were locked closely in the warmest embrace, his tenderness and fondling began to have its effect on my passions, and involuntarily I made some internal convulsive twitchings. I feel you, my darling, calling on my instrument for renewed efforts, he will soon respond. And, in fact, I felt it swelling and swelling so deliciously that I could not help continuing the interior pressures, although feeling confusedly ashamed of the notice my husband took of it. Don't be afraid, my sweetest love, but give way to whatever your passions dictate, and thus you will best please me, and give to yourself double enjoyment. I mean to initiate you into every secret that the rites of Venus possess, and wish that my loved wife should become a devoted votary, and I will do my best that she may revel in all the luxuries of perfect coition. We completed this course with even greater abandon than before and I began to enjoy his embraces beyond anything our imaginations used to suggest. This time he withdrew and lay down by my side, and taking me within both his arms, continued his charming endearments. I never slept that night, I was in a fever of restless excitement. My husband fucked me five times before he dozed off. Towards morning I tossed and tumbled, and could not sleep. Daylight soon came. My restlessness had shaken all the bed clothes off, except a part of the sheet, and turning towards my husband, I perceived that the sheet stuck up over the lower part of his body. 
Curiosity seized me I looked at him, and saw he was evidently sleeping. So gently removing the sheet, I beheld the dear instrument of all my last night's joys as well as pains. You know how we used to long to see man's cock when we were at school, and how, when we did sometimes see a boy's limp thing hanging down, we used to wonder what change would come over it, and how. Well, here was an opportunity of examining, at my ease, the wonderful curiosity that had so puzzled us. The last edge of the sheet passing over it touched its ruby head, it throbbed and pulsated to the view. I was afraid this had awakened Fred, but no, he slept as sound as ever. So I gently raised myself on my bottom, and gazed on the dear object I had so longed to see and feel. There it stood up like a pillar, rather bending towards his belly, and what surprised me much was to see a dark strongly wrinkled bag at its roots, with apparently two large balls inside, the hair on its roots spread in dark mass up to his navel, and beautifully bright and curling it was. I approached my lips, and made the action of kissing, without touching it. Whether it felt my warm breath, I know not, but it actually throbbed a response. What a great big thing it was, equally long as it was thick, I did not think I could encircle it with my hand, I longed to try, but was afraid I should waken Fred, and what would he think of me, I blushed at the very idea, but my passions became excited, and too strong to resist the temptation. So first lying gently down again, I very quietly dropped my arm over him and touched his cock, it throbbed at the touch, but Fred slept on. So raising myself again, I very gently laid hold of it. It was as much as I could grasp below the head, but was beyond my grasp at the root, I found it took three of my hands to measure its length from the root to the nut, which stood out in all its redness above. I was almost breathless with excitement, and lost some of my caution. Stooping down, I gently kissed the ruby head, when, before I knew where I was, it was pushed up into my mouth, and my husband's voice said, Oh, you dear darling creature, how kind of you to waken me so luxuriously. I was horrified at being discovered, and blushing up to the eyes, I hid my face in his bosom. Do not be ashamed, my angel, it is now as much yours as mine and have you not as much right to see, kiss, and handle it, come, don't be ashamed. However, I could not face him, and when he tried to raise my head I turned my back. He seized me round the waist, and, before I knew where I was, passed a hand between my thighs, and guided his huge cock to the lips of my cunt, and was in me, I thought further than ever, in a moment. It is true the previous toying with his instrument had terribly excited me, and I had felt that my cunt had become very moist, but I had no idea that anything could be accomplished in that position. I was most delightfully undeceived, for not only did it feel tighter in it, but transferring his fingers from guiding his prick, he touched and played with my clitoris, and produced such excessive lubricity that I went off and spent with a scream of delight before he was ready but continuing with finger and cock to ravish me inside and out, he soon brought me again to such a pitch of lewdness that I was quite ready to spend with him when the grand crisis arrived. Nothing could exceed the pleasure, my internal pressures, he declared, were the most exquisite he had ever experienced. My clitoris, too, he declared was quite unique. You remember how it used to stick out when excited as far as the first thumb joint, and how, when sometimes I played the husband on your belly, you declared that it actually entered between the lips of your cunt, rubbed against your smaller development, and gave you great pleasure, as indeed it gave me. My husband has often examined and sucked it, and admires it beyond measure. At present he did not withdraw, declaring that I held him so tight he did not think he could pull it out if he tried. In fact, it was involuntary on my part, and I could not help clinging to his dear instrument for the life of me. Oh, how he fondled and embraced me, making me partially turn my body so that he might kiss and tongue me, 
and then suck my bubbies, his busy finger all the time tickling and frigging my clitoris. I soon felt his cock swelling so deliciously within me, and he shortly recommenced his rapturous pushings in and out. We made a long, long bout of it, and I am sure that I spent twice before joining him at the last moment, when he died away in a shout of joy that I feared must have been heard by the servants in the house, who long before this had been on the move. After this we lay soaking and enjoying it for more than half an hour, when my husband declared he felt as if a wolf was at his stomach, and that he must have some breakfast. He got up and quickly dressed, desiring me to lie still, and he would bring me some breakfast in bed, and that, while it was getting ready, he would order some warm water to bathe myself with. I felt his delicacy, and loved him for it. The water came, I was much refreshed after using it, and got into bed again, but I felt awfully stiff and done up all that and next day. My darling husband waited on me himself at breakfast, stimulating me to eat freely as a means of restoring my lost strength, which he very soon put to the test again, for he fucked me three times during the day, and each time he gave me greater pleasure than before. He was just as active at night. And the whole three weeks we stayed at Leamington, he never fucked me less than four times a night, declaring that I had become most perfect in the exercise. We then came here, our old friend, Mrs. Roberts, having kindly insisted upon our paying her a long visit Fred has been called away suddenly and will not return for a month. I am sure you will pity me, as you know my temperament is too hot to keep chaste so long. You remember Charlie Roberts, you would consider him a child, but he is not so. One afternoon Fred followed me into my bedroom, as was usual, and Gama hutched and fucked me on the edge of the bed. I was about to leave the room after he was gone, when on opening a closet, in which my dresses were hung, who should I discover but this same Charlie? I was in a fix. There was no doubt the lad had seen everything. I spoke kindly to him, and he promised secrecy. In order to ensure it, I determined to have his maiden head. A few days afterwards my husband left me, and the girls with their mama and the governess went to town with him, leaving Charlie to keep me company. I went upstairs with him to the drawing room, and seating myself in a low chair, crossed my legs carelessly, exposing them, and letting the garter and part of the bare skin of one thigh be visible. The effect was what I expected. I saw Charlie's eyes fixed on the exposure, he blushed scarlet, and I could distinctly see his cock swell out under his trousers. In a little while I had unbuttoned them, and, oh, Carrie, would you imagine it, I found he had the cock of a man. I could scarcely believe my eyes. He is not quite fifteen, and yet he is almost as large as Fred. Here was a godsend, indeed. I drew up my petticoats, and the gallant little fellow instantly fell on his knees, kissed and sucked my cunt. To reward him, I placed him on his back on the couch, and got on the top of him. I took his pigo into my mouth, and pressed my cunt against his face, we devoured each other with our luxurious caresses until we both spent copiously. Nothing was lost, we both greedily swallowed all we could get. At home he is looked upon as still a child, and I had little difficulty in arranging for him to sleep in a little dressing room adjoining my bedroom, with which there is a door of communication. He was sent early to bed, but when I came I found him still awake, expecting me, and I had the delicious treat of initiating him into the pleasures of fucking. If you ever wish to enjoy par excellence this pleasure, get hold of a vigorous boy who has never had a woman. My good fortune threw into my hands a wonderfully provided youth, whose aptitude, as well as size and powers, it would be very difficult to match. I had already given him several lessons in the enrapturing art when we fell asleep, and now I must mention a little episode, which it would not do to omit. In the morning I was dreaming of Fred, when I became conscious that something was entering me. 
I was in that half dreaming state when it is difficult to be quite certain what is happening, but gradually I became aware that although there was no doubt I was being entered, it was not in the usual way. My husband had frequently of late pushed his prick up my bottom hole, and as he told me that all husbands did so, I could make no objections. I, therefore, at first took it for granted that Fred, finding my naked bottom in his lap, could not resist the temptation of entering it. I, therefore, humored him, and so moved my bottom as to facilitate his complete entrance, and began to feel myself the excitement it occasioned, but as I became wider awake, I gradually called to mind that Fred had left me, and that Charlie was my bedfellow. The audacity of the young rogue paralyzed me, but his delicious movements had become too nice for me to think of dislodging him. He insisted that he was quite unconscious of his mistake, and that he believed himself buried in the delicious grotto of the night before. It probably was so, for so perfect an ignoramus as he is, although ever so apt a scholar in Venus's rites, he could hardly have imagined there could be any entrance in the smaller orifice. I let him go on, and with his well-hung cock in my bottom, and two or three fingers in my cunt, he fucked and frigged me most deliciously, until we both spent in an agony of pleasure. If, Carrie, you have not tried this route I strongly recommend you to do so without delay, but you must be well fucked in the first instance, too. Stimulate a desire in those parts, and your lover must be up to the art of frigging you at the same time, or you can pass your hand under your belly, and rub your clitoris, which was the plan I adopted with Charlie, until I taught him the art of rubbing the clitoris properly. As there is always more excitement when this is done by a male, it is better to have them when one can, but, faute de mieux one can do it oneself with much additional lascivious satisfaction. To give you an instance of the precocious aptitude of this dear little fellow, I mounted upon him one morning, keeping my body erect, that we might see the delicious instrument in its action of being engulfed and then withdrawn, a most exciting pose which I recommend you to try, if your husband has not already taught it to you. At last, overcome by the lascivious movements, I sank on his bosom. He pressed my bottom down with one hand, and with the other embracing the nearer buttock, introduced his middle finger up the rosy orifice of my bottom, and frigged me in unison with our ups and downs of fucking, giving me the most delicious additional sensations. What do you think of that for a tyro? His discretion, too, is extraordinary. The first night after I sent him to his own bed, he overslept himself. I had not thought of that, and had not looked into his little room before descending to breakfast. His sister was sent to call him. He at once excused himself by saying he had had a bad dream, she came down and told us. In a few minutes he followed, and in the most natural way possible, told a tale of fright, declared he had awoke screaming and afterwards had been so frightened that he could not sleep, and turning to me in the most natural way, hoped his scream had not disturbed me. He never came near me or appeared in any way attracted by me a discretion worthy of a man of the world. Oh! My dear Carrie, I shall make a great deal of this boy. We have had several delicious nights since, and he improves wonderfully. Splendidly as my husband fucks, Charlie already beats him. He is quite as often ready, indeed, oftener, and it is I that hold him back but there is something still so charmingly infantine in his way of caressing me, and then the lascivious idea he is all my own, and that I initiated him in love's mysteries, adds an inexpressible charm to our lascivious encounters. I feel that I shall almost regret my husband's return, as it will force me to give up this delicious indulgence. Not the slightest shadow of suspicion of our doings is excited in the family, thanks to the very guarded and admirable conduct of Charlie, which is above all praise. Write to me soon, my dear Carrie, and be sure you are as candid as this long, long letter is to you, for the life of me I could not make it shorter. I only hope you will give me one as long, 
and have as much delicious intelligence for me. I know you too well to suppose that you have not found means as I have done, to try what other men are made of, although you can scarcely have had such wonderful luck as mine. Write then, and write without reserve. Our mutual affection is too sincere to allow of any concealment whatever between two such loving and lewd lascivious friends. Ever your affectionate friend. E. Benson Such was the long letter my adored mistress wrote at the time to her school companion. It will be seen that their attachment had led to something more than the usual fingerings and caressings of school girls, indeed, had led them on to the lewdest and most lascivious indulgences that two girls could practice in common, and had first excited their passions and given them the delicious power of pleasing coition they were both so perfect in, for, as I before said, about two years after this time, I was the possessor of both and many and many an orgy we three had together, without the shadow of jealousy on any side. It will be seen that Mrs. Edgerton, in her reply, even looks forward to the delicious indulgence, which in the end was happily effected and long continued. The following is her reply. The Hon MRS Edgerton to MRS Benson. How can I ever sufficiently thank my darling Lizzie for her delicious letter, I have devoured its delightful details a dozen times already. I keep it in my bosom, and renew the pleasure of its perusal at every spare moment. Too long? Oh! With such a charming power of description, why did you not cover fifty more pages? Never in my life have I enjoyed such an exquisite description of those dear lascivious encounters. How delighted I am at your good fortune in meeting with such a miracle of a boy as that dear Charlie Roberts. Why, he has every quality of a man, united to the charm of extreme youth. What a splendid man he will become, the very perfection of a lover, and already possessing so lewd and lascivious a lubricity. Oh! How I envy you his possession! What luck for him too! to have fallen into the hands of so delicious a teacher as my beloved Lizzie is. Am I not myself her pupil, and were you not my own delicious instructress in all that one of our sex could teach each the other? You will remember a long-standing engagement entered into, between us made, when we were both so lewd and so longing for the real knowledge of man, and how we pledged ourselves that if either got possession of a lover, we should manage after a while to share him between us. Your description of Charlie Roberts has brought this pledge most vividly to my recollection. I am sure my dear Lizzie will not be angry or jealous when I avow that I long to participate with her in the possession of that darling boy, and if my Lizzie is as of old, I feel certain she will rather indulge and cultivate this propensity than otherwise. Think how easy it will be for us both to arrange the meeting of all three together, because I wish to possess him in common certain that it will increase the lascivious pleasure of coition. No one will suspect us when we drive out, two women with one man. It will naturally be supposed that one fears the other, and so there will be no danger. See, here I am at once anticipating future scenes, but it is all owing to the extremely exciting and lascivious details you have so vividly given me. I have no such delicious scenes to depict as those you have so delightfully described to me. My honeymoon passed off in a much more commonplace way than yours. Our marriage, which was performed within a day of your own, went off as such events do. My husband was loving, without being very warm. I felt very much as you describe on going to bed the first night, but the discretion or delicacy of my husband which I could well have pardoned him for dispensing with, left me time not only to get into bed, but kept me waiting there some time. He entered like yours in his dressing gown, but immediately put out the light and found his way into bed, as best he could. He crept to my side and embraced me tenderly enough, and began to fondle and kiss me, telling me how dearly he loved me, etc., but for some time he avoided any indecent liberties. I suppose he thought it necessary to gain my confidence and quiet any alarm I might be in. He might have saved himself the trouble, 
for in reality I was longing for and at the same time somewhat dreading an attack on my maiden charms. At last, little by little, he approached the object of delight, and eventually begging me not to be alarmed, he mounted upon me and effected the object of his desires. He did not hurt me much, not nearly as much as I expected, nor so much as you seem to have suffered. I deemed it politic to affect more suffering than he really inflicted. Towards the end I had slight scintillations of pleasure, but not worth mentioning, it is true my husband is not so well armed as yours and Charlie appear to be, and he is also much colder in his passions, for instance, he did not attempt to fuck me again, although I would have been gratified if he had done so, perhaps it was considerate towards me in his idea, but, merely embracing me in his arms, he talked himself and me to sleep. In the morning he again fucked me, this time giving me something like pleasure, but I was altogether disappointed with my night's experience. It was not such as you or I, my dear Lizzie, had pictured to ourselves, in our anticipations of the marriage night. My husband since has never exceeded twice a night, but he has become more exciting, and has generally made me spend twice to his once, first exciting my passions by feeling all my private parts, and frigging my clitoris, so that I generally have lubricated the passage by my own discharge before he attempts to make an entrance. I find he likes this, and so far it pleases me, because only one discharge would leave me in a state of excitement unbearable. He has never attempted any of those lewder and more lascivious methods, of which you have had such delicious experience. Altogether, I cannot but say I am disappointed. My husband is loving, and very anxious that I should improve my mind in every way. You know I was rather more proficient than usual at school in Italian. My husband speaks it fluently, and as we mean to spend a winter at Rome, was anxious that I should have further instruction. He asked me if my school teacher was a good one, but I did not encourage that idea. You may remember our former master was a Count Fort Unio, so handsome and so enterprising that you and I had both formed the plan of having him, and had already put over some of the preliminaries when, unfortunately, he was caught with that impudent Miss Peace, with whom, doubtless, he had accomplished everything. Of course, he was instantly changed for another, and we saw no more of him, to the sad disappointment of our then libidinous hopes. My husband proposed advertising for a master, when I had the happy instinct to tell him that schoolmistresses generally applied to Rolandi, of Berners Street, for language masters, and that, if he would write or call, he would be sure to get every information. That evening, after dinner, as we sat dozing over the fire in the library very imperfectly lighted my husband informed me that he had seen Rolandi, who had most strongly recommended a very gentlemanly man, moving in good society, namely, the Count Fort Unio. I started in amazement, fortunately, owing to the half-light we were in, my surprise and confusion were unnoticed by my husband. He said that he had been referred to one or two gentlemen of standing as to the Count's character, that he called upon them, and felt satisfied that I could not be in better hands. You may imagine what an effect this information had upon me. All night long I could think of nothing else. What seemed most difficult to me was the hiding from my husband our previous knowledge of each other. I feared the Count would at once recognize me and claim acquaintance, which was what I most wished to avoid, to you, from whom I have no secrets, I may own it immediately occurred to me that this would be an opportunity, for which I had in heart been longing, of obtaining the services of a lover I could trust. How to manage it I knew not, but chance, that favorer of all wrongdoers, stood me in good stead. My husband had intended to be present to receive the count. Fortunately, a letter arrived in the morning requiring his instant attendance in the city about the sale of some stock, of which he was trustee. He begged me to see the count, and arranged as to hours of attendance, and see, the more frequently the better. I felt my embarrassment was at an end, 
the next thing was to avoid letting the servants, those domestic spies on our conduct, see the first meeting. There was a small room off our drawing room that had no door but the opening into the drawing room, this was fitted up as a sort of boudoir writing room, and my husband had pointed it out as a convenient place for me to take my lessons in. Here, therefore, I posted myself, and awaited the hour of arrival, to which he was punctual. He was announced and I told the servants to show him in. I sat purposely with my back to the entrance, apparently engaged in writing, as if I did not know he had approached, until I heard the door of the drawing room shut. I then rose, turned, and smilingly held out my hand. He started with surprise, but immediately and gallantly kissed the hand held out to him. I hope you are not disappointed in finding who is going to be your pupil. Oh, no, certainly not, I did not know you under your married name, but I am so happy to renew an acquaintance which at one time had such charming promise. Stop, senor. I am now married, and it is necessary to be very cautious. I do not wish to deny that I am much pleased to renew acquaintance with you, but it must be with great reserve. Sit down by my side, and be reasonable. Reasonable, and by the side of one whom I so much loved, and from whom I had such hope. Oh! Dear Mrs. Edgerton, you are surely not going to treat me as a mere master. You would render me miserable if you did so. How can I help admiring one whom I so fondly loved, and with whom I hoped for such happiness long ago? Here, having possession of my hand, his other arm was passed round my waist, and he drew me to his lips. And I must own, I reciprocated the ardent kiss he gave me. You remember how handsome he is, and how soft and loving was the expression of his eyes. Well, my dear, to cut matters short, I was so excited that I hardly observed that he had passed his hand up to my petticoats, until I found he had got it on my mount. My passions being excited, and knowing that my husband could not return, and also that he had given strict orders that I was not to be disturbed in my Italian lessons, I gave way unreservedly to the excitement the Count raised. Before I well knew where I was, he was on his knees in front of the low chair on which I was seated. He had thrown up my petticoats, and I felt a long and extremely hard prick rush up my cunt, and begin the most lively action. In fact, he carried me, not unwillingly I must avow, by storm, and made haste to secure the fortress at once, so that I had a very quick fuck, that did not assuage the fire he had raised within me. He has since apologized for his haste, saying that he wished to secure possession of me before I could think of resistance, so as to ensure more facilities of connection hereafter. We had no lesson in language that day, but another bout of love, in which he did his utmost, and with perfect success, to give me the most delicious enjoyment. In fact, my dear Lizzie, I may say it was the first fuck that thoroughly realized my or rather our, anticipations of the act. We arranged the line of conduct necessary to be followed so as neither to compromise me or him either. In a short time we had again a delicious fuck. Seated, with outstretched legs, on a chair, he got me to straddle over him, and sink down on his stiff upstanding prick. I have tried this position kneeling, with my husband on his back, but it does not equal the chair fuck. One has so much better a spring from one's feet than from one's knees, besides, the man is brought more face to face, and there is more facility for mutual embracings, but both ways have their charm. I had repeatedly observed that the Count apparently lost his place, and on recovering it, partially penetrated the smaller orifice, which you so picturesquely describe. I thought it accident, and as it hurt, I always put him back, and joked him on his awkwardness. But after I read your dear delightful letter, I became convinced that he had a wish to penetrate there, without the courage to tell me so. I must confess to you, that our stolen embraces at home had become too unsatisfactory, 
and the Count had arranged for a private house to be at our disposal. Of an afternoon I drove out shopping, called at Swan and Edgar's in Regent Street, leaving the carriage at the door, walked upstairs, made some trifling purchase, paid for and left it until I should call in an hour, then descending by another staircase, left by the Piccadilly entrance, and taking a cab, joined my expectant lover, where he was waiting for me. There stripping perfectly naked, we enjoyed each other most lasciviously, and practiced every act of lubricity. When satiated with our efforts, a second cab conducted me to St. James's Passage, in German Street, from whence I gained on foot Swan and Edgar's in Piccadilly, received my parcel, and rejoined my carriage. Thus no suspicions were excited, either in the household or otherwise. We have met thrice since your dear delicious letter fired my imagination, and I have seized the occasion to taste the sweets of the neighboring altar to Venus's legitimate one. After the Count had fucked me twice I turned my back as if wishing it in a way we often enjoyed it, but took care to place my bottom in such a position that the smaller orifice was nearest to his standing prick. Whether he saw my drift I know not, but finding with his finger how conveniently it lay, he plunged boldly forward, and half sheathed himself at the first push. I started with the sudden pain, and should have disengaged myself at once, notwithstanding that I purposely placed myself to receive his prick in my bottom hole, but with his arms round my waist I was perfectly powerless, and another thrust sent him up to the hilt, but really hurting me most sensitively, I begged him to desist and withdraw, but he said. I will remain quite quiet for a time, and you will see that your pain will diminish, and then you will like it. I could not help myself, and sure enough he was right. Shortly I felt no pain, slipping one hand down, he began to frig my clitoris, and in a little time, finding by the involuntary movements of my loins that my passions were excited, he began to move very slightly and slowly. I soon found a strange excitement seize me, which increased to such a degree that I almost fainted, when my nature gave down its divinest essence. We have since repeated the new experience, but I quite agree with you in thinking that we must be well fucked first. The Count is a master of his weapon, which, neither quite so long as you describe your husband's nor nearly so thick at the point, is very much so at the root, and as stiff and hard as iron. I assure you, the wild excess of passion he drives me into is indescribable. You shall experience the delight of his fucking, for, with you and me, there must be no difficulty, diversion, nor jealousy. Nay, I shall try to seduce your husband, with a view to cover our delinquencies. I would offer you mine, but, truly, he is not worth having to a woman who can find better as my dear Lizzie so charmingly does. We have managed matters so prudently that my husband has taken a great fancy to the Count, and he dines frequently at our house. We have often talked of you. I told him of your marriage, and of a probability of your eventually settling in London. I marked the sparkle of his eyes at the news, but was silent as to your letter and adventures. It is better we should manage the affair between us when you are here. So you see, after all, I have not come off so badly, although, I must say, tamely in comparison with the delicious adventures of my dear and charming Lizzie. I think, when we meet, we shall be able to get up parties of the most delightful kind. I even hope we may induce the Count to join you and Charlie in a party career, what fun and pleasure we should have and then the delight of exchanging lovers at each bout. Oh! The very idea has set me on fire, fortunately, I am expecting my lover at every moment. I will close my letter with this lascivious picture, and in hopes of some day realizing it with my loved Lizzie, whose most affectionate and attached friend. I shall ever remain. Carrie Edgerton. Such were these two charming letters, 
and I may immediately mention now that the lascivious picture dear Carrie drew of a party Kariwi for the actors was afterwards realized to the utmost extent of every salacious enjoyment that the most experienced lubricity could suggest. The Count and I often sandwiched them between us, which they declared to be the NE plus ultra of pleasure, while the upper operator Gamma hutched the unoccupied Quim. Nay, these giddy delicious creatures were not satisfied until they had induced us to alternate the joys of coition with each other, but that was rarely the case. These enchanting women were so exquisitely seductive that, while we had them at our disposal, we sought no other source of delight. But I am digressing, and talking of events that occurred long after the period which I am more particularly describing. The three weeks absence of Mr. Benson terminated, alas, far too soon, in fact, time flew so quick that it hardly appeared three days when a letter arrived announcing his return for the next day. My heart was ready to burst, but I managed to make no show or mention when Mrs. B told the news at breakfast. Mrs. B observed that I turned pale, but no one else remarked anything. We contrived to meet for a short time in the middle of the day, and she embraced me tenderly, with tears in her eyes, and looking so loving that my passions became overexcited, and hers too. Notwithstanding the imprudence of the risk, we there and then had a most delightful and salacious fuck, and at night this charming woman allowed me full liberty to do anything I liked, and as often as nature would support us we reveled in a sea of lubricity. How often I cannot say, although my loved mistress declared that I had spent ten times, I am certain she did oftener than that for neither closed an eye, nor ceased from the most loving embraces. She exerted all the wonderful powers of seduction for which she was so distinguished. Never mortal man could have passed a more intoxicating night of pleasure. We heard movements in the house before we parted with mutual tears coursing down our cheeks. It was with difficulty I tore myself from her, indeed, I could not have done so if she had not herself risen and tenderly embracing me, told me to have courage and hope, for, somehow or other, we should manage an occasional interview, particularly cautioning me to be perfectly on my guard when her husband came, she said it would be better if I kept out of the way until after the first interview was over, as it might be too much for me to see him embrace her. I did as she desired. No one noticed me in the confusion of his arrival. Mama had insisted upon my returning to my bed in her room, as she was sure Mr. Benson would require the dressing room. Mrs. B, from policy, objected, saying that there was no occasion, that I had been so quiet she had never once been conscious of my being there, and see, but Mama had her own way, and I really believe very much to the satisfaction of Mrs. B herself, for I doubt, if Mr. B had been aware of my close proximity, whether he would altogether have liked it. Nevertheless, he so completely treated me as little more than a child that I am quite sure he had no suspicion of my having occupied his place so continuously during his absence. Mr. and Mrs. B retired shortly after his arrival, doubtless to plunge into all the joys of Veneri after his long absence, and his wife's supposed privation of them. The idea of that being the case did not so much annoy me as I expected, on the contrary, imagination portrayed them in all the agonies of delight, and actually excited me extremely. All at once, the idea struck me that I might be purposely hid in the closet, behold all their delicious encounters, and when he had left his wife to put herself to rights, and the key was turned upon him, I might then in my turn, fly into my enchanting mistress's arms, and revel in all the joys her well-moistened and juicy cunt could give. I determined to propose this to dear Mrs. Benson the first moment I could get her apart from all observation. I was a little distrait in the schoolroom that day, but an appeal from Miss Evelyn recalled me to my senses. She asked me what I could be thinking of, I held down my head and blushed. Already an adept in dissimulation, I faltered out that it was of herself and of her endearing caresses the day before, which had made me feel so queer all over. In fact, 
The previous day she had hugged me rather close to her, and kissed me more lovingly than usual, which really had, at the time, inflamed my desires, and given me great hope of matters coming to a more satisfactory termination with her. She patted my check, and kissed me again, saying I was a naughty boy to have any such thoughts, and I must not indulge in them, or she would not love me any more. But there was a sparkle in her eye, and a flush on her cheek, which showed me she was anything but displeased. At our usual break up at four o'clock, I went to the parlor to see if, by chance, I could get a secret word with Mrs. B, but found that she and her husband had again retired. I knew what that meant, it set me too on fire, and I flew to the garden where my sisters had gone to play. I gave Mary a hint, which she readily understood, and proposed a game of hide and seek. To prevent Eliza interrupting us, I took up a stone, which I furtively dropped again, and proposed that Eliza should guess first, in which hand I had got it, and if she guessed wrong she was to be the seeker. Of course, she guessed wrong. So we bound up her eyes, and she was to stand behind a tree and count 100 before she attempted to look for or seek us. We made a detour, and as fast as we could run reached the summer house, which, as all the ladies were in the house occupied, I knew to be untenanted. We entered and locked the door, in an instant I had Mary down on her back on the sofa, my head between her thighs, and my tongue in her cunt, and then on her clitoris. She was as eager for it as myself. A week had passed since the happy day of giving up her maidenhead to me. She had thoroughly got over all the pains and inconveniences of that day, and was as ready for a renewal of what could only be joys now as I was. She spent in my mouth almost as soon as I began to gum a hutch her clitoris. Waiting an instant to lick up and swallow the soft and delicious young discharge, I rose, pulled out my bursting prick, and engulfed it in her well-moistened sheath with one rapturous shove up to the hilt, positively taking away her breath by the energy of the attack. I was almost as rapid in coming to a conclusion as she had been. Nevertheless, she died away a second time, the moment she felt the warm gush of my raging discharge. We lay some minutes wrapped in the lascivious lap of lubricity. But in our young and unbroken energies, Nature soon reasserted her power. I must give my sister the palm. It was the internal pressures of the inner folds of her deliciously tight cunt that first awakened my vigor. Somewhat more slowly we began another love encounter, which speedily became much more rapid and energetic, ending as usual in an ecstasy of delight, and closing with actual cries of intense pleasure. It was well we had completed our second course, for we heard the footsteps of Eliza, who, after in vain searching for us near to where we had left her, had at last sought us in the summer house. I had just time to arrange my trousers and unlock the door when she arrived and burst in upon us. She said it was unfair to go so far away, but we only laughed, and proposed that Mary should now seek us. We were standing outside below the mound, tying on the handkerchief when Miss Evelyn was seen approaching. She came up and noticed the flush still on Mary's cheeks, but we at once told her that we had been playing at hide-and-seek, and had had a good run, and that it was now Mary's turn to be the seeker. However, Miss Evelyn said she thought we had had enough exercise for the time, and that it would be better to walk gently about to get cool, as it only wanted a few minutes of the hour for renewing our lessons so we all demurely returned to the house. A reflection struck me that it would be necessary to initiate my sister Eliza in our secrets, and although she might be too young for the complete insertion of my increasingly large cock, I might gama hutch her while fucking Mary, and give her intense pleasure. In this way we could retire without difficulty to spots where we should be quite in safety, and even when such was not the case, we could employ Eliza as a watch, to give us early notice of anyone approaching. It will be seen that this idea was afterwards most successfully carried out to the immense increase of my pleasure. It was a lovely summer evening. After dinner Mr. B, who, 
doubtless, had no longer any amorous longing, after having twice retired during the day, challenged Miss Evelyn to a game at chess, of which she was a great proficient. Mama, Mrs. B, and the two girls stepped out into the flower garden, to enjoy the beauty of the evening. Fortunately Mama fancied she felt chilly, and shortly went back again, taking the two girls with her, and setting Mary down to the piano. I seized the happy moment, and drew Mrs. B to a seat, far removed beyond the hearing of any listeners, but in sight of the windows. There I unfolded to her the plan I had proposed to myself, she smiled at my precocious ingenuity, but added it would not be safe to leave the closet door open, even partially, as by chance Mr. B might open it, and that would never do, but she might lock me in or rather I might do so from the inside. Ah, but then I want to see it all it is so exciting to see Mr. B working into that divine body of yours. She laughed heartily at my remark, and said I was a lewd lascivious young rascal adding. But are you not jealous to see another in possession of me? I admitted that that was my first impression, but on thinking over it, I had become convinced I should like her and enjoy her all the more lasciviously if I were a witness to their love contests, but I must be able to see them. Well, can you not bore a couple of holes an inch and a half apart, below the middle panel and cut a narrow slit from hole to hole? I will take care to place myself in a proper position, and do my best to gratify your premature lubricity. My darling boy, you progress wonderfully, and make me proud of my pupil. Seeing she took it thus kindly, I said. Do tell me, my beloved mistress, how often he has fucked you today. Will it please you really, my dear Charlie, to know that? Oh, yes, so much. Well, then, six times in the morning, and four before dinner. He was bursting with desire, and could not hold. He spent twice before giving me time to come once, but then you know, my dear Charlie, how actively you had been employing your time all the previous night, you sad rope that you are. Did you enjoy it much, my dear Mrs. B? Why, if I must tell you, you little curiosity box, I did, you know how powerfully my husband is hung and loving him as I do, it is impossible to undergo his powerful and lascivious embraces without feeling all one's libidinous passions stirred up within me, but even while in his possession, my dear boy, I thought of your young charms, and the fierce delights we had enjoyed together last night. My husband little imagined it was of you, not him, that I was thinking and stimulating myself to wild upheavings of voluptuous movements while he was reveling in all the lubricity of his own passions, and fucking me to my heart's content. Oh, how delicious, my angelic mistress, I cried, the pleasure of your vivid description almost makes me faint with desire oh, that I could possess you at once. You must not think of that, my dear darling boy. We must manage it tomorrow, I shall go into the house at once, and occupy your mother's attention. Do you get a gimlet and chisel, slip up at once to my bedroom, and prepare a peephole for tomorrow, be careful to put it low down, below the projection of the middle panel of the door in which the lock is placed, and take care to remove the pieces of wood you take out. I shall put the key inside of the door. Your sisters always take two hours at the piano after your midday meal, our luncheon is served at the same time. Mr. B is sure to require my attendance in my room after that, but I shall detain him by some excuse till I observe that you have disappeared, and after giving you sufficient time, we shall follow, and you shall have the extraordinary satisfaction you require, but above all remember not a movement to betray yourself until my husband leaves and I have locked the door behind him. So saying, she pressed her lovely hand on my stiffly excited member, rose and joined Mama. I lost no time in following her advice, and happily executed all I wanted, and returned unconcernedly to the drawing room, without my absence having occasioned any remark. Next day I got safely to my hiding room, 
and had comfortably stowed myself away in such a position that the opening I had made was on a level with my eyes, before they arrived. She, dear creature, anticipating my vista, had merely slipped on a dress, without a corset, and told her husband that he was so. Insatiate that she was obliged to be ready at a moment's notice to satisfy his inordinate passion, so she had only to take off her gown to be at her ease. Most admirable, my darling wife, but drop off everything, and let me contemplate, at my ease, all the beauties of your exquisite body. No sooner said than done, and my lovely mistress stood in all the glory of her magnificent and beautiful naked form. He kissed and fondled her from head to foot, laid her on the bed and Gama hutched her till she squealed again with pleasure. Then pulling out his magnificent prick, he plunged it into her delicious cunt at a single bound, evidently giving her the most exquisite delight, as was evidenced by the instantaneous clasping of him with her arms and legs, and the rapid wriggling of her backside. They soon ran a first course, but Mr. B remained engulfed in the closely fitting sheath of his salacious wife. She evidently exerted herself more than usual, both for her own pleasure as well as to give satisfaction to me, for once when she turned her head in my direction I caught her eyes, and she smiled, giving a still more vigorous heave than usual, and showing me all her cunt at full stretch with the noble prick in it. I was ready to burst. At last their bout was over for the present, Mr. B withdrew his prick, all slimy from its sheath, pendant, but still full of size. Most extraordinary. I would have given a good deal to have dared to rush out, put it in my mouth and suck it dry, I can hardly describe how strongly this desire took possession of me. It was the first promptings of a passion I have since often indulged in where I have met with companions with whom I could join in orgies of both sexes. Mrs. B professed to be dead beaten by the constant and frequent renewals of these interviews in addition to night work and lay perfectly still, while he performed his ablutions and readjusted, his habiliments. Fasten the door after me, said he, as he ardently pressed her form in his arms and kissed her. She had continued stretched on the bed, exactly facing me with legs widely extended, so as to show me the whole of her lovely cunt, which I could see still panted under its late excitement. My charming mistress told me it was palpitating not for what had passed, but for what it was waiting for. She rose at last and closed the door, turning the key upon her husband. She then approached the bidet to purify herself, but I bounded from the closet, seized her in my arms dashed her back on the bed and immediately glued my lips to her glowing and foaming cunt, with all the froth and spending of her husband oozing out. I greedily devoured it, and raised her to such a frenzy of lewdness that she dragged me up and cried, frantically. For God's sake fuck me fuck me. Of course my cock was bursting to do so, with one shove he was sheathed to the cots, my loved mistress spent with that alone, so highly was she excited not only by the preparations, but as she herself acknowledged to me, by the idea of the instantaneous infidelity to her husband, at the moment after he had just fucked her such is the wild imagination of women when they give way to every libidinous thought. It would have been exactly the same if some equally fortunate lover had been awaiting my retiring from the field. The idea of success in deception is a passion with them, and they would almost sacrifice anything to obtain it. Before I could arrive at the grand crisis, she was again ready, and we died away in an agony of blissful lubricity she held me, as usual, so tight that I never thought of withdrawing from the folds of her delicious cunt, but lay still enjoying the never-ceasing compressions of its velvety folds, which sometimes really had almost the force of a vice. I was rapidly ready for a second bout, which, like the first, ended in ecstatic joys, beyond the power of description. My charming mistress thought I ought now to desist, but pleading my forty hours fast, for, of course, she knew nothing of my fucking Mary, I begged her to allow me to run one more course. Then, my darling Charlie, you must let me turn on my side, 
for I am so heated with your weight and my husband's that I must have some relief, but there is no occasion for you to withdraw, leave me to manage it. With an art quite her own, she accomplished her object, her splendid buttocks pressing before my eyes against my belly fired me immediately. My cock swelled and stood firm as ever. Then passing an arm round her body, I used my fingers on her excited and stiffly projecting clitoris. We had a much longer and more voluptuous fuck than before, nothing could exceed the delicious movements of my divine mistress, she twisted her body so, that I could suck one of her bubbies, while I fucked and frigged her, she spent with such a scream of delight that I am sure she must have been heard in the house, had it not been for the inner bay's door to the room. She continued throbbing so deliciously on my prick that I began to flatter myself I should obtain a fourth favor, but she suddenly bolted out of my arms and out of bed. Turning round, and taking my whole prick into her mouth, and giving it a voluptuous suck, she said. No, my loved boy, we must be prudent if we mean to have a repetition of these most exquisite interviews. You have given me most ecstatic pleasure and by moderation, and running no risk in too long indulgence of our passions, we may safely manage to enjoy similar interviews every day. Get into the dressing room, remain there until I leave my room and pass your door. After I have seen that no one is near, I will cough twice, wait a minute longer, then quietly leave and descend by the back stairs. All was happily effected, and for the week longer they remained with us. I found means to repeat the charming lesson every day, without raising suspicion in anyone's mind. At last this admirable woman departed. It was with difficulty I could bear the scene, but I golfed down my feelings as best I could. She had become a universal favorite, and all regretted her leaving, so that my distress was not noticed in the general regret. It was more than two years before fortune favored me in again meeting with this charming woman. And then we saw very much of each other, both alone and with other congenial spirits, of which, perhaps, I may hereafter write a detail, but at present I have got events to relate that followed fast on her departure. I have said that Miss Evelyn had been gradually growing more familiar in her manner of partially caressing me. She drew me closer to her almost invariably placing her arm round my waist, frequently kissing and pressing me against her firm and well-formed bosom. This had frequently an evident effect on my lower person, even while I was kept less excitable by the constant relief my passions were obtaining in the arms of my adored Mrs. B. Now I no longer had that vent, for the little relief I could get at rare intervals from my sister Mary was as nothing after the constant exercise I had been provided with for a whole month. Ever since I had practiced that little deception on Miss Evelyn by attributing to her embraces the evident distraction I was in on the day of Mr. Benson's return, she had increased her pressures of my person, and could not but feel my stiff prick throbbing against her thigh, while she closely pressed my body against it with her arm. I often noted the increased sparkle of her eyes and changes of color on her face when she kissed me, and I put up my hand and caressed her cheek. At times she would push me suddenly away, and beg me to resume my seat, frequently she would quit the room in an agitated manner, till this led me to suppose that an internal conflict was going on, and that passion urged one course, reason another. Remembering the sage advice given to me by my loved and beautiful mistress, Mrs. B, I resolved to play the part of an innocent ignoramus, and let her own passions develop and produce the result I so longed for. I doubt if I could have held out but for the relief I found in dear Mary's embraces, who, each time we could manage to meet, became more and more attractive, and more capable of giving and receiving pleasure. We had some difficulty in keeping Eliza blind to our doings. At last Mary agreed to initiate her into Gama Hutching, and to tell her I did so to her when we shut ourselves up together, and that if she would keep the secret, I would do the same to her, but that it was necessary that one should keep watch while the other amused herself with me, for fear Miss Evelyn should chance to come. Mary proceeded to Gama Hutch her, 
which delighted Eliza beyond measure, indeed, although a year and a half younger, she speedily showed a development of passion superior to Mary. At first I only gama hutched her, letting her play with my prick as I did so, but not attempting to instruct her in the art of insertion into her charming little quim, which already showed symptoms of a hairy growth on her well-formed and very prominent mount. When I had done enough in this way, Mary, who had previously been fucked by me, returned, and Eliza took up the watch, while I appeased in Mary's deliciously tight cunt the thirst that Gama Hutching Eliza had raised. It was thus I could more coolly await the gradual approximation that Miss Evelyn's evident passion for me was bringing about. That she struggled against it was evident, but passion was gaining the advantage, as was shown by her nervous tremblings and sudden clutches, drawing me up to her parched lips, and sometimes pushing me away with a shudder that shook her frame and paled her lovely cheeks. I fancied that nature had been too much for her on these occasions, and that in reality the sudden clutching was the approach of love's crisis, and that when she shuddered, and suddenly repulsed me, she was discharging. It was evident this could not continue. At last the happy day for which I so longed, arrived. Mama was going to go to the town, and taking my two sisters with her, to get something or other for them. She invited Miss Evelyn to accompany her, but the latter declined, on the excuse of an alleged headache. In truth, the violent nature of the conflict going on between her passions and her prudence had visibly affected her health, she had become pale and anxious looking, and my mother was somewhat uneasy about her. She told her not to occupy herself too much with my lessons that day, and only give me work for an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon, and begged her to take a quiet stroll in the garden, and rest as much as possible. On leaving us, she cautioned me to be as gentle and obedient as possible, as Miss Evelyn was poorly and out of spirits. Mama and the girls departed. Miss Evelyn, almost as pale as death, and quite visibly trembling, falteringly begged me to go to our schoolroom and study the lesson she had given me the previous evening, saying she would join me shortly. I went, but no lesson could I do that day. The evident agitation and apparent illness of Miss Evelyn distressed if not alarmed me, I was still too inexperienced in her mind. It was a phase of woman's nature which I had as yet no knowledge of. I had merely a vague kind of idea that it all tended to the ultimate gratification of my libidinous hopes, and I only held off to a certain extent in obedience to the counsel my loved Mrs. Benson had so wisely impressed upon me, and was waiting in lively hopes of the result I so ardently wished for. At last Miss Evelyn joined me, her eyes were swollen and red as if she had been weeping, my own filled with tears when I saw her, and I approached, hesitatingly, and said, Oh, my dear governess, I am so grieved to see you look so poorly. Oh, do nothing today, and I promise to work twice as hard tomorrow. At the moment I really felt quite distressed at the sad expression of her features. For an instant she smiled languidly, then, by some compulsion of feeling, she seized me in both arms and drawing me to her bosom, covered me with kisses, her eyes became almost perfectly brilliant. Oh, you dear, dear, darling boy, I love you beyond expression. Kiss, oh, kiss me, my darling. And comfort me, because I love you all too well. Then, again, there was a change, she seemed to fear she had said too much, and turned away her head and tears started to her eyes but her arms did not relax the embrace in which she held me. I was deeply moved at her evident agitation. I thought she was really ill, and suffering greatly, so I threw my arms round her neck, kissing her tenderly, and weeping myself, tried to comfort her in my inexperienced way, sobbing out. Oh, dear, dear Miss Evelyn, do be comforted. I so dearly love you that it makes my heart bleed to see you so unhappy. Oh, let me see you smile, and do try not to cry so. Why are you so unhappy and low-spirited? 
oh, that I could do anything to make you happy. And redoubling my endearments, she again turned her lovely face to me. Again there was the unnatural fire in her eyes, and a hectic glow flushed her cheek. You darling angel of a boy, it is you that makes me so unhappy. I started back in surprise. I make you unhappy. Oh. Miss Evelyn, how can that be, when I adore the very ground you stand on, and love, sobbing, love, sob, love you more than anything in the world. She seized my head in her two hands, glued her lips to mine, gave me a long, long kiss of love, then, pressing me to her bosom. Oh, say that again, my loved, my darling boy, it is the love I feel for you that is breaking my heart, but I can resist it no longer. Will my Charlie love his Evelyn always as he does now? Oh, how could I do otherwise? I have worshipped you from the first moment of your arrival, and have had no other idea. What can I do to prove it try, oh, try me. I have never breathed a syllable of my love for you, even to yourself, let alone other people. Her eyes, sparkling with passion, were searching the depths of mine, as if to fathom my thoughts. I, too, began to feel my amorous passions excited by her warm embraces and kisses. She held me tight to her body, and could not help feeling the hard substance that jutted out against her. I believe you, my Charlie, and will trust you with my life with more, with my honor. I can no longer resist my fate. But, oh. Charlie, love me always, for I run a fearful risk in loving you as I do. She again drew me to her lips, my hands clasped her neck in a close embrace. Her hands wandered pressed upon my throbbing prick. With trembling and hasty fingers she unbuttoned, or rather tore open, my trousers, and her soft fingers clasped my naked instrument. Oh, I shall die, dear Miss Evelyn, what must I do to make you happy? My apparent ignorance could not but please her. She sank back on the long low chair on which she was seated, apparently accidentally drawing up her petticoats with her hand in falling back. I threw myself on my knees, and pushing her petticoats further up disclosed the rich, dark, curly beauty of her mount. She covered her burning face with her hand, while, pressing my head forward, I began pressing her beauteous cunt, sucking it without daring to lick her clitoris. She tried to push me away no, no. I must not. But I suppose my proceedings fired her passion still more, for she was quite moist and juicy, and I have no doubt had already had one discharge while embracing me so warmly. She suddenly said, Come then, my loved boy, and I will be all in all to you. Drawing me up nothing loath I was soon extended on her belly, with my stiff standing cock pressing against her cunt. I had still the prudence not to show any knowledge of the act. I sighed deeply. Oh, my loved Miss Evelyn, do help me, I know not what to do. Her hand glided down between us. She guided my glowing instrument between the longing lips of her delicious cunt. I pushed, and buried the head and two inches of its body at the first thrust. The second brought it against an unexpected obstacle, for it never had struck me that Miss Evelyn was a virgin. I pushed hard at it. Oh, Charlie, love, be gentle, you are hurting me very much. Knowing that the best way would be to excite her by short shoves, Without at first trying to go further, I did so, and she began to feel all the raging desires that so formidable a prick as mine must excite, when moving between the soft velvety folds of her tight and juicy quim. I held myself in, and continued my proceedings until the convulsive movements of her loins, and the increased pressure of the folds of her cunt, showed me that the crisis was approaching, and she was about to spend. She hugged me close in her arms, and at the moment of spending involuntarily heaved up her bottom. This was the very moment I was with difficulty waiting for. 
I retired a little and plunged forward with irresistible force. I burst my way through every barrier, up to the very roots of my prick. The attack was as painful as unexpected. Miss Evelyn gave a shriek of agony and swooned away. I at once improved the opportunity, and thrusting in and out with the utmost vigor, broke down every obstacle, and enlarged the opening by side movements as much as possible, while she was insensible to the pain. I then died away myself in an agony of delight. I lay soaking within the delicious sheath until her convulsive shudders and short sobs showed that my now fully deflowered mistress was recovering her senses. The thought of the unexpected victory I had won had already begun to make my cock stand again, although it was still comparatively soft. I could feel an involuntary pressure on it, as she came to a full consciousness of our position. She threw her arms round my neck, gave me a most impassioned kiss, and then sobbed and cried as if her heart would break. It is a curious idiosyncrasy of my nature to be most libidinously excited by a woman's tears, and although I really suffered to see her in such grief, it stiffened my prick to its utmost dimensions. I tried to comfort her with words, but she sobbed, sobbed on. I suddenly thought that a renewal of action might bring about a revulsion of feeling, and began vigorous movements. She sighed deeply, but I could tell by the nervous twitchings of her loins that her passions were being excited. They soon decided the contest. She threw her arms round my waist, and pressed me to her, devouring my mouth with her kisses. Nature prompted her movements, and in a very few minutes we both poured down a plenteous offering on Venus's altar. She shook and trembled as she felt the warm gush within her, and squeezed me with all her might to her bosom. We lay in a trance for some ten minutes, my charming governess fainting with love, and giving my delighted prick the most luscious pressure, which speedily fired him to new efforts. Miss Evelyn herself was most amorously excited, and we again dashed on love's delicious path to end, as usual, in the death-like swoon of satiated passion. When we came to our senses, my loved mistress, embracing me tenderly, and throwing her eyes up to heaven, said, Oh, my dear darling boy, you made me suffer horribly at first, but I have been in heaven since. Oh, how I love and adore you. But we must rise, my Charlie, we may be discovered. We have, in fact, run great risk, as the door has not been fastened. I rose, and withdrew my prick from her reeking quim, which seemed by its close pressure to let me go with regret. I found it was all bloody. Stop, Charles, let me wipe it with my handkerchief, lest it stain your shirt. She did so, and folding it up and placing it in her bosom, said. I shall keep this precious relic as a memorial of the sacrifice I have made to you, my loved boy. Ah. Charlie, you cannot yet understand the value of that sacrifice and the risk of ruin I have run for your sake. I love you as I never loved anyone before, or can ever love again. My honor and happiness are now in your hands, and it is on your discretion they rest. Be careful never to exhibit any liberty of conduct towards me or to mention to anyone what has occurred. It may readily be imagined I gave her every assurance on that head, and told her I loved her too dearly, and was too grateful for the ecstatic happiness she had taught me how to enjoy for any chance of betrayal to take place through my indiscretion. She embraced me tenderly, told me to go straight to the garden, that she must seek some repose after all that had happened, and we should meet again at midday meal. I did as desired, full of sweet thoughts at the exquisite delights she had afforded me, and already longing for the afternoon school hour to renew the enrapturing union of our souls and bodies. Miss Evelyn did not come down to her luncheon, but had something sent up to her room. However, she joined me in the schoolroom at two o'clock, as usual. She was very pale, but embraced me tenderly, and was very endearing. Of course, I immediately became excited, and very enterprising, but she gently repulsed me, 
and requested that I would leave her quiet that day, as she felt not only exhausted, but in pain, and would be all the better for perfect repose. I begged hard to be allowed some slight favors, if not all, but she was inexorable. Finding that I could neither do any lessons nor be quiet, she said. Then we must go into the garden, I think the fresh air and a gentle walk will do me good. It instantly occurred to me that if I could draw her away to the summer house, I should have a better chance of succeeding in again enjoying her delicious embraces. Accordingly, when she went up to her room to put on her bonnet and shawl, I possessed myself of the key, to be prepared for my chance of success. We walked about the flower garden for a time, Miss Evelyn taking my arm, and most lovingly conversing with me. She walked somewhat stiffly. We sat down for a rest, shortly she felt the heat of the sun too great, so I proposed a walk in the shaded shrubbery. I kept prattling on, so as not to let her see how far I was leading her away, she appeared surprised that we had got so far, when we came in sight of the summer house. Oh! Charlie, my dear, I am afraid it will fatigue me too much to walk all the way back without rest and we have not the key. Sometimes it is left in the door, I will run and see. Off I bounded, slipped the key in the lock, and ran back to say it was there. She followed me in, and sank on the long backless sofa, which had already served me so often. I begged her to extend herself at length. I placed pillows for her head, and drew a chair for myself near her. She did not appear to have any suspicion of any act on my part, but lay down on her side. She took my hand in hers, and we began a conversation, very interesting, in as much as it was how we should regulate our conduct, so as not to raise any suspicion of our amorous connection, and also of how we should manage to meet from time to time. You, dear boy, she said, I cannot now live without the comfort of your embraces, but you must remember, in my dependent position, discovery would be my ruin. I rely on your silence and discretion, and if I am as dear to you as you, my adored Charlie, are to me, I may safely trust to you. I threw my arms round her neck, and told her I loved her all too dearly, and longed too much to return to her endearing and delicious embraces, for her to have any fear of my committing either her or myself. She fondly embraced and kissed me. I became fired with passion. My hand wandered, her position only enabled her to make a feeble resistance, I reached her beauteously covered mount, she murmured supplications to be left alone, and held her thighs close together. She was not aware of my knowledge of the parts, so inserting my finger into the upper part of the lips, I reached her clitoris, and began rubbing in and out, purposely, in an awkward way, but taking care to hit the right point. Charlie, my Charlie, you must not do that I, I cannot bear it. At the same time she threw her arm round my neck and drew me to her lips, which glued themselves to mine. I felt her thighs yield and open. I immediately improved the occasion, and began frigging her with my middle finger up her quim. Her passions became inflamed. Come then, my darling boy, to my arms, I cannot resist you longer. In an instant I was unbuttoned and had my trousers down and was between her legs almost before she had concluded her sentence. The excitement of my caresses had moistened her juicy cunt, and the head of my prick entered without any difficulty. In my ardor I was about to rush on with a vigorous shove, when she implored me to be more gentle, as she still smarted from our morning encounter. Moderating my movements, and gently insinuating my stiff instrument, I gradually made my way up to its utmost limits, and hardly occasioned even a grimace of pain. Here I stopped, leaving it sheathed up to the root, and making it throb from instant to instant. Then seeking my loved Miss Evelyn's mouth, our lips and tongues met. Her arms round my waist became tighter in their embrace. The delicious folds of her luscious juicy quim began to throb and press on my excited member. Allowing her to become thoroughly excited, 
I waited until she actually quite unexpectedly yielded down her nature, and spent profusely, to the exquisite pleasure of my saturated organ. I still held all off, to give her time after the delight of that spend, which was probably the first of unalloyed ecstatic pleasure she enjoyed, for as I was an inactive participator, there was nothing to cause any action on the still raw edges of her broken maiden head. Her internal pressures were most exquisite. Our embraces with tongues and lips were like the billing and cooing of doves, and very rapidly brought her again to a raging point of desire. I then began with slow and gentle movements, drawing my prick slowly nearly all the way out, and then as slowly driving it up to the hilt. Her previous very copious discharge had so oiled the delicious folds of her cunt, that no pain was felt, only the intense pleasure. At last it became overpowering, her arms were thrown round my waist, and her legs were involuntary cast over my hips. Nature prompted her to the most delicious movements of her bottom, she met my forward thrusts, and responded to them in the most libidinous manner. Go on, go on, dear Charlie faster, faster. I wanted no spur fast and furious grew our movements, until at last, with a mutual cry of delight, we sank in each other's arms in the blissful ecstasy of the most complete enjoyment. It was several minutes before we regained our senses, and both our organs of generation were pulsating, the one within the other, in all the luxury of satiated passion. With her beauteous legs still thrown over mine, she moved her arms to my neck, kissed me voluptuously, and mingled the sweetest accents of gratification with the most endearing caresses and flatteries. I lay, as it were, in the Paphian bower of bliss, in a state of exquisite sensations quite impossible to describe. It seemed even a greater pleasure than the more active state of delight we had been to. I could have lain so for hours, but for that excitable prick of mine, whose sensibilities were far too rapidly set in motion by the luscious pressures of that most delightful cunt in which it lay engulfed. It had gradually resumed its pristine firmness, and was now at full stand, throbbing impatiently for further combats. I began to move. Miss Evelyn said. Oh, my Charlie, you must cease, my dear boy, we must not only be prudent, but consider your youth and health. Do, oh, do, my dear boy, oh, pray cease. Her words were cut short by the increasing passion that the vigorous movements of my prick occasioned to her whole system. She could resist no longer, but with arms and legs closely embracing me, and devouring me with kisses, she threw herself into the fight, and with body and soul so seconded me that we died away in screams of delight, and sank quite insensible in each other's arms. It was many minutes before we recovered speech. I still lay entirely embedded in her most exquisite cunt, and would have liked to have continued in her delicious embrace. But Miss Evelyn so imploringly beseeched me to cease for this time, and pointed out how necessary prudency was, if we ever wished to meet again, that I felt compelled to raise myself from her body. But, in doing so, I slid off downwards, and before she could prevent me, I glued my lips to the open pouters below me, and greedily devoured all her delicious discharge, and did not desist until I had so licked her clitoris as to make her spend most copiously again. At first she had tried to resist, saying, Charlie, what on earth are you it? You must not, my dear boy, it is dreadful. But, as I roused her passions, her hand, instead of trying to draw away my head, held it firm and pushed it well against her throbbing and delicious quim, her thighs closed against the sides of my head, and she almost swooned away with the ecstasy of her discharge. I greedily swallowed it and rising completely, took her in my arms, and placing her on her bottom, sweetly kissed her. Oh, what a charming creature you are, my beloved Miss Evelyn. I adore you from the sole of your feet to the crown of your head. But you, my beloved Charlie, have more than justified my imprudence. 
you have given me a joy which I could never have dreamt of. I am yours, body and soul, do with me as you like. I, too, adore the very ground you tread on. We continued exchanging the sweetest vows of affection, until, seeing my prick rising to its usual stiffness, she said. Oh, my darling, you must put this away, it would be most imprudent to continue any longer. Now, let me button it up. First stooping and kissing it, she put it into my trousers with some difficulty. Buttoned me up, and we strolled towards the house. Our conversation turned on our chance of fresh encounters. She begged I would not think of attempting anything of the kind next day, and she would try and arrange for the day after, although my sisters were terribly in the way. I suggested she should keep me in as when she flogged me, nay, indeed, she should flog me in reality if she liked. She laughed at my idea, but said something might be done in that way as a blind. So I said, I will neglect my lesson on purpose to furnish an excuse. We shall see we shall see. Meanwhile, remember to be very prudent. We reached the house, she retired to her room until Mama returned. Very kind inquiries were made, she said she had suffered severely from headache, but, on the whole, felt better and hoped that a good night's rest would put her all to rights. We all retired early, both Mama and the girls were tired with their drive and shopping. I had resumed my bed in the little dressing room, and went to sleep with thoughts of my delicious day's doings, to dream of reenacting them with every amorous excess that the utmost lubricity could suggest. The next day Miss Evelyn began to resume her former looks the struggle was at an end. She was very gentle in her manner and seemed even more affectionate than usual to my sisters, who, fancying she was not very well, were attentive, rather trying to anticipate her wishes than following them. There was rather a greater appearance of reserve than previously in her manner to me, but when I went up to her to repeat my lessons, there was a warmer clasping of my waist and a suppressed manner that showed she was restraining her desire to press me to her bosom. Her face slightly flushed, and she turned her beautiful eyes upon me with such an endearing expression of affection that I could have thrown myself into her arms but for the check upon my ardor which her own reserve imposed upon me. Nothing more took place between us that day. At our usual hour of recreation, from four till five, Miss Evelyn retired to her room to repose after the efforts of restraint that she had put upon herself all day, and left us to ourselves. I need not say an immediate resort to the summer house followed. There, first deliciously fucking Mary, and then gamma hutching Eliza, with the addition of gently introducing, at the same time, a finger a short distance up her quim, I finished off with another voluptuous fuck with Mary. I thus was enabled to bear the bridal Miss Evelyn put upon the indulgence of my appetite in her person, and was apparently more reasonable than in reality. She again, on the second day, failed to give me the opportunity I so longed for. Thinking she might hesitate, from fear of discovery, and the fact of having no apparently reasonable excuse of being alone with me, I determined to play the idler next day in the afternoon. On being called up, I had done nothing. Miss Evelyn looked grave, but blushed deeply at the same time. What do you mean, Charlie? by this idleness. Go, do your lesson, or I shall be obliged to punish you. She took me by the arm, and gently pressed it as she told me to resume my seat. At four o'clock, of course, my lesson was as far as before from being done. Mary and Eliza, you can go into the garden. Charles will remain until he finishes his lesson, or is punished for his idleness. They left and Miss Evelyn locked the door after them. Then we flew into each other's arms, and indulged in the most endearing caresses for a very few seconds. I had been in a state of most violent erection for some time, so that my hand was up her petticoats immediately. I gently pushed her back on her low long easy chair, and kneeling in front, first thrust my head between her thighs, 
and taking a glance at her beautifully haired cunt, already all moist and juicy, showing that she was as ready as myself, I gama hutched her until she spent in my mouth, and sucked the delicious liquid most greedily. There was something peculiarly sweet in her spend, and my tongue sought the innermost lining of her delicious quim as far as its limited length would admit, that I might not lose a drop of her exquisite nectar, worthy of the gods. The excitement I occasioned her was almost too much for her to bear, she drew me up, saying. Oh. Charlie, my angel of a boy, come, oh, come to my arms. I raised myself up, threw myself into her arms, and in a moment I was engulfed up to the cods in her exquisite and throbbing cunt, she closed upon me with arms and legs. We were both too violently excited to pause for any of the more voluptuous movements of less violent desires, but rushed on in passion's wildest ecstasy, both far too eager to think of any restraint, and with the utmost vigor on both our parts, we ran our first course with great rapidity. My adored Miss Evelyn had quite got over every feeling of pain, and could not but be delighted with the heat and vigor of my attack. We both died away together at the ecstatic moment pouring down a mutual flood of spunk to cool the inflamed members that had the instant before been in such tumultuous action. Darling Miss Evelyn hugged me close to her bosom, and through her beautiful eyes, screaming with passion, up to the ceiling, as if to thank heaven for the joys she had felt. Our lips then met and glued themselves together in one long, long kiss of love, which quickly lighted up our lust, she was as eager as myself, and we had another vigorous encounter, ending in all the agonies of delight, as before. Then after a longer interval of the most endearing caresses and fond accents of murmured love, we ran our third course, with more abandon lengthening out our exquisite sensations, by slower and quicker movements and pauses between in which my beautiful governess began to develop an art in which she shortly became even superior to the more experienced Mrs. Benson, who had so charmingly initiated me into love's mysteries. There was a peculiar charming and endearing softness in the manner of Miss Evelyn most winning and most exquisitely attractive. It was evidenced even in her mode of handling my prick, without grasping it. Her hand appeared to pass over it hardly touching it, but in so exciting a manner that after any number of encounters, she could raise it by her fairy touch in a moment. Our third encounter lasted quite half an hour, and we sank in the death-like luxury of discharge, our whole souls seemed to exude with the exquisite distillation of our seed. We had long before regained our senses. I was still engulfed in her delicious cunt but she begged me to relieve her of my weight. We rose, she shook her petticoats down, and assisted me to arrange my trousers. I then sat down and took her on my knee. Our lips met in a mutual warm kiss of gratified passion. She thanked me for the joys of paradise I had given her and for my discretion in procuring an excuse for our meeting. She acknowledged that she had been as impatient as myself but was obliged to take every precaution against raising the slightest suspicion in the house. You must always remember, my darling boy, that for me discovery would be my ruin forever. I risk everything to possess you, my beloved boy, I would care little for discovery, if it would not also separate us forever. That idea, my adored Charlie, is insupportable, I can no longer exist without you. Here she threw her arms round my neck, and burst into tears. I have already described the effect of tears on my unruly member, which, while I was consoling and vowing eternal attachment to my loved mistress, burst from its bonds and stood out in all its glory. I took her soft and beautiful little hand, and laid it on it. She grasped it tightly, and looking at it, while smiling through her tears, said, my Charlie, what a great big thing it is. I wonder how it could ever get into me, without killing me. You shall soon see that, said I, and changing places, I laid her down, lifted her petticoats and was into her in a moment. She begged me to proceed slowly, and to lengthen out our pleasures as much as possible. 
We had a most glorious and truly delicious fuck, my lovely and charming mistress giving me most ecstatic pleasure by the exquisite pressures of the internal folds of her delicious and lascivious cunt. We lay enraptured for long after we had spent, and then resumed our sitting position, and arranged everything in order as the time for the return of my sisters from their hour of recreation was close at hand. Our conversation naturally turned upon how we should arrange for our next meeting. Miss Evelyn insisted that we must not think of meeting more than once in three or four days, as otherwise we might raise suspicions fatal to our meeting at all. However reasonable this was, I raised an outcry against such a tantalizing delay, and begged hard for a shorter period between our intervals. It cannot be my darling boy, remember discovery would separate us forever. By prudence, we may long continue these delicious meetings. I suddenly suggested that as I slept alone in the little room, which, when the spare room was unoccupied, was far away from everyone, she might steal along at night, when all were asleep and thus I could enjoy the whole of her exquisite charms, without hindrance. She did not reply, but I could see her eye sparkled, and her cheek flushed as if already in imagination she was reveling untrammeled in all the luxury of voluptuousness such a plan opened out. However, she did not at once accept, but kissing me fondly, called me her dear and ingenious boy, and said she would think over my suggestion. We resumed our lessons on my sister's return. Miss Evelyn was again four days before she gave me another opportunity of an amorous meeting. It was only my purposed insubordination that obtained me this interview. We again indulged in all the luxuries of carnal enjoyment, as far as could be done, incommoded as we both were by dress and locality. Reverting more strongly than ever to my plan of meeting in my lonely room, I begged so hard that at last she promised to come the night of the following day. I was obliged to put up with this, although I would fain have had her come that very night, but as her passions were evidently gaining stronger possession of her, and she was becoming more loving, and more voluptuous than ever, I felt certain she would not disappoint me on the next night. The delicious idea of reveling in charms I had so often furtively gazed on, kept me away from my sister's next day. Under a plea of headache I went early to bed, and took up some oil, to oil the hinges and lock of the door, to be prepared for my loved mistress. I lay long awake, and was almost in despair of her coming, when I heard the clock strike twelve. All at once I became aware she was at my bedside. She had entered the room with so gentle a step that though on the watch for her, I did not hear her even when she opened the door, shut, and locked it. She had come in her dark grey cloak, and when at my bedside this was dropped on the floor, she stood in nothing but a very fine and thin chemise. She flung herself in my arms, as I rose to embrace her, and we instantly sank closely clasped in each other's arms. I was far too sharply set to practice any preliminaries. I turned her on her back and was into her in a moment, with one vigorous thrust, which almost took away her breath, and gave her intense delight. I was too quick for her, however, as I spent in two or three shoves into that delight-giving cunt. But as this hardly allayed the fires of my too ardent desires, the convulsive internal movements of her unsatisfied orbit quickly restored my scarcely reduced member to a renewed vigor. Miss Evelyn being greatly excited by the unsatisfying nature of my first bout, was extremely warm, and throwing her arms and legs around my body, we again rushed headlong into all the fury of fucking, and as my previous spendings had somewhat reduced the power of immediate discharge, I was able to suit my movements exactly to those of my most active companion, and we sank together in all the voluptuousness of satisfied desires, lying long locked in each other's arms before we were again in a state to renew our combats in love's delicious domain. We spent the interval in whispered vows and fond endearments and embracings of each other's naked charms, both of us admiringly passing our hands over every part of our bodies. Miss Evelyn at last concentrated all her attention on my well-developed member, 
which she most endearingly embraced and fondled tenderly, very quickly putting him into an ungovernable state of erection. I was lying on my back, and she partially raised herself to kiss my formidable weapon, so gently putting her upon me, I told her it was her turn to do the work. She laughed, but at once mounted upon me, and bringing her delicious cunt right over my prick, and guiding it to the entrance of love's grotto, she gently sank down upon it and engulfed it until the two hairs pressed against each other. A few slow up and down movements followed, when becoming too libidinous for such temporizing delays, she sank on my belly, and began to show most wonderful activity of loins and bottom. I seconded her to the utmost, and finding she was so excited, I slipped my hand round behind and introduced my middle finger in the rosy and very tight orifice of her glorious backside. I continued to move in and out in unison with her up and down heavings. It seemed to spur her on to more vigorous actions, and in the midst of short gaspings and suppressed sighs, she sank almost senseless on my bosom. I, too, had quickened my action, and shot into her gaping womb a torrent of boiling sperm. We lay entranced in the raptures of satiated desire for a long time. At last she came to her senses, and fondly kissing me, turned off, and we lay side by side closely embraced. Oh, my beloved Charlie, what exquisite delight you have given me, you are the most delicious and loving creature that ever could be created. You kill me with pleasure, but what was that you were doing to my bottom? What put such an idea into your head? I don't know, I replied. I put my arm round to feel the beautiful globes of your bottom, and found in grasping one that my finger was against a hole, all wet with our previous encounters, and pressing it, found that my finger slipped in, you gave it such a delicious pressure when in that the idea entered into my head that, as it resembled the delicious pressure your enchanting other orifice gives my shaft when embracing you, this orifice would like a similar movement to that which my shaft exercised in your quim. So I did so, and it seemed to add to your excitement, if I may judge by the extraordinary convulsive pressures you gave my finger when you died away in all the agony of our final rapture. Tell me, my beloved Miss Evelyn, did it add to your pleasure as much as I fancied? Well, my darling Charlie, I must own it did, very much to my surprise, it seemed to make the final pleasure almost too exciting to bear, and I can only account it a happy accident leading to an increase to pleasure I already thought beyond the power of nature to surpass. Naughty boy, I feel your great instrument at full stretch again, but you must moderate yourself, my darling, we have done enough for tonight. No, no. No. I am not going to let him in again. Passing her hand down, she turned away its head from the charming entrance of her cunt, and began handling and feeling it in apparent admiration of its length, thickness, and stiffness. Her gentle touch did anything but allay the passion that was rising to fever heat, so sucking one of her bubbies, while I pressed her to me with one arm under her, and embracing her on the other side, I passed my hand between our moist and warm bodies, reached her charming clitoris, already stiff with the excitement of handling my prick. My titillation soon decided her passions, and gently prompting her with the arm under her body, I turned her once more on the top of me. She murmured an objection, but offered no resistance, on the contrary, she herself guided my throbbing and eager prick into the voluptuous sheath that was longing to engulf it. Our movements this time were less hurried and more voluptuous. For some time she kept her body upright, rising and falling from her knees. I put my finger to her clitoris, and added to the ecstatic pleasure she was so salaciously enjoying. She soon found she must come to more rapid and vigorous movements, and lying down on my belly embraced and kissed me. Toying with our tongues I put an arm round her waist, and held her tight while her glorious buttocks and most supple loins kept up the most delicious thrust and pressures on my thoroughly engulfed weapon. I again stimulated her to the highest pitch of excited desires by introducing my finger behind, 
and we both came to the grand crisis in a tumultuous state of enraptured agony, unable to do aught, but from moment to moment convulsively throb in and on our engulfed members. We must have lain thus languidly, and deliciously enjoying all the raptures of the most complete and voluptuous gratification of our passions, for fully thirty minutes before we recovered complete consciousness. Miss Evelyn was first to remember where she was. She sprang up, embraced me tenderly, and said she must leave me at once, she was afraid she had already stayed imprudently long. In fact, it was near five o'clock in the morning. I rose from the bed to fling my arms round her lovely body, to fondle and embrace her exquisite bubbies. With difficulty she tore herself from my arms. I accompanied her to the door, and with a mutual and loving kiss we parted. I to return and rapidly sink into the sweetest slumber after such a delicious night of most voluptuous fucking. She came again three times in the next six nights, each time we renewed our mutual joys, with ever increasing voluptuous indulgencies. On coming to me for the fifth time, she said. Dear Charlie, I have only come to kiss you, and say I cannot stop. Cannot stop. I cried, and why not, beloved Miss Evelyn? I am not well, but cannot explain more. I had sprung out of bed, and clasped her in my arms, then passing a hand down to her beauteous and well-covered Mons Veneris, I found that she was tied up there in cloth. I immediately remembered how my loved Mrs. Benson had been exactly in the same way. I then also remarked the peculiar odor of breath, but pretending ignorance, I begged to know what had happened to my darling little grotto. I cannot tell you more, my dear boy, but it will keep me away from you for four or five nights. But why should that be the case, cannot you let me enter that delicious cave of delight only once? No, no impossible my dear charlie absolutely impossible it would do me very great harm and you too let us be quiet in that way and i shall be the sooner well again to come and embrace you as before oh but darling how can i support five nights absence i shall go mad with desire and burst feel how he grows and is longing for his loved companion her soft and gentle hand caressed it I thought to succeed by a coup de main, but she was too quick for me. No, Charles, I am serious, and you must not try to force me, or I shall never come near you again. I saw she was in earnest, and flung myself on the bed in a pet. Come, my darling Charlie, be reasonable, and I will do my best to give you some satisfaction. Lay yourself on your back so. I will kneel on the floor at right angles to you, because you must not attempt to touch me down there. That is a dear boy. So taking my prick in her soft hand, she gently moved it up and down, then, suddenly stopping, took it into her mouth, sucking as much as she could get in, and titillating the knob with her tongue, while one hand frigged it. The root of my prick and the other gently handled my two crisped up cods. She prolonged the pleasure by occasional pauses, and at last, on finding the electric-like sensations coming, she hastened her movement, and I poured a torrent of sperm into her mouth. She continued her delicious sucking until not a drop more was left for her to swallow. This was the first time she ever gamma hutched me, but it was not the last by scores of times. Ever after we improved upon the model, and added other endearments, when not under her courses, we mutually gamma-hutched each other, and she was the first to repeat upon me, with the intensest gratification, the delicious introduction of a finger behind while gamma-hutching me. At present, when she had thus taken the edge off my carnal appetite, she lovingly embraced me, and left me to my lovely slumbers. Of course, the four days grace, saving two more passing visits to keep me cool, as she said, turned all to the advantage of my sisters, whom I fucked and frigged to their utmost gratification and delight. I thus passed about four months. 
Miss Evelyn becoming a perfect adept in love's delicious mysteries, but, although I had attempted to enjoy the orifice of the lower temple of Venus, my member was too large, and gave too much pain, to completely succeed, so that I became the faithful worshipper at the more legitimate altar of love. My sisters were gradually developing their forms. Mary particularly so. The hair on her quim had increased to a most charming curling profusion. Her hips spread out, and her bottom, hard and prominent, promised to be very large. Eliza, too, began to show increased bubbies, and an enlarged and mossy mons venerous. We were approaching summer, and near the full of the moon, Mary had complained of feeling very low-spirited, and very much inclined to cry. I tried to comfort her, and thought success would best attend my efforts if I fucked her. So enticing her down into the garden, we entered the summer house, and I at once proceeded to action. She was rather unwilling, she could not say why, but had an instinctive reluctance. She yielded, however, to my entreaties, and I fucked her without apparently exciting her in the usual way. I consequently withdrew as soon as I had run the first course, and at once discovered what ailed poor Mary. My member was covered with blood. For the first time her courses had come upon her. She was greatly alarmed, but I told her I had heard it was quite natural to young women when they reached a certain age, that she had better tell Mama at once, who would instruct her what to do. I carefully wiped my reddened member and then retired to my room to purify myself. That very night, on Miss Evelyn coming to me, I found she was exactly in the same state. She gave me my usual relief with her soft hand and caressing lips, and then left me for five nights, as at that time. I now found myself reduced to my dear little sister Eliza. Up to this time I had never actually fucked her, and her maiden head was still intact. She was now approaching fourteen, and the down on her charming little cunt was becoming more decided, her bubbies too, under the erotic excitement of my adoushments and gamma hutching, had assumed a decided prominence. My finger had somewhat rendered the opening of her little pinky slit more easy of access. So I resolved to complete her carnal education and fuck her thoroughly. The opportunity was perfect. Both Miss Evelyn and Mary retired to their rooms to lie down at our usual hours recreation, Eliza and I at once hide to the summer house, and locked ourselves in. I immediately laid her down on the long couch, and Gamma hutched her until she spent in my mouth, and then continued until she was again almost mad with desire. I then told her I should initiate her into a new mystery, more delicious than any she had yet experienced but that the first initiation was always painful. Oh, what is it, my dear Charlie, everything you do is so nice, I know I shall like it what is it? Then you must know, dear Eliza, that this little cunt of yours is made for the express purpose of having a prick put into it, only, as mine is so large, and you are still so small and so young, I was afraid it would give you too much pain to do it sooner, but now, I think, I may get it in, if I do it gently. Oh, Charlie, dear, put it in at once, I have often felt I should like it so, but, as you never attempted to do it, I thought it was a mere fancy of mine. Have you ever put it inside Mary's quim? Often, nay, always, my darling. Does she like it? She adores it. Then put it into me directly, Charlie. I wanted nothing better, and told her that in order to thoroughly enjoy it, she must strip. In a minute she dropped off everything, while I took off my trousers coat and waistcoat having been already laid aside. I had brought a towel to lay on the couch below her bottom, to prevent any telltale stains. Laying her down on her back, with her bottom close to the end, her legs gathered up, and her two feet resting on the sofa with her knees falling outwards, in the very best position for my intended operation, I put a pillow on the floor, on which I knelt, 
thus bringing my cock a little above her quim to give me a good purchase. I then first gama hutched her well again, until she spent and cried out. Oh, put it in, my dear Charlie, I do feel to want it so. She was already well moistened by her previous discharges, and by my licking the lips of her cunt, and covering them with saliva, with which I also, at the same time, wetted my prick itself. I then made the point approach the charming pouting and longing lips of her sweet little cunt, and rubbing it first up and down between the lips, proceeded to insert its knob between them. Thanks to the precautions taken, and the excitement I had raised by my previous caresses with tongue and prick, the immediate entrance was effected with greater ease than might have been expected. No sooner was it in about an inch beyond the knob than the passion of excitement I had raised so stimulated the natural lubricity of Eliza's nature that she heaved up her buttocks energetically, letting her knees drop quite down sideways, thus favoring to the utmost my forward thrust made at the moment, so that my prick was sheathed in an instant more than half his length, and but for the obstacle of her maidenhead, which he then met with, would have been entirely engulfed. As it was, it gave her a very sharp pang of pain, which made her shrink back, and utter an Oh! Charlie! Do not fear, I will be gentle, keep still a moment and then you will find the pain pass away, and great pleasure follow. So we lay still for a time, until I felt those involuntary internal pressures, the true precursors and infallible indicators of rising desires, so commencing a slow and continuous in and out movement, I shortly produced such an excess of pleasure in her delicious orbit, that her movements became almost furious, and nature alone prompted her to second me with as much art as if she had already been long instructed in the delicious movements so calculated to add to the libidinous delights of true enjoyment. But Eliza was a rare example of a truly salacious and voluptuous nature, and proved herself in that way far in advance of Mary, although she was of a very warm temperament, Eliza's passions were far more excitable, and in the end she became one of the most voluptuous fuckers possible, abandoning herself to all the wildest raptures that the most erotic nature could suggest. Of this, hereafter, at present I had worked her up to the utmost pitch of excited desire, she was in the very act of discharging, and as I withdrew for a final thrust, she heaved up her buttocks in an agony of pleasure, I felt it was now or never, and striking home with all my force, I burst with irresistible strength through every obstacle, and tore my way inwards, until sheathed to my very cods. Poor Eliza! At the very moment she thought herself in the seventh heaven of delight, she experienced the most excruciating agony. She gave a piercing cry and fainted away, her arms fell senseless from my body her legs would have also fallen, but twining my arms round them, I continued for several successive thrusts to penetrate fully and easily into every recess, for I myself was wound up to a fearful state of excitement. I died away in an excess of joy, sending a torrent of balmy sperm to soften and mitigate the pain of her terribly torn quim. Finding that Eliza could not regain consciousness, I rose somewhat in alarm, and was horrified to see the quantity of blood that followed my withdrawal. It was fortunate my forethought of the towel, as it had not only saved the sofa, but helped to stanch her swollen and bleeding quim, and to wipe the blood from her thighs and bottom. I had effected all this before the dear girl showed the least symptoms of animation, she first sighed, then shivered, and at last opened her eyes, and looked confusedly at me, and asked. What has happened to me, Charlie? Then observing how she was lying naked, she recovered her complete consciousness of all the circumstances of the case. Oh! Charlie, now I know, I thought you had killed me, Charlie, oh! It was so frightfully painful. How could you hurt me so, and just as I thought it was the most heavenly pleasure I had ever experienced in all my life? My darling, it is all over now, and it will never hurt again, and we shall both of us have greater pleasure than ever, but not just now, it has been greater pain to you than I thought it would be, 
and for the present we must not attempt any more. I helped her to rise, but she felt very faint, and I had great difficulty in getting her dressed. She was shocked to see the bloody state of the towel. I told her to put my handkerchief between her thighs, and partly up her slit, to prevent any marks of blood staining her shift. I then laid her down on the sofa, while I ran to get some water from the fountain in the garden. I took a glass and the towel with me. I returned with the water, which greatly refreshed Eliza. I begged her to lie still as long as she could stay. However, when she attempted to walk, she found herself very much incommoded with the smarting pain. I was terribly afraid lest this would be observed when we got to the house, so I suggested she should purposely fall down when in sight of anyone, and say she could not move because she had hurt her knee by the fall. This stratagem succeeded admirably. We were seen approaching by Miss Evelyn, my mother, and Mary. Dear Eliza acted her part admirably, was seen to fall heavily, and screamed. They all rushed out, we lifted her carefully on her legs, and supported her to the house, she complaining of the pain in the knee and ankle. My mother insisted on her going to bed at once, and having embrocations and hot towels applied. Eliza let them do as they liked, and eventually was left to quiet repose, which soon relieved the painful sensations she had undergone. Next day she complained of great stiffness, and walked lame, but thought the hot applications had prevented the swelling, so thus happily passed off all observations of suspicion of the real circumstances of the case. It was not until the third day after that I attempted to make an entrance. Of course, I excited her first to the utmost by a long continued gamma hutching. She then let me, but with fear and trembling, introduce my bursting member into the delicate folds of her cunt. As I was very gentle in my movements, the pain was scarcely felt, and when once well sheathed, and the first thrusts given slowly and luxuriously, the whole lubricity of her nature was soon awakened, and by the time I was ready to spend she was as ready to second me, and we died away in a mutual flood of delighted ecstasy. She held me close, and would not let me withdraw. No, Charlie, it took some trouble to get it in, let it stop where it is so deliciously engulfed, and at once anticipating her natural desires, she began the most exquisite pressures upon me, which very shortly brought us both up to the point of demanding more active measures. However, I rather restrained her, and told her we must retard our movements to increase our pleasures, because mere quick repetitions would only exhaust her, without yielding the true ecstasies of enjoyment. I, therefore, taught her the pleasures of the slow movements, and I worked her up to spending point, without giving way myself. The dear little creature clung to me with the most close and endearing embraces, as if she should force a complete amalgamation of our two bodies, and died away in the sweetest bliss of contented desire, with such a heavenly expression of ecstasy on her face as made me devour it with kisses. I had great difficulty in restraining myself from precipitately following her example, her delicious movements at the moment of spending, and the close pressures on my prick, were so exciting that resisting them was quite a triumph of control. I succeeded, and lay quite quiet, embalmed in the delicious suction of those exquisite folds of her charming little cunt, which exercised the most delightful pressures as well as suction on my enraptured prick. I left it entirely to her to lie as we were as long as she pleased, or to again begin the dear delightful friction that should once more make us dash on passion's furious course, to end as usual in the ever delicious ecstasies of the final crisis. This last bout had been a double one for my sister, she all but swooned away with the rapture my spending in unison with her produced. She declared it was a death of the most delicious ecstasy, which it was perfectly impossible to describe. She clung to me, kissing me in the most endearing manner, and telling me how happy I had at last made her by completing the insertion of my prick in her cunt. 
it was worth the suffering of twenty times as much agony to arrive at so exquisite a result as every fuck I now gave her conferred upon her. We adjourned to the flower garden, that we might be seen playing together, and not excite suspicion by our constant disappearance, now that we were only two together. Of course, Mary knew what we were at and probably guessed that I had completed the initiation of Eliza. She smiled, and gave me a significant pressure of the hand, when we met again in the schoolroom to resume our lessons. For two days more I enjoyed Eliza all to myself, at each new fuck she became more and more perfect in conferring as well as receiving pleasure. On the third day, Miss Evelyn whispered, tonight, as she gave me a stolen pressure of the hand. She came, and we indulged in every whim of our fancy. I had further the delicious pleasure of gazing on all her naked beauties, as it was daylight before we parted, I had gamma hutched her twice, and fucked her five times. She gave me credit for a long fast, and allowed so much indulgence on that account, but told me I must in future be more moderate, for her sake, if not for my own. She allowed three nights to pass before again coming to me. I cannot say I regretted it because now that Eliza was initiated, as well as Mary, we indulged in the most delightful orgies of fucking and gamma hutching at the same time. At first we used to fuck with one laid on her back to be fucked, while the other backed on her knees over the face of the one being fucked, and was gamma hutched by her, while I introduced my finger into the rosy orifice of the bottom before me. But we found the most voluptuous way was for one to lie down on her back, and the other on hands and knees over her. She thus brought her mouth over the cunt of the one lying down, and presented her bottom to me, who knelt behind her. The one below guided my prick into the cunt above her face, she had thus all the satisfaction of seeing our action, while with one hand she tickled my cods, and the other felt my bottom hole, and inserted a finger. Meanwhile, she was gamma hutched and bottom frigged at the same time by the one I was fucking, and we used all three to die away in agonies of enraptured delight, to recommence with a change of places between the two girls. Sometimes I tried to introduce my prick into the rosy little orifice of Mary's backside, but, although the finger fricking gave her much additional pleasure while her cunt was operated upon by my virile member, she as yet could not support the insertion of my large prick. I had not even attempted little Lizzie, but one day, when Miss Evelyn and Mary were again under menstruation, and I had dear Lizzie all to myself, she was seized with such an irresistible desire to ease herself, that she had only time to get behind a bush and squat down. I remained waiting for her, when she called to me, to ask if I had any paper. I advanced to give her some. She was in a half-standing position with her clothes held up to her waist. While giving her the paper, my eyes accidentally fell upon what she had voided. I was struck with its extraordinary thickness. I made no observation at the time, but it raised an idea that preoccupied me much. I had often thought over the pleasure that fucking Mrs. Benson's bumhole had given me, hence I had tried to initiate both Miss Evelyn and Mary in that delightful route of pleasure, but, as before stated, had been unable to succeed with them from the great development of my weapon. Thinking that if they could not bear the insertion, there could be no possibility of success with my younger and less developed sister, I had never attempted with Lizzie more than the insertion of one finger. It is true, with her it seemed to produce more excitement than either upon Miss Evelyn or Mary. The sight of the extraordinary dimensions of the matter she had voided now suggested the idea that if her apparently very small and rosy-lipped bottom hole could allow so large a mass to come out, with gentle efforts my scarcely larger machine might be inserted. I determined to try the initiation into that root of delight the very next day. Remembering that dear Mrs. Benson always made it a rule that she should be first well fucked and gamma hutched, and the prick well moistened. I began by exciting dear Lizzie to the utmost. I first fucked her, and made her spend twice to my once, then Gama hutched her until she implored me to shove my prick into her. 
I had managed to introduce my two forefingers at once into her bottom, and had frigged her while sucking her cunt, without apparently giving any pain, on the contrary, from her movements I fancied she felt greater excitement. I took care to enlarge, as much as possible, or rather to stretch her bottom hole as open as I could with two fingers. It was at the moment of her greatest excitement, when she was pressing me to fuck her at once, that I said. My dearest sister, there is still another mystery of sensual voluptuousness that you have as yet not experienced or been initiated into, and I am about to instruct you in it. Oh, what is it, dear Charlie, but do anything you like, and as quick as possible. Well, then dear, it is this sweet little orifice in your bottom that I am going to introduce my prick into. It may give you some little pain the first time, but by gentleness of movement, and halting from time to time when it hurts too much, we shall get him completely inserted, and then it will be an immense pleasure to both of us. Dear, dear Charlie, do as you like, your darling prick can only give me the greatest delight, I am dying to have him into me, I don't care where, as long as I get the dear creature into me. I suppose I must be on my hands and knees. Upon which she turned with great agility, and presented the two hard and already promising globes of her charming backside. I lost no time in first thrusting my prick up to the hilt in her cunt, to moisten it. It made her shudder again with excess of lust, and she exercised such a pressure upon it that I had some difficulty in withdrawing it. It was so snug and nice therein that was a great temptation to run a course in her cunt at once, but having the other object in view, and knowing that I wanted all its stiffness to succeed, I did summon up courage enough to withdraw, then applying the very plenteous saliva in my mouth that Gama hutching her had stimulated, I added it to the already moistened prick, and applying some to her bum hole, and introducing a well-wetted finger, I put the knob of my formidable prick to the small end smiling orifice that lay before me. The disproportion struck me as so great that I dreaded success would be much too painful for her, but remembering the dimensions of what had come out of it, I boldly proceeded with the operation. I got in over the knob without making her flinch, but, as I proceeded to push gently forward, and had got in about two inches, she cried. Stop a little, Charlie it feels so queer I can't bear it in further. I stopped where I was, but slipping a hand under her, I applied my finger to her clitoris, holding her bottom tight against me with the other hand round her waist, so as not to lose ground. My agile finger soon worked her passions up, and I felt her bottom give convulsive twitches on my prick. I allowed her to become still more excited, and then gently pushing forward found I was slowly, and almost imperceptibly, gaining ground. My prick was then inserted almost two-thirds of its length, when, thrusting rather too sharply, she again cried out, and, but for the arm that held her fast round the waist, would have unseated me. Oh, Charlie, dear, do stop, it seems to choke me, and makes me feel so queer, that I thought I was going to faint. I shall lie quite still, now dear Lizzie, it is quite in this was a little bit of deception to calm her fears and when the pain of insertion passes, which will be the case in a minute, we shall have nothing but pleasure. So I kept my prick just where he was, but redoubled my frigging her clitoris, and very soon brought her up to spending point, resolved that I would not attempt complete insertion until I felt she was in the raptures of sensual discharge. This quickly came upon her and it was the delicious movement of her own buttocks that sheathed my prick to the hilt without an effort on my part, and so far from giving her pain, made her positively scream with the intense voluptuousness of her sensation in spending. She could not speak for many minutes, but continued the exquisite pressures of the sphincter muscle on my enraptured prick. But for my determination not to give way, and rather to wait for another bout that would completely initiate dear Lizzie in all the luxury and abandon of this delicious mode, I must have at once vigorously finished my own course. 
My restraint was well rewarded. The first words my beloved sister uttered were those of almost delirious joy at the extraordinary delight I had given her. Never, never, had any fuck so enraptured her. She turned up her lovely face to me, and tears of sensuality and voluptuousness filled her eyes. I had hardly begun my titillations on her still excited clitoris, which, by the way, had lately considerably developed itself, when she was as eager for another bout as I was. I held sufficient restraint on myself to practice every salacious movement, that I might give Lizzie such exquisite pleasure as should induce her on future occasions to grant me the use of her charming bottom hole whenever I should desire. I worked her up to the utmost pitch of the most salacious excitement, and at the moment when she spent, in an agony of shrieking ecstasy, I poured a perfect flood of spunk right up into her entrails, and we both sank forward, but without unseating me, quite overpowered by the intensity of our delight. When we came to our senses I rose from off her. On withdrawing my prick I found a few traces of blood, but of no moment. I wiped my prick on a handkerchief, and also wiped between the cheeks of dear Lizzie's bottom, for fear any telltale marks should be made on her linen. I then helped her up, and she threw her arms round my neck, and sweetly kissing me, thanked me for a new lesson in love, which had overwhelmed her with delight. Thus ended the first lesson that Lizzie ever received by that root of pleasure, and I may incidentally state that she was peculiarly constituted for giving and receiving the most exquisite pleasure in that way. She afterwards developed into a magnificent woman, with one of the naturally largest and finest backsides I almost ever met with, and she came to love backward fucking to the utmost extent. In after days, when married, she told me that her husband was a muff, who had no idea of enjoying a woman but in one way. She had often deceived him, and slipped it into her bottom hole without his ever having any suspicion of the sort of pleasure he had given her. Three months passed with the rapidity of a dream, while we indulged in these scenes of delicious lubricity and voluptuousness, without ever attracting any observation within the house and, more curious, without Miss Evelyn either discovering or suspecting anything between my sisters and myself thanks to my natural powers and the unfailing resources of youth. Both she and my sisters thought they each gave me as much as I could get through, and, therefore, neither ever imagined I could seek carnal delights in other arms. So it was but now there happened one or two events which had a considerable effect on the after tenure of our loves. A neighbor, a very nice good-looking man, about thirty-five years of age, a gentleman farmer, very well off, had for some time past always waited for us at the church door on Sundays, apparently for a chat with Mama, Miss Evelyn, and us. He treated and evidently considered us as mere children, nor did he appear to fix particular attention to anyone. One Monday my mother received a note from him, to beg she would grant him a short interview on the following day, as he wished for her advice on a subject of much interest to him. Mama's reply begged him to come at eleven o'clock, when she would be happy to see him. He came, and was particularly neatly dressed. My mother had been very agitated all the morning, and looked flushed and nervous as the hour drew near. I really believe the old lady fancied it was for an idle avowal to herself that he was coming. Be that however as it may, the object of his visit turned out to be a proposal to Miss Evelyn, with an offer of marriage. He was ready to make such settlements upon her as could not but be satisfactory. He told my mother that before speaking to Miss Evelyn, whom he had loved from her first appearance in the parish, and whose quiet, modest character had daily made a deeper impression, he thought it only his duty to first break the subject to her and to ask her permission for an interview with Miss Evelyn, and next, if he was acceptable to her, for leave to visit at our house, while courting his wished-for wife. He further stated that he had never ventured to hint the state of his feelings to Miss Evelyn, and prayed my mother to be the kind intermediary in opening the subject to her, and to beg as a favor that she would grant him an interview to state his case in person on the following day, 
so that he might learn his fate from her own lips. My mother, although probably inwardly a little disappointed, had the interest of Miss Evelyn too much at heart not to take up the matter warmly, and urged, with all the volubility elderly ladies can so well exercise, whenever the marriage of a younger friend is in question, all the benefit that would accrue to her from so advantageous a proposal. Miss Evelyn was really taken quite by surprise, and stammered out some vague expressions of wishing for time to consider. Stuff and nonsense, my dear, remember your dependent position, and the advantages this match holds out to you. You must not think or talk of delay. He will be here tomorrow, and I hope his lover eloquence will soon decide the question in his favor. Poor Miss Evelyn burst into tears and said it was so sudden, and she was so ill prepared to take any decision. She would, however, think over it very seriously and in the morning be better able to give an answer. My mother seeing that she was much agitated by what she had told her, very kindly said, Give the children a holiday this afternoon, and I advise you to keep your own room, and write to your widowed mother, to tell her of the offer, and to ask her advice how you should act. We thus had many hours to ourselves, I had heard all that had passed, and felt a sad pressure at my heart, when I began to realize the fact that the proposal of Mr. Vincent would, if accepted, lead to our separation, and deprive me of my loved Miss Evelyn. The idea made me very sad, and I showed no alacrity in taking advantage of our extra hours of recreation with my sisters, until Mary began to rally me about my melancholy, and asked what I meant by it. I at once said, Don't you see, if Miss Evelyn marries Mr. Vincent we shall get another governess, and can we ever expect to get one who is so kind and excellent a teacher, and who troubles us so little at our games? Ah, that is very true, and we should be horribly annoyed if we were watched and interrupted. However, more reason that we should make the most of the present moment, so come along, Charlie, and let us have some real good fucking. We have plenty of time, Mama is not very well. No one will come near us, and there is nothing to hinder our having a jolly time of it, all three stark naked together, so come along. Her words had already changed the current of my ideas, before she ceased speaking my prick responded, which her quick eye immediately observed, and patting it with her hand, she said, Ah, my dear little dummy, I am glad to see you are of my opinion, so come along. Away we went. And a most glorious afternoon of orgies we spent. Miss Evelyn came to me at night and threw herself into my arms, in an agony of sobs and tears, and pressing me to her throbbing bosom, she sobbed out. Oh, my dear Charlie, I love you so dearly you have become as necessary to me as life itself. I cannot bear the thought of parting from you, my loved one. You, whom I have initiated into all the delights of mutual love. Oh! The thought of parting is bitter, and breaks my heart. Oh! Love me, my own darling boy, and press me to your heart. I did more, for, as I have before stated, a woman's tears have a never-failing effect on the erective nerves of my machine. It was but the commencement of a night of most luxurious enjoyment. Miss Evelyn put no restraint either on herself or me, but indulged in every act of lubricity and voluptuousness were drawing to a close. In fact, when eventually she left me in the morning, and I thought over all she had said, it became evident to me that she had already made up her mind to accept the very advantageous offer made to her. The instinctive intelligence of woman had at once shown to her that such an opportunity was not to be lost for the sake of a mere boy, whom circumstances must naturally soon remove far away from her. At the same time, doubtless, the idea that I was all her own making, for she never had any suspicion of my previous initiation, held a charm over her, to say nothing of the powerful weapon she had so unexpectedly found by her side, and which had so great an influence over her passions. We spent a most luxurious night, 
and hardly closed our eyes, notwithstanding my afternoon's debauch, such is the power and resources of nature, in a well-constituted youth of fifteen and upwards, that Miss Evelyn had rather to force our embraces, than to stimulate by any artificial excitement my ever-ready prick. I won from her a promise to come next night, and let me know what fate was in store for us. Next day Mr. Vincent was true to his appointment. Mama received him with Miss Evelyn by her side, and after the usual compliments, rose and apologized for leaving them, as she had household duties to attend to. Miss Evelyn informed me afterwards that Mr. Vincent, on my mother leaving the room, rose from his seat, and approaching her, said, in the most frank gentlemanly manner, You are aware, my dear Miss Evelyn, of the object of my visit, and I augur from your kind condescension in giving me this interview that my suit is not disagreeable to you. Then taking her passive hand, and pressing it to his heart, he continued, I have loved you, Miss Evelyn, from the first moment of my seeing you. I feel that my future happiness hangs on your lips, for without your love, my life would now be a blank. I am here today to offer you my hand and fortune. If I have not yet your heart, I seek to be allowed to cultivate your society, that I may try to win it. Then seeing that she was greatly agitated, he begged her to be seated, for she had risen when he approached and took her hand, he led her to a sofa, and seated himself by her side. He pressed for an answer. She said, You must be fully aware, Mr. Vincent, that your generous offer has taken me greatly by surprise. I feel most grateful to you for it, but must implore you to allow me to pause, until at least I have heard from my mother, to whom I will communicate the noble offer you have made to me, a poor governess, who cannot but feel grateful to you for condescending to think of her in such a way. Ah, say not so, my dear Miss Evelyn, and believe me, it is no sudden impulse that has driven me to your feet, but ardent love, and real admiration of your great beauty and admirable conduct ever since you entered this family. The dear creature smiled through her tears upon me when she recounted those terms of affection that Mr. Vincent poured out to her. To be brief before they parted he won from her that his frequent meetings at church, and elsewhere, had gained him something more than esteem, but hopeless of ever becoming his wife, she had done her utmost to suppress warmer feelings. Oh! Woman, thy name is deception. So she sent him away the happiest man in existence. He rode over every day afterwards, and was with Miss Evelyn from four to five, indeed, he was often the cause of our having half an hour's longer recreation. He also frequently dined with us. Miss Evelyn's mother naturally jumped at the offer, and most delightedly gave her consent. When Mr. Vincent heard of this, he became very urgent in claiming an early day for making him the happiest of men. Miss Evelyn wanted a delay of six weeks, but this raised such an outcry on his part, seconded by my mother that at last she was driven from six weeks to a month, and then to a fortnight from that date, so all became extremely busy in getting ready marriage dresses, and see. The marriage was to take place from our house, and my mother insisted that she should provide the marriage breakfast. Mrs. Evelyn was invited to our house for a week at the time of the marriage, to keep my mother company. My two sisters and a young sister of Mr. Vincent's were to be the bridesmaids, and a young man, courting Miss Vincent, to be bridegroom's man. So all was thus arranged, and eventually came off most happily. When Mrs. Evelyn arrived she occupied the spare room, where charming Mrs. Benson had so deliciously initiated me in all the pleasures of sensuality and passion. To return to the day when Mr. Vincent had his first interview, and declared his love and admiration, and ended with the offer of marriage. Before going away, he rang for Mama, thanked her for all her kindness to him, informed her how happy Miss Evelyn had made him in granting permission to prosecute his suit for her hand, and see. Then begging the favor of a chaste kiss, he left all radiant with hope. 
The interview had naturally been very trying for Miss Evelyn, and she was so evidently nervously agitated that my mother begged her to go to her room, and lie down to repose herself, as after so much agitation she must be quite unfit for any school work, and that she herself would hear our lessons that morning and give us an afternoon's holiday in honor of the happy event that had occurred. We thus, my sisters and I, were thrown again into another prolonged opportunity of fully enjoying ourselves, but, notwithstanding the wonderfully regenerative power that nature had gifted me with, I felt that if I wanted to enjoy again my dear Miss Evelyn, who had promised to be with me that night, I must not only restrain myself from such excess as we had indulged in the previous day, but also manage to get some sleep, of which I had scarcely tasted the night before, so I contented myself with first gamma hutching and then fucking each sister, afterwards again gamma hutching them, and making them each spend five times, so as to satisfy them without exhausting myself, and then finishing off with a delicious fuck in Lizzie's bottom hole, while each gamma hutched the other. This quite satisfied them, and they allowed me to steal up to my room to sleep, Mary promising to call me in time for tea. I slept the sleep of the just for some three hours, and came to tea perfectly ready for anything that could happen that night. It was well it was so, for now that there could not be any long lapse of time before we must part, Miss Evelyn became a very glutton for pleasure, and every art and position was made use of to stimulate and lengthen out our joys. She came every night, even up to the very night before the marriage, although in the last three nights before the event came off, her mother, Mrs. Evelyn, slept in the spare bedroom with which my room communicated. Nevertheless, we met and carried on our amorous sports with bated breath and suppressed sighs. We had of late often tried in our moments of greatest excitement to introduce my prick into her delicious tight little bottom hole. Once, by a sudden maneuver, I managed to get in at the moment she was spending, and actually made an entrance as far as about two inches beyond the nut, and I think I should have fully succeeded at that time if my own excitement had not made me spend too soon. This oiled the way, and my prick, having already fucked several times, becoming too limp, the squeeze of her bottom actually forced him out, as if she were voiding herself naturally. I fancied that, at the moment, but for my too excited passion, she would have rather I had completely initiated her. However, the night preceding her marriage, I at last succeeded. We had fucked in every varied way. She was on her knees, with her head on the pillow, and I on my knees, behind her, this was a favorite way of hers, as she declared I got further in, nay, seemed to touch her heart and fill her whole body, besides the fricking her clitoris and the action of my finger in her bottom hole added greatly to the raptures this position gave her. She had been already well fucked, and we had mutually gamma hutched each other, so her whole system was in a most excited and well moistened state. Taking care to put two fingers at once into her bottom hole, I worked them so as to stretch it as much as possible, while exciting her with my prick in her cunt, and a finger on her clitoris. Just as she was going into the raptures of spending I dropped from my mouth a quantity of saliva onto her bottom hole, and as she was pushing her buttocks back to me I suddenly withdrew my prick, and with one vigorous thrust housed him half his length in her delicious bum hole. She almost cried out aloud at the suddenness of the attack, and would have flinched away but for the grasp of both my hands upon her hips, a more vigorous shove sent me up to the hilt against her beautiful buttocks. She whispered. For heaven's sake, dear Charles, do stop a moment, I can't bear it, and must cry out if you do not be quiet for a time at least. As I was safely fixed, it exactly suited me to remain. Still, for had I gone on, a push or two would have made me spend. Now fairly engulfed, I wished not only to fully enjoy it myself but, if possible, make her enjoy it too. So remaining quite still, as far as regarded my prick, I stole one hand down to her clitoris, and began to excite that, the other I ran up to her bubbies, and played with the nipples, 
a thing which I had found out excited her almost as much as playing with her clitoris. Her passions were soon reawakened, and the involuntary twistings of her loins and pressures of her sphincter convinced me that in a very short time I should work her up to the utmost, and so it was, and immensely she enjoyed both her own spent and mine when she felt my hot spunk shooting up into her very entrails. We sunk gently on our sides after this bout, but without unsheathing me, and here embracing, kissing, and tonguing each other when she turned her head, and sometimes sucking the nearest nipple to me, we soon once more were in a state to renew our delicious combat, and a second course was run in the delightful Calopian recesses of Venus's second temple of lubricity. This was our last bout, for, alas, it was getting the hour when the house would be all astir. My lovely mistress embraced me most tenderly, and acknowledged that I had at last taught her a new pleasure. She wept as she tore herself from my arms, and I wept too when she left me, as I thought I had now lost her forever as a mistress, and what a charming one she had been to me. Morning came, and with it bridesmaids, bridegroom, and man. To church we all went my sisters perfectly enchanted with the idea of being bridesmaids, and beautifully arrayed in new dresses. They were also still more delighted with some handsome jewelry presented by Mr. Vincent. In their eyes he became the handsomest and finest man they had ever seen. The breakfast went off as usual, and when the bride, who had changed her bridal dress for a neat traveling one, came down, pretty near all were in tears on taking leave of her. She pressed me tenderly to her bosom, and whispered, Courage, Charlie, dear. It was almost too much for me, but I managed to restrain any extreme demonstration of my grief. The carriage door was shut, and off they rattled to spend the honeymoon at Leamington. The friends assembled remained until the evening, and after the sensations of the day, and the fatigues of the previous night, I was glad to get to bed. I cried myself to sleep, thinking that another at that moment was reveling in all the delights of amorous enjoyment of those charms that had been so long in my sole possession. Thus ended one of the most delightful episodes of my life, and although I, at some rare intervals, from time to time found an opportunity of enjoying my loved mistress, they were flying fucks, very delicious, but very unsatisfactory. This was the first great incident that had an effect of changing the tenure of our existence for some time, but I will reserve the details of our after-adventures for a second part of these reminiscences of early experiences. End of Vol. 1 Volume 2 Contents Mr. James McCallum, Mrs. Vincent, Miss Franklin, Miss F., Mary, and Eliza Doctor and Mrs. Brownlow the house was scarcely itself even the day after the marriage. Mrs. Evelyn was still with us, and did not leave until the following day. She and my mother spent most of the day in the summer house, so that our pastimes therein were interrupted. Mary complained of severe headache, which, in fact, was the premonitory symptom of her courses, which declared themselves violently in the evening. I had arranged with my sisters to steal up to their room when all were asleep, as now that we had lost our governess they had it all to themselves. I went, of course, but found only Eliza capable of entering into our sensual enjoyments. I made her come to me in Miss Evelyn's bed, and while fucking her, was thinking all the time of my darling governess, and even when I was fucking her I could only remember the complete insertion of my prick into Miss Evelyn's bumhole the very night before her marriage, and wondered whether or not her husband had discovered her loss of maidenhead. And yet, I fancied woman's natural cunning would easily deceive him, as millions before him have been deceived. Coupling Mary's attack and Miss Evelyn's choice of the marriage day on the full moon, I could not help imagining that she intended to help her deception by the advent of her menstruation. It will be seen hereafter how far I was correct in my conjecture. I passed a delicious night in the arms of my charming Lizzie, and only stole away just in time not to be observed by the early rising servants. Mrs. Evelyn departed the next day. My mother, 
feeling poorly, desired Lizzie to sleep with her, so perforce I had to pass a very quiet night, but which the agitation and excessive venery of the last week rendered very acceptable. Another week passed without anything particular beyond Mary being able to join Lizzie and me in our orgies. The doctor had recommended my mother to go for a few weeks to the seaside, and she resolved that we should all go for six weeks before engaging a new governess. So we left town for a charming little retired village on the West Welsh coast. It was but a small place, with one street, and some straggling houses here and there, but with a beautiful stretch of sand ending in abrupt rocks. Our lodgings were but small, a sitting room and bedroom above a shop, and two rooms over that. I slept in the small back room off the sitting room, my mother had the front upper room, and my two sisters were in the room beside her, with only a thin partition between them, so we found ourselves obliged to seek for some outside place to enjoy the erotic pleasures that had now become necessary to us. Very few visitors ever came near the retired little village. In our explorations we found that at the far end of the sands there were some nice retired spots behind the rocks, which soon became the scenes of our sensual enjoyments. The place was more than a mile from the village, and we could see if anyone was coming towards us for the whole distance, but still as we might forget how fast time flies, we prudently established either one or the other of my sisters as a sentinel to give us warning if anyone was approaching. So I took them in turn, laid them down, had a mutual gamma hutch, and then a fuck, after which the previous watcher took the place of the one just fucked, and the same process was followed in her case. We had done this for three days, and were congratulating ourselves upon having found out so safe a place to indulge all our propensities in. We always spent the mornings with Mama, who kept us so far to our lessons, but after our midday meal, which Mama also made her dinner hour, she retired for a siesta, and we went out for a long walk and something better. I have said we fully enjoyed the first three days without any apparent chance of discovery. On the fourth, while Lizzie was on the watch in front, and Mary and I after a delicious gamma hutch had just died away in all the ecstasies of a prolonged fuck up to the moment of discharge, and I was saying to her, did not that feel delicious, and was it not up to the hilt? I should think so, with such a rammer as that up her cunt, said a strange voice close to us. You may easily suppose how we startled with surprise. Oh, don't do that, I did not mean to spoil sport, said the same voice. It was a very gentlemanly man, with a soft quiet voice, and charming amiable expression of countenance who stood smiling upon us close to our side, with his breeches open, and his standing pigo in his hand. So great was our surprise that we never thought of the state we were in. Mary lay with legs spread out, and belly exposed, and cunt gaping open, and I with my breeches down, and my great big cock pendant, it is true, but hardly diminished in thickness. The stranger said again, I am not here to spoil sport, on the contrary, to aid you in every way. I accidentally observed you two days ago. I am here, a stranger, like yourselves. I know you to be brother and sisters, and admire you all the more for being above the usual prejudices of that relationship. But you must be aware that as I know all about you, the best way is to let me be a participator in your sport and then you not only shut my mouth, but it will be the means of vastly adding to all your pleasures, as well as giving me the most intense satisfaction. Now, for instance, your elder sister there, who was about to replace the younger on the watch, will be all the more satisfied, if I first fuck her. Don't be alarmed, my dear, said he, as he observed a sudden move of Mary, who all at once recollected how exposed her whole person was. I shall do nothing without your full consent, but I am quite sure your brother, who takes you each in turn, will rather be pleased than otherwise, to see you in my arms, or I much mistake his character. I could not help, internally, 
thinking how exactly he had hit off my very thought, for I had just been calculating, in my own mind, how much better it would be for us to make him a participator with us, rather than an enemy by a refusal. So I at once averred that as it had turned out, it was likely to add greatly to all our pleasure, and I begged Mary to let him have his way. The natural reluctance of woman to appear too easy of access made her simulate a refusal, but as she still lay on her back, I leant over her, and opening her legs, begged him to kneel between and help himself. He gallantly, on kneeling, first stooped forward, and gave a good lick up of all her cunt's spunk-covered lips, and then proceeded to gama hutch her, which quickly made her as anxious for his prick as he was to fuck her. As soon as they were fairly at it, I whistled, and beckoned to Lizzie to come up. You may easily imagine her surprise to see Mary in the arms of a strange man, but as the sight had had its usual effect on my sensitive organ, and as it was standing, almost ready to burst, I made her kneel opposite to them, and introduced my prick into her cunt from behind, so that we could both see the delicious fuck going on before us. It redoubled our excitement, and all four of us spent together in cries of rapture. After this bout we sat down to make further acquaintance, which, you may suppose, was not difficult, after such an introduction. Our new friend gave us some hints very useful for future proceedings, meanwhile he was feeling young Lizzie's cunt with one hand, and my prick with the other, very nicely and gently frigging it. He brought me to full stand very quickly, and then made me lie on my back, while he proceeded to admire and praise the extraordinary development which he declared was the greatest for one of my age he had ever met with, and his experience was very extensive. When it was at full stand, he stooped forward, and in the most delicious manner sucked my prick. It was more exciting than when either of my sisters, Miss Evelyn or Mrs. Benson had gama hutched me. He also inserted a finger in my bottom hole, and eventually made me spend in his mouth, which he greedily swallowed, nor did he cease sucking until every drop was drawn out of me. This had, of course, excited him, and he said. Now, I must have the young one in her turn. Lizzie, nothing loath, lay down on the grass at once, I conducted his prick into her cunt, and frigged his bottom hole, while their bout lasted. His prick was one of the middlings, not very long, nor very thick, but of a uniform size throughout, without any large projection of the nut, like mine. He advised us to stop for that day, and to walk towards the village with him, and then when in full sight, but far beyond hearing, we could sit down and concert measures for future pleasures of the most delicious lubricity. I see, he said, that we shall just hit it. I shall greatly add to your pleasures, and you to mine, you have something yet to learn, and I am the very person to instruct you in even higher delights than any of you have yet enjoyed. We followed him as desired, and, seated on a sand hillock, we held a long conversation, and arranged everything for future indulgencies. We agreed to meet at the rocks next day at our usual hour, he undertaking to be there ahead of us, to see that no lurking stranger should have hidden himself as he had done that day. He would think over the matter in the meantime, and contrive some way of meeting where we could be fully at ease, and strip ourselves naked, so as to enjoy a complete orgy of the most salacious lubricity. He showed us where he was lodged, a small and a little way out of the village with its front to the road, and behind the stables there was attached to it a small cottage, consisting of a bedroom above, with a dressing room, or small bedroom if necessary, over the passage, the door opened upon the coast, and there was no other communication with the inn than by going round past the stable yard to the front door. They Servant of the inn came round in the morning, and laid his modest breakfast of tea, eggs and toast, and when he was done, cleared away and made his bed, and see. He took his dinner in the inn parlor at the hour the landlord and family dined. Nothing overlooked his windows, and he was sufficiently away from the village not to be easily observed, still less so from the inn, 
so that on approaching his lodgings from the sands he was almost as safe from observation as if he had lived in a lonely house far distant from any other. I am thus particular in describing his lodgings, as the advantages of the situation afterwards induced us to turn them to a profitable use. Our friend's name was McCallum, James McCallum, an offshoot of the great Scotch clan of that name, then in about his thirtieth year, fond of sporting, particularly fishing. His room was surrounded with the necessary implements, and he much frequented Wales from its advantage of possessing so many good trout streams. He it was who gave me a taste for the piscatory art, and I afterwards accompanied him on many a fishing excursion, which often led to new and singular erotic adventures, of which I may, perhaps, hereafter recount a few. His ordinary residence was London, and our present acquaintance led to some most intimate relations of true erotic extravagance, of which more anon. Meanwhile we met at the rocks on the next day, a Saturday. We found Mr. McCallum at his post, and all being secure, proceeded to action. It was Mary's turn to take the first watch. Our friend constituted himself master of the ceremonies. He desired me to take off my breeches, and Lizzie to take off her gown and ease her corset, for as yet she wore no stays, then telling me to lie down on my back, he made Lizzie kneel at my head, with her bottom to me, and then to press back so as to bring her charming little cunt over my mouth, her under petticoat and chemise being well canted over her shoulders. I thus had complete command of her clitoris with my tongue, and she could sink her buttocks quite down on my face, so that I could shove my tongue well up her cunt, and lick up all her spendings when she discharged, and at the same time, while embracing the charming plump hard buttocks with one hand, the other was left free to frig her bum hole, and stimulate her passions up to the utmost. I have already told you how naturally she had taken to posterior pleasures. While thus engaged, Mr. McCallum proceeded to gama hutch my prick in the most delicious manner, for he had an art in this delightful accomplishment that far exceeded that of the many by whom I have been gama hutched of course, he added the postillion, as the French say, by fricking my bottom hole at the same time. He made me most voluptuously discharge in his mouth at the very instant dear Lizzie was pouring into mine her delicious spendings. We lay enraptured for some time before we could stir. Then rising, I wished to return the compliment Mr. M had paid my prick, by sucking his. But this he declined, saying, I shall teach you all a new pleasure before we part, and my powers are not quite so active as your youth enables you to be, so for the moment we will indulge in close observation and sweet caresses of our members until by gentle titillations I get you two more prepared for the amorous contest. He gama hutched Lizzie while handling my prick, and a very short period elapsed before he had us both in such a state of excitement that we were ready for anything he chose to direct. This time he also required me to lie down on my back, but he placed Lizzie on the top of me, and guided my prick himself into her delicious tight little notch. When fully inserted, which was completely accomplished before she quite lay down upon me, he desired us to go slowly to work. For a short time, with his face close to my cots, he watched the in and out movement of my prick, inserting a finger into both Lizzie's bottom and mine. Then rising, he said, Stop a little, my dears, but don't withdraw. I am about to give your sister a lesson in the double action of most delicious pleasure. Then spitting on his prick, and applying a quantity of saliva to the rosy orifice of her bottom, he proceeded to insert his prick little thinking how fond she was of taking pleasure in this route, and how often she had already enjoyed it. He took every precaution not to hurt her, and to be as gentle as possible, telling her to push out her bottom, and to strain as if she wanted to void something, which he told her would facilitate his entrance, and give her less pain. You may imagine how secretly pleased Lizzie was, she did all he desired and with great gentleness he succeeded in sheathing his prick up to the close junction of his belly against her buttocks. Capital, my dear you have borne it admirably. 
I see you will make an app scholar, now you will have nothing but the most ecstatic raptures from the action of two pricks at once. Now, Charles, it is for you to work, and for your most charming sister to continue only the exquisite pressures she is already at this moment so rapturously conferring on our excited members. We thus commenced the first lesson we ever had in the double fuck. Dear Lizzie was almost mad with the agonizing sensations of rapturous pleasure the double thrusting produced upon her erotic nerves. I, too, felt the rubbing of Mr. M.S. Prick so closely upon mine, for the slight membrane dividing the bottom passage from the vagina, by the powerful stretching of the two members between which it was sandwiched, became so thin a division that it really appeared as if there was nothing between our pricks. Such ecstatic excitement brought matters to a speedy conclusion. Lizzie screamed so loudly with her excess of pleasure that it somewhat alarmed Mary, who came running up to see what was the matter. Her surprise was great at the sight she beheld, but we were far too deliriously wrapped in the lap of most salacious luxury and lubricity to be sensible to any interruption. As for Lizzie she was in convulsions of ecstasy, which ended in quite a hysteric attack which rather alarmed us, and made us withdraw from the exquisite sheaths in which we had been engulfed with such rapture. It was some time before dear Lizzie recovered her senses, and then she burst into tears, declaring she had never before known what pleasure meant, and she had been in the seventh heaven of delight, that she could wish for no better death than to die in such agony of pleasure. She then threw herself into Mr. M.S. arms, and kissing him with the utmost fervor, said, Oh, you dear man, how I love you for teaching me such a delicious way of loving, you shall have me whenever and wherever you please. I shall love you as much as I do my darling brother Charlie. She then turned to me and warmly embraced me too. Then, putting on her gown, she proceeded to take up the watch, while Mary remained to be likewise initiated in the luxury of the double fuck. She somewhat dreaded the experiment, but having witnessed the ecstasies of pleasure it had thrown Lizzie into, she was not unwilling to try if it could be accomplished with Mr. McCallum's somewhat less massive member. He put us through the same preliminary maneuvers of backing Mary on her knees over my mouth, and while he sucked my prick, he feasted his eyes at the same time on Mary's really finely developed buttocks, giving him promise of great after pleasure. He even begged me to leave her bottom hole to his fingers so that he frigged the bum hole of the sister while he sucked the prick of the brother, a combination which afforded him the most racy delight, Mary was greatly excited, and spent most copiously in my mouth, while I quickly followed suit in the mouth of Mr. M, who did not allow a drop to be wasted. When we had reposed ourselves sufficiently, his lascivious touches and caresses and praises of our parts soon sufficiently re-excited us to let him see if we might again proceed to action. As before, I lay down on my back, and Mary, straddling across me, had my prick guided into her longing cunt by the hand of Mr. M. When I was fairly engulfed in her hot and throbbing cunt, she began her exquisite casanoisette pressures, which talent she possessed in the greatest perfection, then bending down to me I clasped her in my arms, and glued my lips to hers in a loving kiss and tongue embrace. Her bottom presented itself in all its beauty to our worthy master of the ceremonies, who, delighted with its more fully blown beauties than that of the younger sister, paid first due homage to it by fondly kissing it, and thrusting his tongue up the rosy orifice, titillating her excessively, then wetting his prick he applied it to the tender rosebud-like dimple at first without success, Mary telling him she did not think he could possibly succeed. Patience and perseverance, my dear girl, said he, will enable me to get into a mouse, we must try another way, it is that great huge monster of a prick in your cunt that is so blocking up the root as to close almost entirely the way to the more secret temple of salacious delights. Withdraw for a moment. I did so, upon which he plunged in an instant up to the hilt in her cunt and gave a few shoves to excite her and throw her off her guard, for he told us afterwards, the first difficulty was all owing to Mary's involuntary opposition, by squeezing in her bottom hole, 
instead of pushing it out. When he thought he had sufficiently excited her, and made her suppose he was going to continue regularly fucking her, he suddenly withdrew the two fingers he had in her bum hole, by a jerk substituted his prick, and before Mary was aware, had sheathed it more than halfway into her bottom. She gave a half scream, but his hold of her hips, and my close embrace of her waist, for I all along knew what he was it, prevented her from flinching and throwing him out, which was her first impulse. He said. I will keep still. And any unpleasant feeling will go off in a moment. He stopped for two or three minutes, which I occupied in first rubbing the end of my prick on Mary's clitoris, which was a well-developed one, and when by her nervous movements I found her passions were being roused, I slipped it into her tightened cunt without much difficulty. Mr. M took the opportunity of finding me penetrating to glide in on his point of attack up to his utmost limit. Mary gasped again, and declared it was choking her. However, by a little more patience, and then by very gentle movements, we gradually worked her up to the utmost state of excitement, and she, as well as both of us, went off in a delirium of enraptured felicity. She lay panting and throbbing between us for nearly a quarter of an hour. I was already in a state for renewed efforts, but Mr. M rose, and withdrew his reeking prick from the tight recess in which it had enjoyed such ecstasies, and told us we must be content with that day's work, expressly as he had a plan in his head for the next day, that would require us to have all our erotic powers at command. Then, as before, we approached the village, so as to be seen, but not overheard, so that our going away to more distant places should create no suspicion. Mr. M then informed us that we could come to his cottage the next afternoon, instead of the rocks, we should be able to undress ourselves in the buff, and have a perfect orgy of salacious delights. We heartily approved of this plan, and after an amusing conversation, we parted to meet the next day on the sands, but in the contrary directions to the rocks, for the purpose of afterwards approaching his cottage from the least observable site. After dinner the next day we started at our usual hour apparently for our ordinary promenade, but after leaving the village, and allowing most of the people to be safely stowed away in church for the afternoon service, we turned on our steps and made for Mr. M.S. door. He saw us coming, and was ready to admit us, without knocking. We immediately adjourned to the bedroom upstairs, and lost no time in all of us stripping stark naked. After some preliminary admiration of the two girls, whose forms were certainly cast in beauty's mold, we lay down in bed. I and Lizzie mutually gamma-hutched each other, with the usual accompaniments in the charming orifices of our bottoms. Mr. McCallum and Mary, for he had taken a great fancy to her and her splendid bottom, followed our example, after we had a happy and most delicious spend, and then mutual embraces and kisses, we put the girls into all conceivable poses, until we were once more ready to go on with something more serious than gamma hutching. Mr. M, as usual, acted as master of the ceremonies, and ordered Mary to lie down on her back, then Lizzie reversed upon her, so that she could gamma hutch Mary's cunt, and tickle her bum hole, while Mary was to frig Lizzie's clitoris with one hand, and play with my cods with the other, Mr. M himself guided my prick into the delicious bottom hole of Lizzie, and when we were all fixed, and he had frigged my bum hole with two fingers, he said. Now I am going to initiate you, Charlie, into the delight of being a like operator and receiver. So saying, he moistened his tool and spit in my bum hole, and proceeded very gently to introduce his prick therein. I have described his cock as not very thick at the point, consequently the first part introduced itself very easily, but when the pillar pushed its way in, and began to stretch the parts, it produced a curious sickening feeling, very like as if I had received a kick on the bottom, so I was obliged to ask him to halt a little. He was too experienced in the art not to fully understand my feelings, and knew well it would go off in a minute or two, if I was left quiet. 
So pausing until I told him he might now try to get in further, he drew back a little and applying more spittle to the shaft, gently and firmly, and slowly guided his prick up to the hilt, or as far as his belly and my buttocks would allow. Again pausing a little, until feeling by the throbbing of my prick, which produced the same pressure on my bum hole, that I was warming to the work, he began slow movements of thrusts in and out, which, together with the hot and voluptuous pressures and movements of my own little partner excited both by Mary's finger and my prick, began to fire my passions, and we soon grew very fierce in our movements. Nothing I could ever have imagined equaled the extraordinary and delicious ecstasy that the double action produced upon my erotic nerves. I gasped, I shuddered with the agony of intense pleasure, and at the moment when the grand and rapturous finale approached, I actually brayed exactly like a donkey, which, in after cooler moments, amused all of us. The action of pleasure had come upon all at once, and we sank in an inert mass on those below us. How poor Mary endured it astonished us, but the scene had so excited her that she said it never occurred to her, and she felt nothing. We eventually rose, and after a necessary purification, partook of wine and cake, which Mr. McCallum, with great foresight, had provided. After that he would not allow us to fuck for some time, and we had a regular romp all about the room, which we enjoyed very much and nothing was heard but slaps on our bottoms, and the wildest rollicking laughter until our two cocks, by their stiff standing, showed that we were again ready to enter on new combats. This time Lizzie lay down, Mary Gama hutched her. Mr. M got into her bum hole, and I proceeded to attempt to do the same to him, but all to no purpose. I was too heavy hung for his bottom hole, a very small one for a man. He had every wish to accommodate me, but do what I would, I could not overcome the physical difficulties. So reversing our positions, I lay on my back, Mary straddled over me, my prick was put into her cunt, and stooping down, and presenting her anus, M succeeded more easily than the day before in getting into her bum hole. Lizzie standing up with a leg on each side of Mary's and my body, brought her quim up to M's mouth and he luxuriously gamma hutched her, while his finger acted postillion in her bottom. The erotic storm raged with great fury for a long time, and then, growing more fast and furious, brought us all standing in ecstasies of the most salacious enjoyment, for us to sink once more into the annihilation of satiated desire. We lay long wrapped in close embrace. Recovering our senses in long drawn sighs, we again refreshed ourselves with wine and cake, and as our passions were not so quickly reawakened as those of our more excitable companions, we proceeded to gamma hutch them, without their exercising a like skill upon our pricks. We then had another romp, and replacing Mary below and Lizzie above, I, this time, fucked her cunt, at her request, as she said it must not be altogether neglected. M, as previously, took me behind, and as there was a greater facility, so there was greater enjoyment, and as our previous exertions had taken off the sharper appetite, we were enabled to draw out our pleasure to a much greater length, until at last we died away in all the agony of such a glorious conjunction of parts. We had one more delicious general fuck before we parted. Lizzie was again fucked by me, and buggered by Mr. M which she declared she preferred to any other combination, my prick so deliriously gorging her tight little cunt, and making M.S. prick, from the pressure of my larger weapon in the cunt, feel as tight in her bottom as my prick did, when nothing but Mary's finger was in her cunt. We ran our course with even greater luxury and lasciviousness than before. Lizzie actually was hysterical with the force of her enjoyment, and we all sank sideways off poor Mary, and lay long locked in each other's arms. This, for that day, ended our most delightful orgy. We purified ourselves, and then dressed. We parted with many sweet embraces, and promises of renewing the delightful scenes we had just gone through, and, in fact, we often and often repeated them, 
varying from time to time with a visit to the rocks, lest we should draw observation upon us by constantly going to the cottage. Our six weeks came to an end so rapidly that we could hardly believe the time had already passed. Mama one morning informed us we were to leave on the day after the next. You may suppose our disappointment, but there was no help for it. We met that day at the rocks, we were melancholy at the thought of parting with our charming friend, whom we now really loved. We were not near so fiery as usual, but resolved to have one thorough good orgy the next day at the cottage, as a farewell benefit to us all. We met, as agreed on, and put in force every art to augment our pleasures, and every contrivance to excite anew our powers to the utmost. Both M and I must have spent six to seven times, but the girls being more easily excited in their finer organs of coition, went off in ecstasies some nine or ten times, until fairly exhausted, we had, from want of power, to give up the game, dress, and part. We hoped to meet again. The girls wept at parting with our delightful friend, to whom we owed so many delicious orgies. We exchanged addresses, and he promised to come on a fishing excursion to our neighborhood, where he hoped we should find means of renewing the lascivious sports we had already so much enjoyed. We tore ourselves away from him at last. It will be seen in the sequel, that unforeseen events carried me to London, or rather away from home, before we could meet again, and it was in London, at his own chambers, where we again renewed our charming intercourse, and practiced every art of venery. We returned home, and Mama again advertised for a governess, and stated that she required one of not less than thirty years of age, and with much experience in teaching. Numerous responses were made to the advertisement, but one lady desired to see Mama and her pupils before accepting the place, at the same time forwarding very satisfactory testimonials. Mama was rather struck with the style of letter, and the unusual demand of previous acquaintance before entering into final arrangements. So she wrote to Miss Franklin, begging her to come and spend three days with us, and if her visit should prove as agreeable to both as her letter had done to Mama, she had no doubt matters might be arranged to their mutual satisfaction. Accordingly, at the expected hour, Miss Franklin arrived. She was, to our then thinking, an elderly lady, rather above thirty years of age than under, of tall and commanding figure, somewhat large, but no superfluous fat, broad-shouldered, and white-hipped, with bosoms well separated, but not too prominent. Her hair was coal black, and her eyes equally so, but with the most determined expression, rendered more so by very thick eyebrows, which met in the middle. She showed also a well-marked downy mustache, and the small curly hairs below her head, at the back of her neck, literally lost themselves beneath her high-necked dress. She always wore long sleeves, and never showed bare arms. I afterwards found the reason of this was that her arms were so black with thick hair that she was ashamed to let them be seen, although, in reality, beautifully formed and plump. Her mouth was large, it showed animal passion, but at the same time determined firmness of character. You could not call her handsome, but there was altogether an appearance of face, expression, and person that might well be styled a fine woman. As for us, at the period of first seeing her, we only marked the determined character of her countenance, and at once dreaded her becoming our governess, as we felt we should not only have one who would master us, but who would also be severe in every way. Youth is often a better physiognomist than it is credited with. It will be seen in the sequel whether we had judged correctly or not. Suffice it to say that her three days visit ended in her being perfectly satisfied with the offered position, and Mama being equally satisfied with her. We did not know at the time, but afterwards found out, that she had made it a sign qua non that she should have carte blanche as to the use of the rod. She had observed to Mama that she thought we had been too leniently treated by our late governess, and it would be necessary to exert severe discipline, which, in her own experience, 
she had always found most efficacious. My mother, who had during the last two months found us rather headstrong and willful, quite chimed in with her idea, and gave every authority to do quite as she liked, either with her girls or her son. Terms being so arranged, Miss Franklin required a week to make all her arrangements before definitely taking up her new residence. My mother, thinking we should be well kept in on the arrival of Miss Franklin, left us in uninterrupted liberty until then, you may be sure we improved the occasion, and did our best to make up for the loss of our inestimable and amiable friend, Mr. McCallum. Not only did we make use of the summer house by day, but every night I stole up to my loved sister's room, where we tried to emulate the luxurious scenes of lubricity we had lately been so deliriously indulging in at the seaside in Wales. Of course, the week passed far too quickly, and on the appointed day my mother drove into the town to bring Miss Franklin home, on the arrival of the coach. My two sisters accompanied her, as something or other was always wanted for the girls, and as Miss Franklin and her luggage would quite fill the carriage on their return, I was left by myself at home, a most fortunate circumstance, as it turned out. I was somewhat annoyed at being left alone. But how true it is that man proposes and God disposes. Had I gone with them I should have missed a most delicious and unexpected treat. I had strolled to the summer house in a sort of despair at the lost opportunity of again fucking my sisters before the arrival of the dreaded governess. I was listlessly gazing out of the window when I suddenly became aware of a lady waving her hand to me from a gig coming down the road which our summer house commanded. In an instant I recognized Mrs. Vincent. To run down the hillock, unbolt the private door, and welcome her to our house, was the work of a moment. I begged her to get out and walk to the house through the grounds, her servant could drive round to the stables and wait there. She did so at once. I never said a word of all being absent until I had her safe in the summer house. Without a word I seized her round the waist, and pressing her back on the couch, quickly unbuttoned my trousers, and pulling up her petticoats, was pushing my stiff prick against her belly before she was almost aware of my intentions. My dear Charlie, she cried, what are you it? We shall be discovered, and it will be my ruin. Oh, no, my ever loved Mrs. Vincent, they are all away to town, and we have nothing to fear. She loved me too well to make further resistance, on the contrary, seconding me with all her accustomed art, we both quickly sunk in all the voluptuous raptures of satisfied desire. I would not quit my position, but kissing her rapturously, I shoved my tongue into her mouth, and stopped her remonstrances. The excitement of meeting her after a two month separation stimulated my passions to the utmost, and with hardly bated breath I began a fresh career, but with more moderation and greater pains to make her a perfect participant in the raptures I myself was receiving. She thoroughly enjoyed it and being relieved from any fear of surprise, after my informing her of the absence of all the family, she gave way to all the force of her ardent amorous propensities, enjoyed our delicious fuck thoroughly, and spent at the same time as myself with screams of satiated passion. After this I withdrew. She kissed me most tenderly, and said I was as bad and wild a boy as ever, that she loved me too tenderly ever to refuse me anything I desired and begged me to sit by her side and talk of old times. No, I said, on the contrary, tell me all about yourself, I have not seen you since your marriage day, and I want to know how the after part went off. I was in dread lest our embracings should have left traces that would make your husband suspect you were not all he had anticipated. You are a strange boy, my dear Charlie and more of a man in every way than many ten years older than yourself. Who would have thought such ideas would have been running through so young a head? Well, my darling boy, I was somewhat uneasy on that very point myself, and, indeed, had fixed the marriage day when I expected I should be unwell on the very night, but in that I was disappointed, nothing came, and I was driven to act in the best way I could. 
I kept my legs close together. I got my hand down to that part of my person, and kept squeezing my affair as close as possible. I pressed hard with my fingers on his weapon as he forced an entrance, and all at once gave way with a scream of apparent pain, as he gave an extra thrust, and let him penetrate at once. An inexperienced husband takes much on credit and imagination, I quite satisfied him that he was the first possessor of my person, but, oh! My beloved Charlie, I found I was really ready in the family way, and you, my dear fellow, are the father of the baby now within my womb. What? I? I? The father of your baby? Oh, dear, darling Mrs. Vincent, oh, say that again. It is indeed true, my dear Charlie, and the knowledge that I first possessed you, and you me, reconciles me to giving my husband a child that is not his. My child, my child. I cried, and I danced round in a paroxysm of delight at the idea of being a father. It seemed at once to elevate me to manhood, and puffed me up with pride. I rushed upon dear Mrs. V, embraced her most warmly, and pushing her back on the sofa, said. I must see how the little angel looks in his cell. I turned up her petticoats, and exposed all her beauteous belly, already by its swelling showing there was more there than ever went into her mouth. Her cunt too had become more prominent. I stooped, kissed her lovely quim, gave it a good suck, then Gama hutched her till she cried out for my prick to fuck her, and a most exquisite and rapturous fuck we had. The thought that I was baptizing my own babe with my sperm stimulated my lubricity, and we ran a course of the most libidinous delights until we dissolved away in the most voluptuous death-like exhaustion of satisfied desires. Charlie, my darling, you must get up, remember you may injure the dear little creature by too great an excess, so pray rise. I rose at once, but only to embrace her most tenderly. She complained of feeling somewhat faint, and said we must now go to the house to get some wine. We put ourselves in order, and all radiant at the thoughts of paternity, I strutted along as proud as a peacock, and thinking no small beer of myself. I hardly knew whether I stood on my head or my heels, and was quite extravagant in my conduct. Dear Mrs. V was obliged seriously to caution me before I could come to a proper reserved behavior in presence of the servants. She rested about half an hour, and was about to order the gig up to the door, but I implored her to send it round to the road below the summer house, as I should all the longer have the pleasure of being with her. She smiled, and again gave me a pat on the cheek, as much as to say, I understand you, you rogue but did as I suggested. So we proceeded through the grounds, and were at the summer house some time before the gig could be harnessed and come round to the road below. I did not wait for that, but embracing darling Mrs. V, wanted to push her down on the sofa. No, no, dear Charlie, that will tumble. My dress too much, and we shall have no time to put it in order, stop, I will kneel on the low couch and you will stand behind, I can guide you from below, and you know I always thought you got further in and gave me more pleasure that way than any other. She knelt down, and I canted her clothes right over her shoulders, and exhibited her fine buttocks, which, now she was in the family way, had widened out, and were fatter and rounder than ever. First gluttonously kissing them, I brought my prick right against them. Mrs. Vincent projected her hand behind, seized and guided him into her glowing and longing cunt, and he plunged at one bound up to the hilt. Gently, Charlie dear, she cried, remember our dear baby is there, and you must not be too violent. This at once reduced me to moderation. I had a hand on each hip, and as I slowly glided in, I pressed her splendid buttocks backwards to meet me. I kept my body upright so as to enjoy the lovely sight of the movement of her bottom. Put your arm round and feel my clitoris, Charlie, dear. I did so for a minute, and then whispered. 
It is such delight to gaze on your splendid bum in action, so pray apply your own finger to your clitoris, and let me enjoy the lovely sight. Very well, darling. And I could feel her frigging away most furiously. This enabled me to introduce first one and then two fingers into her most delicious bottom hole. When I found she was in the greatest state of excitement, I suddenly shifted my prick, and substituted it for my fingers. In her surprise and excitement, she had no time to resist, and I glided in, not too rapidly, quite up as far as I could go. She flinched a little, and called me a bad fellow, but I held her hips too tight to allow of her unseating me, even if she had wished. I begged she would let me go on, for I had never forgotten the delight of doing it this way the night before her marriage. She made no reply, but I could feel redoubled action with her finger on her clitoris, and the muscular twitchings of her loins and sphincter soon convinced me that nothing would please her better than finishing our course where I was and most delicious it proved. We should have died away in loud cries of agonized delight but for the necessity of prudence, for doubtless the gig was then awaiting but a few yards off. My darling mistress seemed unwilling to let me withdraw, she held my prick in such close and firm embrace, throbbing on it from moment to moment, and so exciting him that she shortly felt he was again stiffening inside of her. She rose on her legs, and by that action unsheathed me. Then. Turning round, she threw her arms about my neck, and most tenderly embraced me, thanking me for having given her such exquisite proofs of love. But I must go, my dear Charlie, and I hope we shall have occasionally some other delicious opportunity of enjoying such raptures again. Say everything kind to your mother and the girls, and tell them I shall come ever again shortly and see them all. I saw her into her gig and watched her until a turn in the road hid her from my sight. I returned to the summer house, and kissed the spot she had last pressed with her lovely body. My soul was filled with love of her, and pride that I was man enough to put a babe into her belly. I strutted about the room, and if anyone could have seen me I should doubtless have appeared ridiculous. Mama, our new governess, and the girls returned to tea. I told them of Mrs. Vincent's visit, and her regret at finding them absent, also of her promise to drive over again on an early day. My mother hoped I had been attentive to her. I said I had, as well as I could, and had got some wine and biscuits, as she complained of not feeling very well, she thought the jolting road had tired her. It may well be supposed that after the impression our new governess had made upon us, we were very attentive for some time. Indeed, her system of teaching was really excellent, far superior, in that respect, to our former governess. She had a method of interesting you in what she was teaching, and for quite two months we paid such great attention, and made such really extraordinary progress, that she could not help praising us highly to Mama while we were in the room. This was bad policy, because, with the natural thoughtlessness of youth, we fancied ourselves so clever that we became less attentive. This was patiently borne with for some time, probably in consequence of our previous good behavior. But at last Lizzie was somewhat impudent when blamed rather harshly by Miss Franklin. Oh, it has come to that, has it? We shall see. She continued our lessons until four o'clock as usual and then desired Lizzie to remain where she was, she dismissed Mary and me, locked the door on poor Lizzie, and went away, doubtless for a rod. She soon returned, and locking herself in, most severely whipped poor Lizzie's bottom. She sent her out when it was finished, and Lizzie joined us, weeping bitterly from the pain she was suffering. We laid her on the couch, and turned her petticoats over her head to cool her bottom, which she declared felt as if burning hot coals were spread over it. I kissed the dear red buttocks that were all covered with wheels and looked like raw beef, but no blood had been drawn. We fanned her with our handkerchiefs, which she said was a delightful relief. In a very few minutes she began to wriggle her bottom in a state of excitement, and cried out. 
Dear Charlie, do shove your prick into my cunt, it has begun to long for a fuck. I wanted nothing but this to instantly act, for the sight of her bare bum had already made my cock stand as stiff as iron. She raised herself on her hands and knees, presenting the back entrance to her cunt, and telling me it was there she must have it instantly. I plunged up to the hilt in a moment, for she was as juicy and moist as if she had spent, which it is more than probable was the case. Very few powerful thrusts on my part, seconded by energetic action on hers, and she spent again with a scream of delight, and with a pressure on my cock that almost hurt it. She hardly paused a moment before she cried out. Shove on, dear Charlie, push it in further if you can, I am burning with desire. She wriggled her backside in every way in the most lascivious and delicious manner, and when she felt the crisis approaching, by the increased swelling and hardness of my prick as well as the peculiar electric effect at the moment, she met my flood of sperm with so copious a discharge that it literally spurted out and deluged my cods and thighs. She held me tight, and would not allow me to withdraw until I had myself spent four times and she seven at least. We then rose, her nerves calmed by the repeated doses of hot boiling sperm shot into her interior. She declared that never in all her fucking had she felt such insatiable desire, or more ravishing delight in satisfying it, that she would undergo a dozen such floggings to have the same rapturous enjoyment. I am sure, she said, it was all the effect of the rod, I never felt anything like it before. Mary all this time had been but a spectator, and a pleased one to see the erotic fury of her sister and my powerful efforts to allay it. It is true we had both had a delicious fuck during the time poor Lizzie was catching it on her backside, and I had just gamma hutched her deliciously afterwards as Lizzie came in in such pain. Miss Franklin had retired to her room, and looked still flushed and somewhat wild looking when she joined us after the usual hour's recreation. As may well be supposed, we were all as attentive as possible. There was one circumstance that evidently pleased Miss Franklin immensely. When Lizzie, in her turn, went up to repeat her lesson, she suddenly threw her arms round Miss Franklin's neck, and with tears running over her cheeks, sobbed out. Dear Miss Franklin, pray forgive me, and let me kiss you, for I love you dearly. There was a bright sparkle of delight in Miss Franklin's eyes. She clasped Lizzie round the waist, and drew her to her lips in a long sweet kiss of love, which seemed as if it would never end. We observed Miss Franklin's color rise. She at last put Lizzie away, and said she was a dear amiable girl, whom she could not help loving. Go to your seat, you are too agitated, my dear, to say your lesson just now, so send Mary up. Lizzie came back to her seat but I could not help fancying I saw a complete expression of erotic desire on her countenance. When afterwards we were alone together, she told us that when the governess kissed her, she felt Miss F.S. tongue glide into her mouth, and tip her the velvet in a most delicious and exciting manner, and she believed that if they had been alone they must have given each other mutual embraces of a warmer description. This led me to think that Miss Franklin was herself rendered lecherous by the action of even wielding the rod. Lizzie during the whole of the next week did nothing but rave of the excessive excitement that her whipping had put her into, and the extreme felicity she felt in having her salacious lechery satisfied. We were not able to meet every day, for frequently Miss Franklin accompanied us, and joined in the youthful sports we then gave way to. Lizzie continuing to harp on the extraordinary enjoyment the whipping had procured her, after it was over, fired the imagination of Mary, until she was wound up to a pitch of actually longing to be whipped. In such a case it was easy to incur the penalty, she had but willfully to neglect her studies, and she was sure to get it. This she accordingly did, and it resulted as before. When released, she rushed to the summer house, and without any preliminaries, called upon me to fuck her directly, and a very similar scene followed to that which had occurred when dear Lizzie was whipped. Mary did not, however, 
give way to the uncontrollable desire to throw herself into Miss Franklin's arms as Lizzie had done. Miss F, as usual, retired to her room after the punishment was over, and was late in coming down, with the same flushed face and excited eye. I became convinced that she herself was salaciously excited by the act, and I began to fancy that with such passions, if I could but excite her in any way, it might be worth my while. When once these lecherous ideas were raised in my imagination, desire soon painted her with every charm of beauty, and I became excessively lewd and anxious to possess her. The more I looked at and scanned the really beauteous proportions of her finely developed form, the more my determination to have her took root, and grew strong within me. About this time Miss Franklin, who had become a great favorite with Mama, obtained permission to take possession of the spare bedroom, with an understanding that she was to cede it to any visitor who might come. Of course, this circumstance made my desire to get into her good graces doubly strong, inasmuch as the opportunity of sleeping with her afterwards could be so easily effected. I determined to watch her when retiring to bed, and try to get a view of her naked form. For this purpose I removed the stopping of moistened bread I had put in the hole I made to see Mr. Benson fucking his wife. I lay awake, until she came to bed. I saw her undress, but only caught sight of her naked bubbies, over her chemise. As I have said, they were not large, but widely separated, with a fine flat neck up to the throat. I mean that she showed no collar bone, which is a great beauty in woman. She had evidently been quite naked, and had used the bidet, but the extent of the slit in the door did not allow me to command the part of the room where she had used it. I remedied this defect next day, and the following night was rewarded with a most glorious sight. You may well suppose that I did not let sleep overcome me, but was at my post as soon as ever I heard her enter her room. I was on my knees in a moment, at my peephole and saw her deliberately undress to her chemise. She then arranged all her magnificent head of hair, brushing it out as far and further than her arms would extend, and after well brushing and combing it, she plaited and rolled it up, in a great big rouleau behind, then washing her hands, she drew out the bidet, poured water into it, and then divested herself of her shift. She was standing in front of the dressing table, with two candles shining on her, so that when she lifted her shift over her head, I had a well-lighted full view of her wonderfully covered belly. She was all over hair, it was as black as coal, and shone as if polished in all its beautiful curls. I am now an old man, but never have I seen the equal to that dear woman in a hairy belly. It was quite up to her navel, and several inches down the inside of her thighs, besides running thickly in the chinks of her bottom, and with two bunches where the beautiful back dimple is usually situated, as thick, and even thicker than ordinary women have in on their mounts. In addition to this, there was a beautiful little line of curls that ran up her belly, as far as between her bubbies, to say nothing of the very hairy thighs, legs, and arms. I never saw a more deliciously hairy woman, and she was all that such excessive growth of hair denoted passionate and lecherous to a degree, when once she had confidence in her companion, to let her feelings have vent. Of course, I am now describing my after experience, at the moment I was only dazzled by the extraordinary richness and quantity of that exquisite ornament hair not only in splendid quantity on the head, but in a profusion such as I had never then and have not since witnessed. I was struck dumb with astonishment and admiration. She laved her hairy cunt, and all the adjacent parts, then wiped herself dry, put on her nightgown, extinguished her light, and, of course, got into bed. So did I but only to toss and tumble, and at last, in troubled sleep, to dream of that most gloriously covered cunt, and to imagine myself reveling therein. So great was my excitement that I had the first wet dream I ever experienced. It is needless to say, it was under the dreaming idea that I was enjoying to the utmost that wonder cunt. 
I was quite exhausted by morning with such a restless night, and was not only very distrait, but was really so fatigued that I could not attend to my lessons. Of course Miss Franklin noticed this, and being unaware of the cause, attributed it to willful idleness and bravado of her authority. She spoke very gravely and seriously to me, and told me if I did not improve my conduct by next day it would be her painful duty to punish me with severity. I expect to see you exhibit very different conduct tomorrow, otherwise you will drive me to do that which I would much rather not. It rained hard that afternoon, and we had to amuse ourselves with indoors. On retiring for the night, I determined to watch again for Miss Franklin, but my want of rest the previous night overpowered me, and I fell fast asleep until far in the night. I rose and crept to my peephole, but all was dark. I could hear Miss Franklin breathing heavily. The thought at once struck me that I might safely steal up to my sister's room, as they were now alone, since Miss F had the previous night removed to the spare bedroom, where she was now fast asleep. So softly opening my door, and leaving it ajar, I crept along the passage, gained my sister's room, and gently awakening them, jumped in between them, to their great joy and satisfaction. We immediately began with a gama hutch, I taking Mary's cunt, while Lizzie crossed her legs over her head, and was gama hutched by Mary, whose finger was at the same time acting postillion to her charming bottom hole, while I had the exquisite prospect before me of their operations. As soon as ever Mary spent I made Lizzie lie down on her back, with her head towards the bottom of the bed, Mary knelt over her in the opposite direction, presenting her very full backside, which was daily developing larger proportions. I plunged into her cunt, plugging her little rosy bumhole at the same time with my middle finger, while Lizzie did as much for me, at the same time rubbing Mary's clitoris with the fleshy end of the thumb, while Mary, at the same time she herself was fucked and frigged in two places, was employed in gamma hutching Lizzie, and frigging her bottom hole with two fingers, Lizzie declaring that one finger felt as nothing. We lengthened out our delicious proceedings until excess of excitement compelled us to give way to all the fury of our feelings, and we managed to spend all together with such rapturous and lascivious delight as rendered us quite powerless for some time. We then had a delicious cuddle, the girls having each one hand on my prick and the other on my buttocks. When we had once more worked ourselves up to fucking heat, we reversed the previous position, and I fucked Lizzie. Mary was gamma hutched and bottom fingered by Lizzie, while she employed herself with Lizzie's clitoris and my bum hole. Lizzie was far hotter and more salacious than any of us, and spent copiously on my delighted prick, which enjoyed excessively the warm bath of glutinous liquid that was poured down upon it. I gave a few slow drawn thrusts in and out, to moisten well its whole shaft, and removing my two fingers from her delicious bottom hole, and wetting it with my saliva, I withdrew my prick from the reeking sheath of her cunt, and to her great delight slowly housed it in her longing and exquisitely delicious bottom hole, keeping it quiet there for some time, so as not to spend before Lizzie was ready. I enjoyed the delicious throbbing of her body, which at last becoming too exciting, I stooped over her, passed a hand under her belly, replaced Mary's fingers, rubbing her clitoris while Mary frigged her cunt with two fingers thrust into it. We thus quickly brought matters to an end, and died off in all the ecstasies of satiated lust. As daylight was beginning to dawn, I tore myself from their loving embraces, gained my room in safety, and slept the sleep of the just until late in the morning. My orgy with my sisters had so far satisfied my animal passions that I rather began to dread the severity I knew Miss Franklin would use if I came under her hand. This made me so far attentive next day as to satisfy her, and as it was a fine afternoon she came out to walk in the garden, while we innocently amused ourselves. That evening I kept awake, and again enjoyed the superb display of Miss Franklin's wonderfully hairy cunt, all the lower part of her body was as black as a chimney sweeper's. The sight awakened every lustful feeling within me. I felt I must possess her, 
and determined to brave the severest infliction she could give me with the rod. I somehow, instinctively, arrived at the conclusion that this extraordinary profusion of hair could only grow where nature had implanted the hottest animal passions, and had but to greatly excite them to turn their lust to my advantage. I determined that tomorrow I should bring things to a crisis, and that I might be equal to every effort I went to my bed, and did not attempt to steal up to my sister's room. Next day nothing could be made of me in the morning, Miss Franklin sternly warned me that if such conduct was pursued after dinner nothing should save my skin from a severe scourging. However, my mind was made up, and I went in for the whole hog, as our vulgar Yankee cousins say. I was more idle and insubordinate than ever. Miss F looked thunder, at four o'clock she ordered me to stay, and the girls to go. She then locked the door, took out from the desk a formidable rod, and told me to approach her. I did so really half in fear, for she could look dreadfully fierce and determined, in which case I came up to her side. Now, Charles, she said, your conduct. For two or three days past, has been such as I cannot put up with. Your mother has given me full power to punish any of you severely, if I think you deserve it, you are getting to be of an age that I hoped you would have so acted as to give me no cause of offense, but I am sorry to see my hopes are disappointed. I am now about to punish you, submit to it quietly, or it will be all the worse for you. Unbutton and put down your trousers. I felt I must submit but when brought to this point I really so much dreaded her that there was not the slightest erection in poor cocky. While I was undoing my trousers, I observed that Miss Franklin had quite lifted up her outer frock, and had sat down, evidently intending to flog me across her knee. Both being ready, she told me to put the footstool by her side and kneel upon it, then desiring me to bend forward over her knees she put one hand over my body to hold me down then uncovering my bottom, and taking the rod, which was by her side, she raised her arm and gave me a fearful cut, which made me not only flinch, but cry out most lustily. Blow followed blow, causing at first great agony, that made me cry again in good earnest, then the very continuance of the blow seemed to deaden the parts until I hardly felt them. This was succeeded by a titillation and lascivious excitement which speedily brought my prick out in the fullest vigor. I then began to push it against Miss Franklin's thigh, and to wriggle myself nearly off her knees. Seemingly to prevent this, she passed her left arm quite round my body, bringing her hand under my belly, and, apparently by accident, against my prick, which she grasped and I could feel her hand pass both up and down it as if she was measuring its length and thickness, continuing all the time to shower down blow after blow on my devoted backside. As she held a firm grasp on my prick, I pretended to be evading the blows, while in reality I was thrusting it in and out of her hand with the utmost energy and excitement, which speedily brought on the delightful crisis, and with a cry of rapture I gave down a copious discharge into her hand and sank almost senseless on her lap. I pretended complete loss of consciousness, which she believing, she gently felt, and even frigged a little, my prick, pressing me the while close to her body, and then I felt a shudder run through her whole frame. I have no doubt she was in a paroxysm of lust, and had spent, I gave her time to recover a little, and then pretending to come to my senses, but in a confused state of ideas, said. Oh, what has happened? I have been in heaven. Then raising myself, and apparently only just recognizing Miss Franklin, I threw my arms round her neck, and exclaimed. Dear Miss Franklin, do flog me again if it will produce again such ecstasies as I never before experienced. Her face was flushed, her eye shone with all the fire of libidinous passion. My prick had hardly lost its stiffness when I spent, and was now projecting out firmer than ever. Why, Charles, I thought you a mere boy, while you are quite a man with such a thing as this. Oh. I cried, do continue to hold it, 
you give me such pleasure. Has anyone else ever held it in this way? No, I never felt anything like it before. But don't you know what this is meant to do? Oh, yes, it is what I piddle from. She laughed, and asked if it was often in its present state of stiffness. Every morning when I awake it is so, and it hurts me very much until I piddle. And has no one ever taught you any other use of it? No, what use can it be of? You dear innocent boy, if I could trust you, I would teach you a secret that this dear thing would greatly enjoy. But can I trust you? Oh, certainly, dear Miss Franklin, I know what you mean now, to repeat the delicious sensations you gave me a few minutes ago. Oh, do, do. Do it again, it was far too nice for me ever to tell anybody, as long as you will do it for me. Well, Charles, I will trust you. Do you know that women are differently formed from you? Yes, I used to sleep in Mama's room, and I have often been surprised to see that she piddled from a long hole, and had not got a doodle like I have to piddle from. My dear innocent Charlie, that long hole was made to take in this dear fellow here that is throbbing almost to bursting in my hand, and if you promise me faithfully never to tell anyone, I will teach you how it is done. You may be sure my protestations of secrecy were most earnest. Look here then, my dear boy, and see what I have got between my legs. She laid herself back on the long chair, drew up her petticoats, and exhibited to my charmed gaze the wondrous wealth of hair she possessed. Opening her legs, I saw the widespread rosy lips showing themselves in beautiful contrast to the coal black hair that grew in the greatest profusion all round the lower lips, and extended also some five or six inches down the side of each thigh. But what at the moment most astonished me, and drew all my attention, was to see a deep red clitoris standing out from the upper part of her cunt quite stiff, and as long and as thick as the middle finger of a man. I very nearly betrayed myself at the sight, but, fortunately, was able to keep up the character of apparent ignorance I had hitherto shown, and said you, also, have got a little doodle to piddle with. She laughed, and said, It is very different from yours. Give me yours here, that I may kiss it. She fondled it for a second or two, and then could not resist the impulse to take it into her mouth and suck it. Oh, what pleasure! I shall die. Not yet, dear boy, kneel down there, and I shall instruct you in the real secret of pleasure. But, before she could do anything, I threw my head down, crying out. I must give this pretty little fellow a taste of the pleasure you have just given mine. And in an instant I had the delicious thing up to the root in my mouth, sucking furiously at it. Her twistings, and up and down action of her loins, showed how rapturously I was exciting her, in fact, I brought on the crisis, when she pressed my head down hard upon it, and closed her thighs on each side of my head, as she poured over my chin and breast a perfect torrent of sperm. A minute after she seized my arms, and drew me up on her belly, then slipping her hand down between us, she seized my prick and guided him, nothing loath, into her burning hot and foaming cunt. She placed her hands on my buttocks, and pressing me right up to the hilt, began a movement which she told me how to second, that in a very short time brought down an exquisite spend from me. The idea that she was giving me the first lesson in love, and of being the first possessor of my person, seemed to excite her lust to the utmost, and she immediately followed my discharge with another, so copious that it spurted all over my thighs. Her force of pressure on my prick in her agonies of enjoyment was so great as nearly to hurt me. I never knew anyone but her with such strength of pressure of cunt on the prick. She has often actually brought tears into my eyes, so powerful was her grip that it made me really feel as if in a vice. She lay back with closed eyes and panting bosom in a rapturous trance of lascivious lubricity, her throbbing cunt holding me tightly pressed between its palpitating folds in the most delicious imprisonment, 
and from time to time grasping my prick with a pressure that very shortly restored it to its fullest vigor and stiffness. She was as hot as fire and responded immediately to the renewed life she found stirring within me. She gave way to her salacious lust with, if anything, a more passionate excess than the first time. My superb weapon seemed to stir up within her a force of lubricity that nothing could seem to satisfy. Her hands clutched my buttocks convulsively, and seemed to wish to force my whole body into her wildly excited cunt. With such vigor was the action carried on that the grand crisis soon arrived, most rapturous to both, and almost maddening to Miss Franklin. The heavings of her body and gaspings for breath were quite hysterical, while, with one of those real vice-like pressures, I felt as if she were nipping my prick in two. It was not a mere throbbing pressure, but a long-continued convulsive squeeze, as if her cunt had been seized like the jaws of the mouth with locked jaw, and could not open. It was nearly ten minutes before she recovered her senses. She seized my head between her hands, kissed me most lovingly, declared I was the dearest creature that ever lived, that she had never before had anyone who had so satisfied her, and filled her with inexpressible rapture, and see. This fondling had again brought up my prick to full stand Miss Franklin said. Dear Charlie, we must be prudent, as the time is drawing near for your sister's return. But there was no stopping. The exquisite pleasure of her splendid interior cunt pressures was irresistible. My movements speedily determined matters in my favor. Miss Franklin's temperament was far too warm not to quickly set her passions to the highest fucking heat, and again we had a most exquisite fuck, lengthened out more luxuriously by the more urgent fires of desire having been moderated by the three previous discharges. With more abandon we both sank in the death-like ecstasies of the delicious melting away in all the luxury of contented and voluptuous discharges. Miss Franklin lay for some short time luxuriously closing in my delighted prick, but raising her body, she said. Charles, we must cease for the present. And, pushing me away, I was forced to withdraw, but her dear cunt seemed as reluctant as myself and held my prick so tight that I had to pull hard to draw it out, and, at last, he left with a noise like drawing a cork from a well-corked bottle. Before I rose, or she could hinder me, I threw myself down and glued my lips to her reeking cunt, and greedily licked up the foaming sperm that had surged out of her well-gorged quim. She with difficulty drew away her body, but as I rose she clasped me to her bosom and kissed me most fervently, and licked her own sperm off my richly covered lips. Begging me to button up, and putting herself to rights, she desired me to sit down by her side. She wiped my mouth with her handkerchief, arranged my disordered necktie, collar, and hair. We then embraced most tenderly, and she thanked me for the immense gratification I had given her. She praised my parts as being of extraordinary development and more satisfying than any she had yet had any experience of. This was the second time she referred to other experiences. I took no notice of this all the time, as if I was supposed to be too ignorant or innocent to think any harm of it, but I determined in some excess of passion to get her to give me a recital of some of her previous experiences. Before my sisters came in, she said, I shall try and arrange some means for our meeting unobserved tomorrow. Meanwhile, you must sit as if you had been severely punished, and I shall assert that you had done everything to resist my authority, for which I had punished you further by not allowing you to leave the schoolroom. I said not a word to Miss F about the ease of meeting by merely opening the door of communication between our rooms. I was afraid to make her suspicious of a former use of it. But I determined, when she came to bed, to rap at the door and beg her to open it, and I had no doubt she would be as delighted as myself to find with what facility she could indulge to the utmost every libidinous passion which her lascivious nature could suggest. My sisters returned, and appeared disappointed that I had not been able to join them, as they had anticipated a glorious fuck or two each, after the whipping had excited me as it did them. 
They told me afterwards they had been obliged to content themselves with a double mutual gamma hutch, but it did not make up for my absence. While they were all engaged after tea, I slipped up to Miss Franklin's room to see that the key was in the lock of the door between our two rooms. I opened it, oiled the hinges, and locked it again from her side. I also, with a view to sometimes slipping up to my sister's room, oiled my own and their doors, hinges, and locks, as now that the ice was broken with Miss Franklin, it would be necessary to be doubly careful not to excite suspicion of my visits to my sisters. Having finished everything to my satisfaction, I joined them in the drawing room, and while my sisters were playing duets on the piano to Mama, I challenged Miss Franklin to a game of chess. She, of course, was a far superior player to me, but our legs meeting under the chess table, her little charming foot sought mine, rested on it, and pressed it from time to time. This distraction of her ideas enabled me to win two games successively. My mother sent the girls to bed, and told me to follow their example, but as I did not wish to lie long waiting for Miss Franklin's appearance in her bedroom, I pleaded for relaxation in the hour of retiring, to enable Miss Franklin to regain her chance of beating me, at the same time pressing her foot as a sign to her to second my request. She took the hint, though she had no idea of the object. Mama came near us to look over our game. This induced Miss Franklin to play with more caution and thought, and she won three games in succession, making her the final winner. Mama now said I must go to bed, as it was very late for me. She still treated me as a child. I, however, had gained my object in obtaining nearly two hours delay in going to bed, so that I had not long to wait before I heard Miss Franklin enter her room. I determined to let her finish her toilet before I called her attention to me. I watched through my peephole, and could now calmly and leisurely see all the beauties of her well-developed form, and the rich wealth of hair she possessed. She went through all her ablutions as usual. I observed she also used a syringe to thoroughly purify the inside of her glorious cunt. When she had dried herself, and was about to pull on her chemise, I rapped on the door of communication, and in a loud whisper called her attention to me. Are you there, Charlie? Yes, pray unlock the door and open it, that I may come to you. She actually had not yet discovered that the door, locked and bolted on her side, communicated with my bedroom, but her delight at the discovery was greater than her surprise. I flew into her arms, and was hugged to her bosom, and covered with kisses. But as my prick was in a bursting state of erection, I drew her to the bed, upon which we both threw ourselves, she on her back, and I above, and in an instant I was engulfed up to the cods in her glorious and glowing cunt, and we ran an eager course of rapturous thrustings, until nature could stand no more, and we sank in all the delights of a most delicious mutual spend. I lay soaking in bliss for some time, and after fondling each other, Miss Franklin said, Get up, dear Charlie, and let us get into bed for we had been in too great haste to do otherwise than tumble on the top to it. My charming bedfellow also rose for a necessary purpose, which I had interrupted when I knocked at the door. She sat down on the pot de chamber, and a mighty rush of water followed. I cried. Oh, do let me see you piddle from your beautiful fanny. I still kept up my character of innocence, and used none but infantine words in reference to our organs of generation. She laughed, but pulled up her shift, and raised her thighs above the pot, so advancing the light, I had the delicious sight of her wide-stretched cunt, pouring out a stream of piddle with great force. Her position brought out all the beauties of the vast widespread mass of black curly hair that thickly covered all the lower part of her magnificent quim, ran down each thigh, up between her buttocks, and opening out on her back, had two bunches just below the two beautiful dimples that were so charmingly developed below her waist. There was as much hair there as most women have on their mons veneris. 
Her whole body had fine straight silky hair on it, very thick on the shoulders, arms, and legs, with a beautiful creamy skin showing below. She was the hairiest woman I ever saw, which, doubtless, arose from or was the cause of her extraordinary lustful and luxurious temperament. The sight I was indulging in brought out my pico in full bloom, as we both rose she saw it sticking out under my shirt. Off with all that, and let me gaze on your charming young perfections. I did as she desired, begged her to do the same, and there she stood, in all the glory of her superb form. We encircled each other's naked bodies, and then turned each other round to gaze on all the exciting charms displayed to each other. Come, my darling boy, and let me kiss and fondle you all over. She laid me on my back, reversed herself above me, and taking my prick in her mouth, after first feeling it most gently, and praising its large proportions, again declaring it was the finest she had ever seen, she began to gama hutch me with a skill such as I had never before experienced, and gave me the most exquisite and most luxurious delight. For my part, seeing her wonderful clitoris, stiff standing out of the bright red lips of her luscious cunt, I took it bodily into my mouth, sucked it, and rolled my tongue about it, to the evident delight of my salacious companion. Her buttocks rose and fell, and the lips of her cunt immediately before my eyes opened, or closely pressed the lips together, showing the delicious nature of her enjoyment. I felt her put her hand to my bottom and insert her finger, and begin frigging me there. I let her see how it pleased me. She stopped a moment, to beg me to do the same to her, anticipating my earnest desire to do so. I lost no time in following her example. The parts adjacent were well lubricated by our previous indulgence, and first inserting two fingers into her deliciously juicy cunt to moisten them. I slipped one of them into her charming bottom hole, and finding great ease of space, slipped the second in as well. My other hand and arm embraced and caressed her magnificent backside, which rose and fell on my face with unwearied speed, as my finger frigged her bottom hole in unison with her movements, and my mouth more closely sucked her stiffly excited clitoris. Her whole body became convulsed with erotic movements showing what force of lubricity our mutual embracings were most rapturously exciting. I, too, grew wild with desire, and was equally energetic in my movements, and would have thrust my prick down her throat but for her hand, which grasped the lower part of the shaft. The rapturous crisis came at last and laid us prostrate with soul-killing ecstasies. We each retained the dear object of our mutual caresses within our lips and our fingers remained within the delightful recesses that had so much contributed to the excessive raptures we had enjoyed. We lay for some time in this sweet languid enjoyment. Miss Franklin then rose from off me, saying, My darling boy, we must now get into bed. We did so, quite naked as we were, closely embracing and covering each other with kisses and caresses, murmuring soft terms of endearment, and in whispered accents told of the ecstatic joys each had given the other. Our hands wandered over every charm. Miss Franklin had an art of gently passing her fingers over my prick that had the instant effect of raising him into the fullest vigor. It was the most exquisite method of feeling my cock I ever experienced. She seemed scarcely to touch it, but drew her fingers along its length, from foot to head, with a delicacy of touch I have never found equaled by any other woman. The effect was magical, and invariable, no matter how many times I might have fucked. Her before. With her hot temperament, and excessive lubricity, it was almost a necessary art. She was one of those libidinous natures that could well employ several men at once. At my happy age, she found ready to her hand one who could respond to her every desire in every way, so happily does nature second youth and health that she never found me wanting, when called on. There was no excess of lubricity we did not afterwards practice. We satisfied our passions in every way in which they could be indulged nor did we hesitate at anything which imagination could fancy would stimulate them. 
She was surprised at my aptitude, and rejoiced and congratulated herself on having found so powerful and charming a satisfier of her libidinous nature. How delighted she was to think she was the first to cull the sweets of my innocence, and how happy to find so apt a scholar, who in one sweet lesson became a master of the art. The more I gained experience of the charming sex, the more I appreciated the wisdom of the counsels of my really first and ever loved mistress, dear, charming, lovely Mrs. Benson. How truly she had foretold that all who might hereafter think that they were giving me the first lesson in love would doubly, trebly, a hundredfold enjoy the sweet intercourse from such self-deception. Here was my fiery Miss Franklin, who had had considerable experience in the amatory world, pluming herself upon instructing an innocent youth in all the mysteries of the passions for the first time. It evidently added immensely to her excitement. Indeed, in our after conversation, she avowed that as it was the first time she had ever taken the maidenhead of a youth, so it had been the greatest degree of excitement she had ever experienced. I might fancy her delight at finding combined with such a satisfaction a wonderfully well-hung youth, and who proved so apt, and so equal to every luxurious whim that the most erotic lust could suggest. But I digress. At present, her magic touch had brought me up to bursting point, she threw a leg over me, and raising her body, said she would help herself this time. Guiding my prick to the wanton lips that were longing for him, she sank slowly down on the stiff pole on which she was so delightedly impaling herself, until our hairs were crushed beneath her weight, and nothing more could be engulfed. She again rose, until the edge of the nut showed itself at the mouth of her cunt, and then as slowly sheathed it again. She continued this exquisite movement for some time, to our delicious mutual enjoyment, then falling down on my belly, and telling me to pass my arm round her bottom and finger her as before, she glued herself to my lips, our tongues interlaced, and shot in and out of our luxurious mouths, our movement grew fast and furious, until we again sank in all the luxury of the last grand crisis. It was the very act of voluptuous rapture, and we lay lost to every sense but that of erotic ecstasy and satisfied lust. When we recovered our senses, she lay down by my side, cuddling me most closely, and toying and prattling, until she thought we had paused long enough. She slid her hand down to my prick, and very quickly, by her delicious and delicate handling of it, renewed its full vigor. Throwing her right leg over me, while lying on her back, she heaved up her body into a position half turned to my belly, I lying on my side, she then bid me embrace her other thigh between mine, then guiding cocky to the entrance, she gave a push backwards, to meet my forward thrust, when it was instantly sheathed to the hilt. Now, my darling boy, in this way we can lengthen out our pleasures as long as we please, you can make me spend oftener than yourself, which will satisfy my very lustful nature, and not over-exhaust your young powers giving one or two delicious side wriggles to her bottom, and nestling her backside close to my belly, she told me to pass my left arm under her waist that I might embrace her left bubby and finger its nipple, a proceeding which she told me was as exciting as playing with her clitoris then turning her head, our tongues interlaced, she put my right hand down to her stiff projecting clitoris, which I continued to frig just as I might have done to a boy's cock. Keeping up a slow in and out movement with my prick, excited by so many points of lascivious friction, she spent most copiously before I was prepared to join her. Her head sank back in the ecstasy of her discharge, drawing away from me, and leaving my mouth free. I instantly dropped it upon her other firm and elastic bubby, at which I sucked away, pushing my prick as far as possible into her cunt, and leaving it there without movement, to enjoy the rapture-giving pressures of her delicious cunt, slowly passing my hand up and down her still sufficiently indurated clitoris. She lay for some time in the luxurious enjoyment of the position, then once more sucking my lips, she thanked me over and over again for the pleasure I had given her, heightened as it was by knowing that it had not exhausted me. 
I began to move slowly in and out, keeping up my movements at the other points of excitement. She was ready on the instant to second me, and as she meant this time that we should spend together she left nothing to desire. Her movements were of the most exciting and stimulating description, and we were not long before the ecstatic moment arrived, and we sank in the lap of luxury, pouring forth streams of ecstatic bliss. We lay close locked in the most delicious embrace, only conscious of unutterable joy. It was some time before we could venture to break this exquisite trance of enjoyment. It was followed by the sweetest toyings and prattlings, until again my delighted prick, stimulated by the internal pressures of the luxurious sheath in which it had remained engulfed, again awoke her scarce slumbering passions to dash on pleasure's heavenly course. Again she spent before me with, if anything, increased rapture, and, after a pause, renewing her lascivious movements in response to my own, we sank in a perfect death-like swoon of thoroughly satiated lust, and gradually and imperceptibly fell into the deepest slumber for many hours, locked as we were in each other's arms. Her wonderfully retentive power of cunt held my happy prick a willing prisoner through our long sleep. I awoke first, to find it standing stiff within the charmed circle which even in her sleep was deliciously grasping it with its nervous folds. I passed my hand down to her clitoris, and began fucking her. She heaved her bottom up and down, and murmured some incoherent words, being evidently still under the influence of sleep, and probably dreaming of some former events, for in her half-expressed murmurings, I could make out something. Henry my only ever loved one meet again oh, how ineffable how exquisitely delicious. Do push it in more faster beloved of my soul. She clasped me with a hug, as if she would make but one body of us both, and spent with a scream of agonized delight, pouring down and spurting out a perfect torrent of boiling spunk all over my cods and thighs. Dearest, beloved Henry, it is too much, she uttered, and fainted away. I lay quite still, and determined not to speak until she should come to herself. It was evident her dreams had brought back some former loved and happy man and no doubt the fact of my being in possession, in full fuck, had made her believe in the reality of her sleeping thoughts. She was quite a quarter of an hour before recovering her senses, daylight had broken, and she looked round in a sort of alarm, and exclaimed. Where am I? Then her eye catching my face. Oh, my darling Charlie, it is you. I have been dreaming of being far away, and, I suppose, the fact of your dear weapon throbbing within me made me think of former events. Well, the dream had its pleasures, if only in a dream. It was no dream, my dear Miss Franklin, or at least, only partially so, as far as regarded your loved Henry for that was the name you applied to me, and most deliciously did you embrace me under the idea and die away in an excess of pleasure I quite envied, but you alarmed me by really fainting afterwards. I am so pleased to have turned a mere vision of the night into ecstatic reality, and I am not at all jealous of your former lover, because had you not had any, you would, probably, never have loved me. Oh, no. I should never be jealous of you my dear mistress. I would even like to see you in all the ecstasies of passion, in the arms of another, provided that I should share in your delights. She listened in an astonishment, acknowledged that she had imagined herself in the arms of one she had greatly loved, and had thought the whole affair was a dream, and was not conscious of its absolute reality as to her being fucked. Well, I must have mine now, feel how it is bursting for relief. Yes, yes, the dear fellow, push him away my Charlie, and you will see, I shall enjoy the real Charlie quite as much as the dreamt of Henry of whom I shall some day speak to you. You are worthy of him and of me and I fear I shall love you as I do him, far too dearly. Then lending herself to the work we were at, she did, indeed, exert all her lascivious power, and we enjoyed such a fuck as seldom falls to mortals here below. We lay prostrate and panting with satisfied lust, 
until prompted by the urgency of natural wants we were both obliged to rise and relieve ourselves. My darling mistress then used her bidet and told me to lave my parts in the basin, as it was not only cool and refreshing, but also reinvigorating. After which as it was now broad daylight, she allowed me to pose her, and turn her in every position, that I might admire and handle every part of her superb form. Her bottom was larger and harder than any I had yet seen, and, indeed, excepting one, of which, dear reader you will presently hear something, it was about the finest in form and size of any I ever met with. Of course, this handling was not effected without producing erotic excitement in both parties. Miss Franklin had occupied herself as much with me as I had done with her, and her beautifully large clitoris was showing its head in full stand out from among the vast mass of bushy curls surrounding it. I proposed we should have a mutual suck on the floor, with her bottom to the light, that I might have a full view of all her glorious parts. She humored my fancy, and pulling a couple of pillows off the bed to prop up my head, she stepped across my body, and kneeling down, took my prick in her mouth, and brought her splendid backside and lascivious cunt down to my face. I first glued my lips to the open cunt, thrust my chin in, and then my tongue, as far as I could reach, licking the luscious moisture which our previous handlings had excited, it was as sweet and delicious as cream. This stimulated her very much, and she closed the sides of her cunt upon my tongue so closely as to give it a good squeeze. I never saw a woman but her, who had such a wonderful power in that way. My nose actually felt it was reciprocating the pressures of the cunt, so I changed the venue, and slipped my tongue into her bottom hole, evidently to her excessive delight. But things were approaching a crisis, and she cried to me to take her clitoris in my mouth, and substitute fingers in both the other orifices. This I quickly did, while she sucked and postillioned me, handling the root of my prick, and my buttocks with the delicious gentle titillations in which she had such skill, until, in an excess of joy, we both poured a tribute of sperm into each other's mouths, and both greedily swallowed it. After this we got into bed again, to have one loving cuddle before parting. Of course, it ended in raising such a storm of desire as a fuck could only allay she said. My loved Charlie, this must really be the last. I told her it had so excited me to see her splendid bum before my eyes when we were on the floor that I should like to kneel behind and put it in that way. I really meant into her cunt, but she thought I meant her bottom hole, and said. Well, you are a strange boy, what on earth made you think you could put that great big thing of yours into my bottom hole, but, to tell you the truth, after being well fucked, I rather like it that way, so you shall try, but you must be gentle in getting in. I said, I did not know I could do it that way with my prick, I meant to put it into your cunt from behind, but now, from what you say, I should like to try what the other is like. You see, I was keeping up my apparent ignorance. She turned on her face, and keeping her head on the pillow, drew up her knees to her belly and exposed to the greatest advantage her glorious backside. I knelt behind, but previous to beginning, I glued my lips to the delicious orifice, and shoved my tongue in as far as I could, and deliriously excited her. Then approaching my stiff standing prick, and thrusting it into her cunt up to the roots two or three times, so as thoroughly to lubricate it, I withdrew and placed it before the smaller temple of lust, then, by a gentle uniform pressure, I gradually and almost imperceptibly glided into the utmost extent. She pushed her bottom out, and, I could feel, was straining as if to void something, which is the real method to accelerate the entrance of a prick in that enchanting channel with the least difficulty and pain. We then commenced a slow movement she wanted me to stoop forward and place my arm round her body, and frig her clitoris, but I begged her to do it herself, and allow me the luxury of looking on the delightful wriggling of her superb backside, and also the sight of my own prick surging in and then withdrawing. 
She humored me, and we had a most exquisite fuck. Her bottom hole had hardly so tight a pressure as she could exercise with her cunt, but, nevertheless, it held me in very firmly, and had a peculiar heat which was most exciting. We both died off together, she so completely overcome with ecstatic delight that her body sank flat on the bed, drawing me with her, without unsheathing my weapon. We lay for a short period, she convulsively shuddering from time to time with the intense degree of excitement this delicious root had produced upon her. At last she begged me to rise and relieve her. As we must now separate, I rose. She assisted me in my ablutions, put on my nightshirt, conducted me to my bed, fondly kissed and thanked me for the exquisite night of every species of delight I had conferred upon her, promising a repetition the following night. She left me and locked the door of communication, but previously unlocked mine, in case I should oversleep myself. Thus ended the first delightful night I ever passed with that most charming and deliciously lascivious woman the first of many scores that followed, but in none of which were her raptures more intense, if as much. She ever after dwelt on the night when she had been the happy means of initiating me into all love's mysteries, for she never knew of my previous experiences, and always plumed and prided herself on being my first instructress. The next day I was somewhat somnolent, of which you may be sure Miss Franklin took no notice. She retired to her own room when we went for our recreation. My sisters scolded me for not coming to them the previous night, but I told them that Miss F had continued to move about her room for so long a time that I had fallen fast asleep, and even then had not had enough, as they might have observed how sleepy I had been all day. However, to satisfy them, I gamma hutched them both, and fucked them both while each was giving the other a second gamma hutch, so that then each spent three times to my twice. I thus kept in my forces for the renewed delights I anticipated at night. I went to bed early and slept soundly at once, having no anxiety about keeping awake, feeling certain that Miss F would awaken me as soon as she was ready to take me to her arms. She came, and we passed another most delicious night of every salacious and libidinous enjoyment. A third night followed, which differed only in the lascivious proposition of Miss Franklin to deflower my bottom hole with her wonderfully prominent and elongated clitoris, little dreaming that there, too, she had been anticipated by our loved and charming friend McCallum. She had, however, all the imaginary pleasure of first possession. As you may well suppose, I did not attempt in any way to enlighten her ignorance thereon. We had gamma hutched each other, I had fucked her twice in the cunt and once in her bottom hole, when the fancy seized her to bugger me with her clitoris. Of course, I made no objection, on the contrary, sucking it up to a proper stiffness, I placed myself on my hands and knees in the most favorable position to satisfy her erotic fancy. She first slipped her tongue into my bottom hole, then spit upon her clitoris, and then anointed my aperture with the delicious slime of her well-fucked cunt, and then with the utmost ease pushed the dear thing up to its utmost limits. I humored her in every way, wriggling my bottom sideways, which she declared was a vast improvement on her back and forward movements. She passed her arm round my belly, and with that exquisitely delightful touch on my prick for which she was so distinguished, she excited me to the utmost, making my sphincter Ani respond to the throbbings of my exquisitely delighted prick, and equally exciting her lascivious passions with the idea of first possession of that narrow abode of voluptuousness. She could feel by the electric excitement of my prick how near I was to spending, and quickening the action of hand and clitoris. We both died away together in all the raptures that such an extra exciting conjunction could produce. Several nights thus passed in the indulgence of every form of the most lascivious enjoyment. We used to amuse our moments of relaxation in trying who could suggest any new position or varied manner of affecting the delicious junction of our bodies. On one occasion, recurring to the state of excitement her flogging had thrown me into, I asked her, as if I did not know the fact very well already, 
if the application of the rod on the bottom of a woman, or the mere act of being flogged, at all excited her sex. She told me both acted with great force on her erotic nerves. She thought, from experience, that being whipped caused the greatest excitement and produced the greatest longing to be fucked. Then, said I, do you think it had erotically excited my sisters? Certainly, especially your sister Eliza. I do not know whether you noticed her sudden impulse to embrace and kiss me after her return to schoolwork the day I flogged her, that was a stray erotic impulse, and had we been alone, I could not have avoided responding to it in a way that would have delighted her, and initiated her into some of the delicious mysteries of Veneri. Nay, I think, but for my happy discovery of your great and delightful merits, I should have sought for and found an opportunity of being alone with that dear girl, for you must know we can lasciviously embrace our own sex with immense mutual pleasure, and although not equal to that which this noble fellow, taking hold of my prick, inspires, is not without its merit, and even as a little variety from time to time is very enticing. Then, I suppose, you still have some hankerings after the virgin charms of dear Lizzie. I have, and what is more, I believe both Mary's and her passions have already developed themselves. I have sometimes fancied I heard suppressed sighs and gentle movements going on in their beds, and I shrewdly suspect they were practicing masturbation on each other. I did not interfere, and after what has passed between you and me, I will tell you that I had a little plan in my head to let them proceed. To such lengths that when I chose to make the discovery they would be at my mercy. I then could initiate them in every lascivious and voluptuous delight that woman can have with woman. The happy discovery of your excellences, and the perfect facility my change of room has given for meeting without the slightest chance of discovery, has for the present driven that idea out of my head. I am, however, indebted to it for the change of room, as I asked for it solely to leave the two girls the utmost liberty to indulge in their voluptuous mutual enjoyments, certain that it would increase and give them every desire for the further instruction I could impart to them. I suppose you would have fucked them with this dear stiff little thing, said I. Oh, yes, you darling, but you have so excited me talking about it, that you must fuck me directly. We indulged in a most exciting fuck, and when recovered from the confusion of ideas the delightful crisis always produces, we resumed our conversation on the interesting subject of my sisters. I observed that she had not lately flogged them again. All your fault, I am now so satisfied with you that I no longer seek for relief to pent up desires in that way. Tell me, dear Miss Franklin, did flogging my sisters excite you much? It did, even to spending, but the fear of proceeding further with them at that time rendered me ferocious. The very severity I used was as it were in revenge for stopping short of other salacious embraces, but if once I had gone so far as to make them partakers of my lubricity, I should never have flogged them again so severely, but only to such a gentle extent as would raise their passions to an uncomfortable pitch, rendering them slaves to my burning lust. Even now I have, from time to time, a desire to do so, especially with dear Eliza, as I think she had far more of venereal lust in her nature than Mary. You would not object. Dear Charlie, not in the least, if you will only give me the voluptuous satisfaction of hearing all the details from your lips afterwards, it would stimulate us both to additional raptures, and spur our desires to renewed combats. I don't think it wants much to do that, your glorious prick is as hard as iron. It was the lascivious idea of your enjoying Lizzie that made it get up, but I must fuck you again or it will burst. I. Two, my dear boy, am inflamed at the idea, put it in behind this time, I have a great ledge in that way at this moment. I did as I was directed, and so great was the agony of delight when we died away that she sank on the bed dragging me after her, and we lay almost insensible, soaking in bliss for quite half an hour. We did not again renew our conversation that night, but I determined to push her forward to carry out her idea 
and also to give Lizzie a hint to second her wishes in every way, without giving her any idea of what had passed between Lizzie and me, and being equally reserved as to my nightly connection with Miss Frankland. The following night we passed again in all the amatory delights we could imagine. After our deep midnight sleep, which always took place locked in each other's arms, and poor Cocky held firm as if in a vice, I awoke her first, and found my prick stiff standing in her cunt, which was involuntarily pressing it in the delicious interior folds. I began moving gently, until she was so excited as to quite wake up, when she joined me in all the raptures of a delicious and voluptuous fresh morning fuck. We then rose to satisfy natural wants, and cool our excited nerves by a copious ablution. As we were returning to bed, I observed that Miss Franklin took something out of her wardrobe wrapped up in a handkerchief, and placed it under her pillow with a certain air of mystery. I said nothing. After purifying ourselves we always indulged in a voluptuous gamma hutch, after which Miss Franklin generally asked, as a favor, that I should finish off in kilo. I loved her delicious bottom hole too dearly ever to refuse. She placed herself as usual on her knees, thighs well drawn up, and head down, so as to make the most of her glorious backside. After I had followed the usual preamble of thrusting in and out of her luscious and juicy cunt so as to lubricate my prick well, I then introduced it, always with the slow and gradual pressure, until it was sheathed to the hilt, when we generally paused some minutes to reciprocate mutual throbs and pressures. In this lascivious pause I saw her hand steal under the pillow, and draw out the handkerchief and put it under her belly. I shortly found a considerable substance entering her cunt, and making my quarters still more tight and narrow. I began to move, and found the substance in the other entrance keeping time to my movements. I had a tight hold of her projecting clitoris, which I had frigged up to a stiff standing point. I slipped my hand down and found she was dildoing herself with what proved to be a very handsome dildo, in not very formidable proportions. That's right, my darling, I cried, why did you not do it openly, you ought to know that my greatest wish is for you to enjoy these salacious meetings in every possible voluptuous manner, frick on then, my beloved, and be sure that if it adds to your delight it adds to mine. Thank you my darling Charlie, shove away, I am in the seventh heaven of delight in having as good as two pricks working in me at once. She would have explained more, but her words were cut short by the ecstasies the double fuck produced, and she spent copiously before me, on finding which I held back, and was rewarded by making her spend eventually with the utmost excess of delight twice to my once. By this time it was broad daylight, and too late in the morning to enter into any conversation on the new partner in our amatory combats, which was reserved for the next meeting. This did not occur so soon as we expected, for that day Miss Franklin's flowers declared themselves. It was a fortunate thing for me that she had them at the period of the new moon, and as Mary had them at the full, it enabled me to dedicate a night or two to my beloved sisters, who considered I had been neglecting them of late. I said I had not felt very well, and that I began to think that our excessive fucking was becoming too much for me, that they must remember I was one to two, and I felt if I continued to overexert myself I should break down and fail altogether. That would never do, dear Charlie, and it is very true you do twice our work and more, because we don't pour down such a torrent as you do when we spend, you must take care of yourself we will not be so exacting in future, but cool ourselves first by a mutual gamma hutch between Lizzie and me. I thus arranged a certain amount of cessation of fucking in that quarter that I might dedicate the more to the far more exciting powers of the delicious and salacious Miss Franklin. I had always remained in my own bed until I heard her heavy breathing, denoting that she slept, before I dared to leave my own room to go to my sister's. The desire of racking me off, as dear charming Mrs. Benson used to call it, might have seized her, and my absence would have discovered all. However, she had, no doubt, 
considered that it would be all to her advantage that I should be left perfectly quiet to recruit my system, after the heavy drain on my amatory resources which she had kept up for the previous fortnight. She never sought in any way to excite me until a day and a night after the cessation of her menses. She told me it was much better to have done with it entirely at once, rather than by erotic excitement keep up the discharge for a week or more. And it is not, my dear Charlie, from any want of randy lust on my part, for, especially at first, there is an extreme desire to be well labored by the biggest prick one could find in existence, the natural irritation of the parts seem to be increased by the way in which the sensual system is affected in that quarter. Former experience has taught me that it is much better to bear this, than by seeking for erotic excitement to keep up the natural discharge for twice as long as it would otherwise endure. Besides which, there would have been a danger of affecting your dear health. Sometimes conjunctions, at such a period, produce a urethral irritation very prejudicial to a man, and such as might deprive me of the delight of your embraces for some weeks. So you see, my own beloved boy, that in every way it is prudent to avoid any amorous excitement at such a period, however hard nature may press for venereal relief. Some women hazard all this, and for a momentary gratification, run risks perfectly unwarrantable, not only for themselves, but above all for their lovers. I, too, my darling, have had my day of imprudence, and knowing the result, I should be both cruel and stupidly insensate to let you run the risk of what already occurred. As she recounted those sage counsels, I could not but remember my loved Mrs. Benson, whose advice had been of such service to me, and here was another loved mistress instructing me in further matters connected with the sex. It certainly was a stroke of great good fortune for me to have met at so early an age two such admirable women, not only most amorous and lascivious, but instructing me in the real knowledge of their sex, and the world, at the very time that they were indulging my every lascivious desire, as well as their own. Mistresses of their art, no mystery in love's catalogue of excitements, and of means of gratifying the same, was unknown to them. But they knew, too, how to inculcate wisdom for future conduct. I owe every amatory success of my afterlife to the admirable teachings of these two charming and estimable women. The next night, after we had sacrificed sufficiently often to Venus to enable us more calmly to resume the delightful discussion on the various ways of pampering and exciting the passions, I turned the conversation on flogging, for to take you, dear reader, into my confidence, I was seized with an uncontrollable ledge to flog the superb bottom of my loved mistress. I had often seen it palpitating under the vigorous attacks of my stiff standing pico, while belaboring either of the delicious entrances to the temples of lust. I had often given her glorious bottom good sound slaps of the hand, but I longed to apply to it in earnest a good birch rod, see it flush to a raw meat hue and then to shove my prick with the utmost force into either or both of the delicious orifices. I thought the best way of arriving at this desired object was to recur to her own description of a less severe flogging exciting the passions with pain, and as she had also admitted that it excited her equally to be flogger or flagee, I proposed that she should exercise a gentle discipline on my bottom, to try its efficacy. She jumped at the idea, but there was no rod in her room perforce the ceremony was put off until the next night. On that occasion, she advised me first to indulge in every excess of lubricity, and when nature should begin to flag, then the real efficacy of the rod would be experienced. She aided me with the utmost skill in every act of most voluptuous and luxurious venery, and we mutually poured down six tributes to our blessed mother Venus, with very little cessation for we both wished to feel somewhat exhausted, before trying the effects of the birching system. We lay quiet for a short time, and then dear Miss Franklin began exciting me, but only in an ordinary way. My prick had already been too well satiated with the previous encounters to respond at once to the calls made on it. Ah, said she, in her sweetest way, I see we want the rod here. 
Prepare yourself, sir, and take care to make no resistance, or it will be the worse for your bottom. Following her cue, I began to implore pity, to promise I would behave better in short time, etc., etc. But she was inexorable, and ordered me to lie across her knees. Then, taking me round the waist, she gave a smart cut or two, really sharp, that made me for the moment win CE. Take care, sir, you are resisting, and you know your punishment will be severe, if you so continue. Forgive me, mistress dear, and I will never do so again. We shall see. Cut 3, sharp, though not so severe. I did not flinch. Ah, that is something like a good boy, now we shall have no difficulty. She began a series of less and less severe blows, until it ended in a gentle irritable titillation which very shortly began to show its effects by the stiffness of my pigo fiercely shoving against the naked thigh of my loved castigator, who, passing a hand round my body, laid hold of it, delighted to find how efficacious her proceedings had been. Pretending to be quite exhausted, she sank back on the bed, and said she could do no more. I sprang upon her, and we had two more coups without withdrawing, with the greatest excess of voluptuousness. It was now my turn, and as she let me slip out of her delicious cunt, I took that up as a cause of dissatisfaction. What, you naughty girl, I cried, is that the way you treat your master, bundling him out of his room in that manner, here, give me the rod, I must make your bottom pay for your ill conduct here kneel on this footstool, and lay your body over my thighs, no resistance, or it will be the worse for you. Oh, pray, sir, do forgive me this time, and she knelt at my side, and pretended to cry. I forced her down, and she presented her glorious backside, in all its splendor of rotundity and size, before my delighted gaze. I seized her round the waist and first gloated my sight with all the full and lascivious charms, not only displayed, but in my power, and I armed with a splendid rod. I gave her two or three sharp cuts, which made her beauteous buttocks wriggle, but called forth no remonstrances, but as I continued, in all the rage of lust the exercise excited, to flog away most severely, she begged me to be somewhat more gentle. But I flogged on with increased vigor, until she began to writhe under the severity of the punishment I was inflicting. She struggled fiercely, at last, to be free, but she was completely in my power, and I did not spare her until I saw that, changing from severe pain, her feelings were turning to a storm of lechery and lust. She became frantic with excitement, and screamed out, Cease, darling Charlie, and fuck me directly. I am dying for it. I threw down the rod, jumped on the bed, and drew up her loins, so that she was placed in a kneeling position, she herself seized my bursting prick, and carried it to the lips of her cunt, where he instantly engulfed himself to the hilt. Her movements became lascivious beyond expression, and were urged with a vigor, which brought down in a very short time a torrent of sperm from both of us. We were too much excited to stop short, and almost without a pause, a second course was run still more voluptuously. She was not even then satisfied, but making me lie on my back, she reversed herself upon me, and we commenced a mutual gamma hutch. I succeeded in making her spend again, and she was able to bring my pigo up to a standing point. Now, Charlie, dear, we must finish off behind. So getting again on her hands and knees, she guided my willing prick to the narrower abode of felicity. After first steeping it for a moment in the moisture of her foaming and reeking cunt, I thrust it into her bottom hole. I seized hold of her clitoris, she had her dildo already, and working it herself with one hand, we ran a last course of most lustful and lecherous enjoyment, which ended in such killing raptures that we both sank all but insensible on the bed. Exhausted as we were by the wild excesses we had indulged in, we fell, 
without moving or regaining our senses, into a deep and profound slumber, until almost too late in the morning, so that I had to regain my room the moment we awoke, without attempting any further amorous toyings. Thus ended my first experiences as a flogger. The sensation was so new, and the temptation to lay on with a vengeance was so great, that I had gone beyond all reasonable bounds in inflicting such a severe punishment on the glorious bum of my beloved Miss Franklin. I must, however, do her the justice to say that she comprehended and excused the feelings under which I acted, only begging me, on any future occasion not to let them carry me away so far as they had done on this. We several times renewed this bum flogging, but with more moderate inflictions sufficient to highly excite without actually punishing the patient, whichever of us it might be. We often after this made flogging the theme of our discussions, and I gradually led on to the idea she had expressed of Lizzie's evidently amorous disposition. She still affirmed that such was her conviction. I then suggested that it would be worth her while to try and gratify it, as well for Lizzie's sake as for the satisfaction of her own ledge in that way. I suppose you could easily find a pretext if you desired to do so. Yes, easily enough, the idea excites me, and I shall indulge it. I do not remember what the pretext was, but Lizzie was kept in next afternoon at four o'clock Mary and I proceeded to the summer house. I knew we should not be interrupted by Lizzie, and that I need not hold in for her satisfaction. So I gave Mary all the benefit of our being alone, and we had four most exquisite and refined indulgencies in every attitude admitted of by the legitimate entrance to love's temple. For, as yet, I had never been able to gain an entrance to the narrower orifice, which was too small for my formidable weapon to penetrate. It is odd how easily Lizzie accommodated me in her delicious bottom hole, while Mary, older and more womanly in form, was as yet unable to make room for me in that straight path of bliss. When night came I was all curiosity to know how my dear mistress had carried on matters with Lizzie. She told me that Lizzie had been somewhat nervous at first, but she had spoken kindly to her, told her how her amiable and loving conduct after her first whipping had won her affection, that she did not mean to be so severe as on the former occasion, but that discipline must be kept up. So come, my dear girl, drop off your frock, as I shall mine, that the bundle of clothes may be out of the way, as well as to avoid their being creased. Seeing that Lizzie still trembled a little after she had dropped her gown, she took her in her arms, and kissing her lovingly, desired her not to be afraid she would not punish her much. Lift up all your things, my dear and let me see if any marks of the former punishment remain. Lizzie had a very prominent and very promising bottom. Miss Franklin felt it all over, and admired loudly its form and firmness, declaring it was quite beautiful to look at it, and how womanly it was growing. Turn round, and let me see if you are as womanly in front. Upon my word, a well-formed mount with a charming mossy covering. Her hand wandering over her form excited Lizzie, whose face flushed and eyes glistened with rising desires. Miss Franklin herself became moved, but proceeded at once to lay her across her lap, and began with gentle switches, just sufficiently sharp to attract the blood in that direction, which, of course, acted with double force on all the already excited erotic organs and Lizzie began to wriggle her bum in all the lasciviousness of lust under the excited gaze of Miss Franklin, who, seeing how matters were going on in her favor, increased the force of her blows, but only sufficiently to still more lecherously excite her patient until, driven to an excess of lust, she cried out, Oh, my loved Miss Franklin, I am dying with pleasure, do embrace and caress me. Miss Franklin lifted her up, and drew her to her bosom and lips, and, while sucking her tongue, slipped her hand down and found Lizzie's quim wet with her flowing spunk, and her little clitoris stiff with the erotic passion that was consuming her. She frigged her until she spent again, while their tongues were in each other's mouth. As Lizzie spent, 
Miss F. shoved a finger up her cunt, which, of course, met with no resistance, but as Lizzie possessed in perfection the art of nipping, she was sufficiently tight to leave a doubt of anything but finger fucking. Ah, you little puss, you have been playing with this before now, tell me the truth. I will tell you everything, if you will only play with me again. Ever since you flocked Mary and myself, we have both been so often burning down there, and have found out that feeling it, and pushing fingers in, was so nice, although at first we often hurt ourselves. But you do it so much better than Mary oh, do, do it again, dear Miss Franklin. I shall do it much better, my darling, with what I have got down there look here. And, lifting up her petticoat and chemise, she exposed, to the absolute astonishment of Lizzie, her extraordinary mass of hair, and her fiery red clitoris glowing and sticking out of its black mass of curls. How beautiful, cried Lizzie. I declare, you have got a doodle, for which I have been so longing, I must kiss it. Stooping down, she took it in her mouth, and sucked it. Stop, dear Lizzie, we shall both enjoy it. Taking the cushion from the chair, she lay down on her back on the floor, telling Lizzie to turn her face the other way, and to kneel down across her body, so that both their mouths could adapt themselves to each other's quim. Lizzie told me afterwards that she took care to show no previous knowledge, but to let Miss Franklin apparently initiate her into all the ceremonies of gamma hutching. Miss Franklin glued her lips to dear Lizzie's charming quim, while Lizzie took her extraordinary clitoris into her mouth. After a few ardent caresses Miss Franklin pushed a finger up Lizzie's bottom hole, then paused an instant to tell Lizzie not only to follow her example in that respect, but to use her other hand in her quim while sucking her clitoris. Then, both adapting themselves as prescribed, they gamma hutched on, until both could no longer move from the excessive raptures produced by their profuse discharge. After this first bout Lizzie became curious to see all the wonderful hair-covered organ and limbs of Miss Franklin, who gratified her to the utmost extent of her wishes. Nor did she leave this inspection entirely to Lizzie, but reciprocated it. Undoing her dress above, she uncovered the charming budding beauties of Lizzie's bubbies, and began sucking the nipples. Their mutual caresses and handlings very quickly refired these hot and lecherous women. After a little renewed gamma hutching, until both were wild with excitement, Miss Franklin proposed to put her clitoris into Lizzie's quim, told her to kneel down, and kneeling behind her, she sheathed it with ease in the hot and juicy folds of Lizzie's beautiful cunt. Passing her hand under Lizzie's belly, she frigged her clitoris until again nature gave down her delicious tribute, and they sank in all the voluptuous languor that follows. A third time they renewed their salacious and lascivious raptures, then resumed their dresses so as to be ready to receive us. Miss Franklin begged Lizzie to keep her counsel and not reveal, even to Mary, what had passed. But Lizzie urged Miss F to admit Mary into the new mysteries she had just herself been taught, and said she could assure her that Mary had a far more beautiful body than hers, and would like it quite as well as she did. Well. My dear, I shall think of it, and find an occasion to flog her, as I have done you. Oh, that will be jolly, cried Lizzie. She will like it just as much as I do, it is so nice, you must flog me every day, dear Miss Franklin. I loved you from the first, I adore you now. They embraced most lovingly, but our return put an end for the present to any further conversation. These details were accompanied and interrupted by two or three delicious and most voluptuous fucks, without once withdrawing my burning prick from her equally heated and throbbing cunt for her description of these proceedings was most exciting. When she had finished, I withdrew, that we might gamma hutch each other, and lick up all the delicious spunk in which her juicy cunt abounded. We then renewed our combats, sacrificing to Holy Mother Venus in both orifices. Then we slept as only easy-conscienced people like ourselves could sleep, and, 
like giants refreshed by slumber, renewed our devotions on every altar before separating in the morning. Two days later Mary was initiated by Miss Franklin in a like manner to Lizzie, while Lizzie and I made the most of our time in the summer house. Excited by her naive description of her scene with Miss Franklin, we indulged in every salacious device that we could cram into the hour's absence, which, by the way, we lengthened out by more than a quarter of an hour, for which Miss Franklin thanked me at night. Her scene with Mary had been one of even greater lubricity, in consequence of Mary at once lending herself to everything, and acknowledging that she knew from Lizzie what she had to expect. Besides, Mary's more developed form and something about her greatly excited Miss F, and she was quite amorous upon her. She had done so much in the way of spending, that after I had gama hutched and fucked her two entrances three times, she required the stimulus of the rod to bring her up to the highest point of lascivious lubricity. And, to tell the truth, I afterwards required and received it myself. Thus our voluptuous passions acted one on the other, and we passed an exhausting night in every excess and refinement of veneery, in which Miss Franklin's dildos, for she had two, of different sizes, played no small part in both our persons. Now that the ice was broken, I easily persuaded Miss F to have occasionally first one and then the other of my sisters to sleep with her, alleging that an occasional early night's rest would recruit my powers, and that when she dismissed her bedfellow in the morning, I could finish her off in force, she could thus initiate them in mutual floggings, and in the use of dildo. Of course, I need not say that my ultimate object was to succeed in our making it a general orgy. In this indeed it ended, but not exactly as I had intended. That mattered not, as long as the desired object was attained. I had the delightful opportunity, too, of watching through my peephole many of the delicious scenes of lubricity enacted, and when driven to the fiercest excess of passion, I used to withdraw, steal up to the unoccupied sister, and vent my raging lust in every indulgence with her. This had been carried on for about a fortnight, one or other of the girls sleeping every other night with Miss Franklin. Lizzie, it appeared, had often professed to long to see a real cock, and had managed to worm out of Miss F that she had enjoyment of mine. The little hussy importuned Miss F to let her see me fucking her, saying that she could easily hide behind the curtains, and I would never know. Miss F, whose passions were at the utmost tension of desire, consented, and placing Lizzie where she could see without being seen, opened my door, but found an empty bed. She at first suspected that I had gone to one of the female servants, but thought she would make sure and see if Mary was not the object. So she stole softly upstairs, and found us in the act of enjoying a double gamma hutch, which as it was early morning light, she could see without difficulty. She had the kindness to let us enjoy it to the end, and then dragging me off, said. Oh. Charles. This is dreadful. Why could you not be content with me, have I ever refused you? Do you know this would be the ruin of all of us if ever it should become known? You are too young to know the dreadful consequences of discovery. Here she burst out in a torrent of tears it was evident from real fear of the sad results that might ensue, and not from any feeling of jealousy. I threw myself into her arms and as she had herself acknowledged our intimacy, I had less difficulty in alluding to it. I caressed and fondled her, and told her there was no fear of discovery less now than ever as we would be all interested alike in keeping our secret, she would cover my intimacy with my sisters, and they would cover my intimacy with her. All at once she said, How long has this been going on, tell me truly? I had long prepared myself for such a question, and at once replied that after the description of the libidinous scenes that had taken place between her and them, and her exquisite account of their young charms, I got so lecherous upon them that I had sought Mary out while she was engaged with Lizzie, and Lizzie when Mary was with her, they were both too much delighted to refuse me anything, 
and we had now enjoyed each other about a dozen times. I had previously told my sisters to support any story I might recount to Miss F. Lizzie had stolen up after she found Miss Franklin had passed through my room, and now both confirmed the tale told. We surrounded Miss Franklin, caressing her in every way. My Pico got terribly excited. Drawing up my nightshirt, I said. Let this dear fellow make peace between us, and become equally dear to all. I know, my loved mistress, that my sisters are longing to see him exercised on your glorious person, and buried in your delicious hairy cunt, so let me offer up sacrifice to its juicy charms. Lizzie has just said you sought me for the purpose see, the dear clitoris is raising its head let Mary lie down under you to suck your clitoris, and see my prick close above her eyes in vigorous action filling your exquisite cunt. You can gama hutch her and Lizzie can look on behind, witness the glorious sight, and act postillion to my bottom hole. Well, my beloved children, the die is cast, it is no use crying after spilt milk, so let us make the best of it. I never could resist the eloquent look of this loved and long thick thing, that was made for giving poor woman all she could crave for. So arranging our relative positions as I had prescribed, we ran a course of the most luxurious and salacious enjoyment imaginable. Lizzie, who had taken possession of one of the dildos, manipulated herself, while watching every voluptuous movement of our bodies, and we all managed to spend most rapturously together. We could not afford to do more at that moment, as time was creeping on, and the household would soon be astir. Miss Franklin regained with me my room, her own door being locked, and kissing me tenderly, said I was a bad boy, but she supposed it must eventually have come to this, so it was well it was sooner than later. Thus passed our first general orgy, which was the precursor of many much more luxuriously and salaciously libidinous, and which I shall more minutely describe as events progress. Miss Franklin would not allow us to have a general orgy the next night. She was now aware of our summer house doings only of late begun, as she supposed for my story had been too plausibly offhand not to deceive her, especially as she had felt convinced by all that occurred on our first fucking that she had had the delightful pleasure of taking my maiden head. She was quite satisfied on that head. But she now suspected that what I had just begun I should be too glad to repeat. She accompanied us to the garden in our recreation hour, so that nothing erotic took place. We sat down all together after a little running about, and Miss F opened to us a rule of conduct we must in future pursue. She said, However delightful it would be for you all, as well as for myself, to meet every night, it would in the first instance become a dangerous habit, dangerous because of engendering carelessness in the necessary precautions against discovery, and next, and above all, because it would be the destruction of our loved and darling Charlie, who could not possibly long continue such excessive venery as three loved objects at once would constantly require of him. Seeing my inclination to interrupt her, and declare that I felt quite equal to it, she stopped me and told us I was too young to know what such excessive indulgence would lead to, that we must trust to her experience and be guided by her, and we should all find the advantage of it. Three times a week was the utmost she could allow, when we should be all together. The other nights she would take care that I committed no excess. Such were the sage counsels of this admirable woman, and such in future became the program of our proceedings. I rebelled and kicked against what I thought at the time too great a restriction, but I eventually became convinced that greater pleasure followed the enforced delays. Of course I slept with Miss Franklin on what might be called our off nights, but she soon established a custom of restraining my spendings to twice a night, allowing me to excite and make her spend as often as I pleased. I was difficult to manage at first but eventually settled down in great regularity to the rules she dictated, and, indeed, enforced. I soon found out the wisdom of her proceeding,
for often afterwards my lagging efforts required the spur of the rod to be applied in earnest for the completion of our orgies. The second night after the discovery of my intercourse with my sisters was the first of meeting all four together, in Miss Franklin's room. We had been sent, as usual, early to bed, and Miss F had privately recommended us to go quietly to sleep as soon as possible, and not to be under any anxiety, as she herself would go for the girls, after all the household had retired. As for me, it was the plan I had always adopted, as it enabled me to reap the greater amount of enjoyment, and its longer continuance, by the rest I had previously secured. Winter had passed away, and summer came round again. It was a lovely, warm, moonlight night. As soon as we were all assembled, stripping to the buff was the order of the night, then followed charming embraces and mutual posings, so as each should admire the beauties of all. Hands wandered everywhere over every charm, chiefly concentrating on the wonderful and finely developed form of the fascinating Franklin, whose richness of coal-black hair was so deliciously exciting. It soon became necessary to calm the first effervescence of our passions, which we always did by a general gamma hutch. Miss Franklin, who had taken an extraordinary ledge for Mary, paired off with her, while Lizzie and I accommodated each other. Miss Franklin, who had provided herself with a store of dildos, furnished us all with one, differing in size, according to the intention of their application. As Mary's bottom hole as yet could only accommodate a moderate size, Miss F kept the smallest for her particular use, the others were indiscriminately used. Thus armed, we proceeded to enter on all the voluptuous excesses of gamma hutching in every form, lengthening out our pleasures as much and as long as possible, that we might pass the whole night in the most libidinous raptures. When the ecstatic moment overtook us, our mouths had to cease their operations to give vent to the expressions of the rapturous nature of our feelings. We lay panting for some time before being able to rise and resume our mutual caresses. Now that we had taken off the edge of our lustful appetite, we prepared more calmly for further and more voluptuous combinations. The upper coverings of the bed were entirely removed, so that it presented nearly a square field of combat for love's encounters, admirably adapted for its purpose. We held a council as to our next movements, and finally decided to begin as follows, Mary to lie down on her back, Lizzie reversed above her, Miss Franklin was to indulge in her ledge for Lizzie, which was that of fucking her bottom hole with her extraordinary clitoris, while I was to fuck Miss Franklin's cunt, and postillion her smaller orifice with two fingers, Lizzie was to postillion Mary with her finger, while Gamma hutching her, Mary to apply the smaller dildo to my bottom hole, and Frigg. Lizzie's cunt with a larger one. It was also agreed we should run two courses in this voluptuous group, varying only in the substitution of my prick in Miss Franklin's bottom hole, instead of her cunt, in which was to be placed one of the dildos. We were none of us to press matters to a speedy termination, but to make the most of the exquisite conjunction of our parts. We enjoyed a most salacious and voluptuous fuck, and so managed matters as all should spend together in perfect raptures of lubricity and lust. Notwithstanding the pleasure of the final discharge, we managed, as previously agreed, to hold our mutual positions, our parts palpitating with repeated throbbings on or in the delicious quarters with which they were conjoined. These soon reawakened our passions, which we as yet had done but little to calm, and when sufficiently heated, the slight change agreed upon was effected, and I plunged up to the hilt in the glorious and hairy bottom hole of the divine Franklin, who gave almost a scream of delight as she felt my huge pico rushing up into her burning entrails. We had to pause some minutes to allow her excitement to subside to a certain extent, or she would have discharged after two or three thrusts of my potent weapon. We then proceeded more leisurely, and after drawing out our enjoyment in the most salacious and voluptuous manner, the ecstatic moment seized us all together, with such an excess of wild enjoyment that with screams of almost agonized delight, 
we poured into or upon each other whole torrents of hot boiling sperm, and sank almost insensible into a confused heap of naked forms. We were a long time in recovering our senses. Then disentangling ourselves, we rose and laved our parts in cold water, not only to purify ourselves, but as a stimulant to further exertions in all the wildest excesses of lubricity that any of us could fancy. But we always managed so as to make Miss F think that she was the author of any new salacious idea or suggestion. In fact she nearly was so in every case, for her experience in every ledge, and its gratification in every form of libidinous refinement, was great and we owed to her many new and delicious combinations in our salacious orgies. After partaking of wine and cake, which Miss F had taken care to secure, we indulged in some delicious rumping and pulling about of the rich curls and hairy coverings of nearly all Miss Franklin's superb form. The girls above all admired the magnitude, hardness, and beauty of her truly magnificent buttocks, and what with one now and then sucking her bubbies, and at other times toying with her already standing clitoris, we soon brought her to such a state of excitement that, seizing hold of Mary, she got her on the table and Gama hutched her, while Lizzie, creeping under, sucked her clitoris, and I pushed my prick from behind into her cunt. We brought on a delicious spend, and the glorious creature died away in excess of pleasure along with Mary, while I had not yet arrived at the climax. So I contented myself with making my prick throb to her delicious squeezings, until the fatigue of the position required us to break up the pose. She was so far calmed that she could now propose and discuss after proceedings, and what our next form of enjoyment should be. As Mary had had an extra spend with Miss Franklin, Lizzie was now placed on her knees, with her head well down. I thrust my prick into her longing cunt. Miss Franklin standing up, strode across Lizzie's body in front of me, here I introduced first a smaller dildo up her bottom hole and then a larger one up her cunt, both up to the cod pieces. She then pushed forward her belly and put her stiff standing clitoris into my mouth and placed her two hands on my head. I then passed one hand under her open legs, and seizing both dildos in one hand, proceeded to work them up and down both holes at once, in unison with my suction of her clitoris, and my fucking movements in Lizzie's cunt, who at the same time was frigging her own clitoris with her fingers. Mary, armed with two dildos, applied one to my bottom hole, while she fucked herself with the other. In this way we ran a most exciting and delicious course. Miss F, in the ecstatic moments, seemed as if she would have pressed my head into her belly. She was so charmed with the voluptuous delights this pose had given that she cried out we must not change until another course was run. Lizzie said she must change from front to back, and begged Mary to hand her a dildo with which she might frig herself. The women were ready directly but my pigo was longer in answering the call, so Miss Franklin told Mary to apply the birch rod skillfully. This she did with great art, working the dildo, which was still in her cunt while so occupied. The effect was almost electrical, and my glorious rampant prick filled dear Lizzie's delicious and longing bottom hole to her utmost delight. Miss F begged Mary to give her a gentle stimulus with the rod, Nothing could better have pleased Mary, for she afterwards admitted she had long had the greatest ledge to flog that glorious and immense backside. With such stimulants as these this course proved one of the most salacious and voluptuous we had yet had, and the ecstatic ending was accompanied with screams of delight, as we died away in the death-like swoon of rapturous and satiated desires. We again rose to purify and refresh ourselves and for some time after lay closely embraced on the bed. As Mary had not yet had my prick in her cunt, Miss F proposed that I should fuck her, that Lizzie should kneel close behind us, she could fuck Lizzie's bottom hole with her clitoris, and work one dildo up my bottom, while she worked a second in her own. No sooner said that done. Lizzie's head was shoved almost below Mary's belly, so as to bring Miss F close enough to me to operate as she desired, 
and we ran another delicious course with such extreme pleasure that all sank sideways down on the bed and dropped into a sound slumber. We did not awaken until so late that we only had time to lave ourselves in cold water, finish off with a general gamma hutch, and then regain our separate rooms. On this last occasion Miss Franklin said she must gamma hutch me, as she delighted to break her fast on cream. The joke amused the two girls amazingly. It was about this time Mrs. Vincent gave birth to a fine boy. I have not spoken of her since our first interview after her marriage in the summer house, when all had gone into the town to bring out Miss Franklin. We had only had two stolen interviews since that time, which I have not mentioned, because they were too hasty, and with too little comfort to have been thoroughly enjoyed, then she became too heavy with child to afford me any further opportunity. Mama wrote a congratulating letter to Mr. Vincent, wishing him joy of the advent of a son and heir, little dreaming that her own son was the father thereof. This brought a visit from Mr. Vincent to beg that Mama would kindly become godmother to the little fellow. My mother at once assented, and asked who the godfathers were. He said an uncle, from whom they had expectations, had consented to be one but he was at a loss to know whom to ask a second. Why not ask Charlie, he was always very fond of your wife as his governess, and he, too, has an uncle from whom we hope someday to receive something handsome. That is a very good idea of yours, Mrs. Roberts, and if you will kindly send for Charles the first shall put it to him, and if he consents, it saves me all further trouble. I was sent for, and, you may be sure, accepted immediately, thanking Mr. Vincent for the honor he did me, and hoping that Mrs. Vincent would be equally agreeable that I should be godfather, although so young. Leave that to me, my dear wife is so much attached to me that my wish is her law, so do not make yourself uneasy on that head. It may well be supposed I was not at all uneasy but quite certain that it was the very thing Mrs. V would have proposed if she had not been withheld by prudence. We heard afterwards from Mr. V that she had simulated objections on account of my youth, but the very first moment she could say a word to me in private it was to tell me what delight it had given her that her husband should have fulfilled in the matter the very wish nearest and dearest to her heart. The ceremony eventually came off as had been proposed but it was at very rare intervals that I could find an opportunity of renewing our old combats in the field of Venus. Meanwhile I had no reason to regret this as far as indulgence of my erotic passions went, because, for nearly two years, that is until I had passed my 18th birthday, I continued to enjoy uninterrupted bliss in the arms of the luxurious and fascinating Miss Franklin, or in orgies with her and my sisters which culminated in every excess of venery capable of being enjoyed by three women and one youth. In fact, we all indulged rather too freely, if I may judge from the fact that, at least to Miss Franklin and myself, the rod had almost become a necessity, and occasionally even my sisters admitted it gave them a fill-up. Under the able tutorship of Miss Franklin we became the most perfect adepts in every voluptuous indulgence of lubricity. But I must also give her the credit of never neglecting our education. Indeed, I may say it gained by the intimate union of our bodies. For that estimable woman impressed upon us that to keep her friendship and confidence we must do justice to her teaching. I have already said her system of instruction was very superior to anything we had previously known, and now that she had won our unbounded love and affection, there was nothing we were not ready to do in school to second her efforts for our mutual improvement. She had very superior attainments spoke French and German like a native, had sufficient knowledge of Latin and Greek to ground me well in them, and her knowledge of music was very superior. I have hardly ever heard anyone with a more charming touch on the piano. In the two years that followed our first orgy we made really astonishing progress. We all spoke French very fairly, had a pretty good knowledge of German, especially Mary, who really spoke it well, as for myself I was well up in French, fairly so in German, and with a very good groundwork of Latin and Greek. 
It was about this time that an event happened which completely changed the order of my life. My mother had hinted that I had some expectations from an uncle. These were very vague. He was my father's brother, but they had never agreed, and we were almost strangers to each other. He died, and one day we were all surprised, not to say delighted, to hear from his executor, a Mr. Nixon, a rich merchant in London, that my uncle had left my mother £400 a year as long as she did not marry again, but at her death the said annuity was to be divided between my two sisters, independent of any coverture. The residue and bulk of the property was settled on me, under trust to Mr. Nixon until I was of age, with a request that I should be brought up to the law and entered as a barrister in the inner temple. Further, a sum of £500 was allowed for a new outfit, in every way becoming to all of us. Mr. Nixon announced that in a fortnight he would take the opportunity of being in our neighborhood to come over and make the necessary arrangements consequent upon the altered state of affairs. He added that the residue of the property would yield about £1,000 a year, and that, therefore, my education must be looked to more closely than it probably had been. Here was, indeed, a change. My father had left the house and grounds, and something like £600 a year in the funds, entirely to my mother as long as she remained a widow, or until her death. Afterwards £150 per annum to each of my sisters, and the house and residue to me a moderate income requiring other efforts to make it comfortable to one's upbringing. Here I was now the heir eventually to something like £1,500 a year, two country houses, and a very fair house besides attached to my uncle's house. You may easily imagine the joy of the whole family when from somewhat pinched economy, we found ourselves in easy circumstances, with at once quite double our previous income. We indulged in somewhat wild dreams of what all this might produce, but Mama brought us to our senses by informing us that until I was of age Mr. Nixon would entirely control our destinies, and that it was more than probable he would insist upon sending me to a public school. This news dashed all our hopes to pieces with a vengeance, because it was precisely on our greater freedom that we had been counting, and now there was every probability our delightful intercourse and delicious orgies would come to an abrupt termination. We exchanged sad and crestfallen looks on hearing this from Mama, and met in a very disconsolate humor that night in Miss Franklin's room, but that charming and estimable woman cheered us up with the hope that if a temporary separation did occur, it would only lead to our safer and more perfect reunion hereafter. And, to tell you the truth, she said, my dear Charlie, we have been of late too much for you, and your health and constitution will benefit by a forced inactivity, for I have observed some symptoms about you lately that prove we three have taxed you too hard. I have no doubt I shall be retained as governess to your sisters, and leave me alone to keep them to a point that will not disappoint you when we meet again, which must always occur at intervals of not longer than six months. To our loving minds six months seemed an age. At the same time Miss F.S. remarks had, to a certain extent, reassured us, and although we could not enter into our orgy with the usual fury and ledge, nevertheless we managed to pass a night sufficiently rapturous in the enjoyment of our libidinous passions, which many would have thought excessive. In due course Mr. Nixon made his appearance. He was a pleasant-looking elderly gentleman, and a complete man of the world. Finding that I had been educated entirely at home under governesses, he fancied I must be a milk and watery ignorant youth, and had already hinted as much to Mama who, having told me, put me on my mettle. Mr. Nixon sent for me into the parlor alone, and began an agreeable conversation apparently leading to nothing, probably with a view not to render me nervous and timid, gradually turning the conversation upon educational subjects. He was agreeably surprised to find the progress I had made, not only in historical and geographical subjects, but in languages, and above all was surprised at my knowledge of Latin and Greek. He was particular in asking if some clergyman had not lent his aid to the governess. After dinner, 
during which he paid great attention to Miss Frankland, he warmly complimented her on her system of teaching and its extraordinary success. At the same time he observed that, as his dear old friend had desired that his nephew should become a barrister, it would be necessary he should be sent to some clergyman taking a few boys, and then to King's College, London, before entering a barrister's chambers. Miss Frankland at once admitted the justice of the remark, and hoped that Charles would not shame her teaching. Quite the contrary, I assure you, Miss Frankland. I have been struck with the admirable groundwork you have established, and especially the advantages you have given him of the knowledge of modern languages. I am so much pleased that I intend to beg of Mrs. Roberts to keep you as the able governess of the girls until they are so much older as to require a little knowledge of the world which a metropolitan ladies' school is sure to impart. All this was said with a certain deference of manner to Miss Frankland, that I felt certain the old gentleman was greatly struck with her person, as well as her system of teaching. But of this it is probable my readers will learn more hereafter. My mother, hearing of the intention of sending me to some clergyman, immediately suggested that her own brother-in-law, the Reverend Mr. Brownlow, rector of Leeds, in Kent, a retired village close to the castle of that name, would be a suitable person. He was a gentleman who had taken honors at Cambridge, and was in the habit of receiving one, two, or even three young gentlemen, but never more, to prepare them for the universities. At that moment she knew by a letter from her sister that he had a vacancy. His name, she said, stood high as an instructor, as Mr. Nixon would find on inquiry, and as Charles had never been away from home, it would be a great satisfaction to her to know that he was under the care of her own sister. Mr. Nixon said he perfectly agreed to her suggestion, provided, as to which he had no doubt, his inquiries justified his sending me there. He left us with a promise of an early decision, and, indeed, before the week had passed we received his full concurrence to my mother's suggestion. So my aunt was written to, and it being the period of the holidays, Mr. and Mrs. Brownlow were asked to come over and spend a week, and then I could return with them to Kent. We had not seen aunt or uncle since we were little children, and only remembered her as a very tall immense person. The distance had prevented personal intercourse, and we only knew of them by interchanges of hams, canterbury brawn, and oysters at Christmas time. As they replied by return of post, saying they would be with us in two or three days following their letter, you may be sure Miss Frankland and all of us made the most of what was to be the last of our mutual orgies for the time. No restrictions were put upon us, and every Night was dedicated to the god of lust and voluptuousness. At last the fatal day arrived. My mother and the two girls went into the town to fetch uncle and aunt out, leaving Miss Frankland and me to our studies. You may well suppose it was the prosody of love and not that of grammar that occupied us. There was a tenderness of manner, and a loving kindness and fondling, which I had not before observed in Miss Frankland and which I should have thought alien to her character. Embracing me tenderly, and pressing me lovingly to her bosom, she burst into a flood of tears, and sobbed as if her heart would break as her head sank on my shoulder. I tried to comfort her in the best way I could, and as my kind reader knows, a woman's tears always had a most potent effect on my prick, I placed it in her hand, she hysterically laughed amidst her crying, but instantly sank her head down to the loved object, embraced, sucked, and frigged it until I poured a flood of boiling sperm into her mouth, which she greedily swallowed, and continued sucking until not a drop was left. Then rising once more to caress and embrace me, she said, Yes, my own beloved boy, that was indeed a means to stop my tears, I not only adore it, but have come to love you, my darling, more than I ever loved anything in my life you are my own scholar, bodily and mentally. I shall miss you greatly, and I bitterly regret our parting, but we shall meet again, although never with such freedom and ease as we have done. You will spend your holidays at home, and we shall make the most of them. 
I can feel the dear object already to be made the most of again, and so it shall, dear fellow, so come to its own nest. These last fond words were addressed to my prick, which, already rampant again, was claiming attention. We went at it, hammer and tongs. Recruited at luncheon, we renewed the raptures of lubricity as that estimable woman alone knew how to indulge them. We were the less reasonable, as it had been decided by us the night before that I was to find out the habits of the coming couple before I should venture on leaving my room to slip up to theirs, and thus I had a night of relaxation before me. At five o'clock the carriage drove up, and uncle and aunt were welcome to our house. My uncle was a tall, portly, unctuous-looking clergyman, quite a gentleman in his manners, and with a very agreeable voice. My aunt, who was some fifteen years my uncle's junior, was very tall for her sex, a fine portly figure, broad-shouldered, large bubbies well apart, a small waist for her size, immense hips and evidently buttocks to more than match. She was very stout, but stood firm upon her pins, and walked with great elasticity of step, showing there was a good deal in her, or rather she could take a good deal out of anybody. She had a profusion of fair hair, with thick eyebrows, that promised abundance elsewhere. Her eyes were of a deep blue that could look very far into you. She had a very pleasing expression, a small mouth, and very white teeth. Her complexion was exceedingly fair, her arms immense, but beautifully formed, hands and feet small, fat and plump. She looked thirty-five, but was nearly forty, and was altogether a most desirable woman to look at, on a large scale. She embraced me tenderly, which I did not fail to return, and complimented me and the whole family on our late good fortune. The first introduction was altogether most agreeable, and I already began to imagine I might not be so badly off after all. We were allowed to sit up rather later than usual, and as my aunt was fatigued with her day and night's journey, they were glad to follow our example almost immediately. I had only just time to get undressed, when I heard them enter the room which Miss Franklin had vacated the previous day. This had previously been arranged, and she now slept in my sister's room, as formerly, until we should depart. I quickly blew out my light, for fear they should observe it shining through the chinks I had made. Kneeling down, I began to watch the proceedings. The first thing my aunt did was to squat on the pot just opposite my peephole, and as she held up her dress well, I could see that she had a most prominent mons veneris, thickly covered with very fair ringlets. Her power of piss was something wonderful, it was like a cataract in force and quantity, and at once made my mutinous prick stand at the mighty rush of waters that could be so plainly heard. As she rose, and before she dropped her dress, I saw her splendid proportions of limb, the like of which had never before met my eyes. Alas! It was but a passing glimpse. However, I determined to watch on, hoping to see a further display in the course of undressing. She took off all her upper clothes, until nothing but her stays and chemise remained. I could now mark the real grandeur of her proportions. The stays kept in the waist, and allowed the splendor of her hips and buttocks to stand out in all their glory. Never in my life have I seen a finer backside than my aunt had got. I am now speaking from a vast amount of after inspection and adoration, but in its covered magnificence in which I at this moment viewed it, it appeared the finest backside I have ever met with, and was in fact the one I alluded to some time back when I observed that Miss Franklin's was the finest but one I ever saw. It is true, her stoutness added greatly to its prominence, but though stout, even very stout, it was not a stoutness you could call fat. For in after intimacy, which became of the very closest and most voluptuous nature, I was never able to pinch her in any muscular part. She had the hardest, as well as the biggest, backside I ever met with. I am quite sure that when she was standing upright, a child might have stood on the immense projections of her buttocks. 
Her thighs were positively monstrous in their mighty proportions, as hard as iron, exquisitely molded, and of a fairness and smoothness that rivaled ivory, which, in another respect, they much resembled, namely, in feeling cold to the touch. Her legs were worthy of the glorious frame they supported, and finished off with a pair of charming, clean-run ankles, and very small feet for her size. As her chemise was short-sleeved, the grand magnificence and beauty of form of her splendid arms and neck, where the bubbies came out in all their perfection and brilliancy of skin, were fully displayed. As may be supposed, not a bone was to be traced in her upper neck, but all was dazzling in color and flesh, which is such a beauty in woman. When a woman shows her gaunt collar bones, it is a proof of bad breeding, and a common nature. Aunt's truly grand bubbies rose magnificently over her bodice, which I thought at the time was their support, but this glorious woman required nothing of the sort, for when perfectly stripped, her bubbies stood out firm and projecting in all their grandeur, and they were of the largest, worthy of all her other fully developed charms. Her belly alone was somewhat too prominent, when standing up, but as she never had had children, it did not at all hang flabbily, and ended in one of the most prominent and largely developed Montes Veneris I have ever met with, profusely covered with the fairest of curls, which did not prevent her lovely creamy skin from shining through them. She was well provided with hair on that part, but after the extraordinary hairy covering that Miss Franklin possessed, and with which I had so often toyed, all other women appeared as nothing in that way. My aunt, after donning a nitrobe, sat down to her toilet, and proceeded to let down her massive bunch of tresses. Here, she was, indeed, richly gifted, her hair was all her own, in the utmost profusion, and, tall as she was, fell much below her buttocks, and was so thick that she could let it spread over both back and front, and completely cover her nakedness. Titian must have had such another magnificent head of hair for one of his models, for it exactly resembled, except in being somewhat of a fairer hue, his celebrated Magdalen, in the Pitti Palace, at Florence, where she is represented covered only with the rich profusion of her ringlets. Such was my aunt, and often and often afterwards has she indulged all my fancies, by showing herself off in every voluptuous attitude with this the greatest ornament of woman, flowing in the utmost profusion over her glorious and mighty charms. Meanwhile, the doctor had undressed, but it may well be supposed perfectly unnoticed by me. I had better game in view. He, too, had donned a robe de chamber, and sat down by his wife to have a chat over the occurrences of the day. Of course, their conversation very naturally turned upon myself. They began by congratulating themselves that the good fortune of the family was partly reflected on them by the circumstances of my being put under the doctor's care. The lady remarked how doubly fortunate it was, as the little scandal that had happened had, for some time, prevented their having any pupils at all. The doctor said, Never mind that, my love, this little fellow will soon be the decoy duck for others, he seems a nice, gentle lad, but I shall seek to have some talk with him tomorrow, and see what he is made of, boys, under women's instructions, are generally mere milksops. I don't think you will find it so in this case, added my aunt. I am not a bad judge of character, and I feel certain that Miss Franklin is too stern and firm of purpose not to have bent any boys will to her bidding, I fear, on the contrary, she has, if anything, been too severe with him, for my sister told me that she had full power to wield the rod, but, after one or two severe bouts, she completely mastered them, and that their progress was really very great, and most satisfactory, as Mr. Nixon, Charles's guardian, who had examined him, had reported. Most favorably thereon. But he appears to be insignificant, and undersized thin as a whipping post, pale, and somewhat sickly looking, he appears much younger than he is, 
and seems hardly fitted for what you and I would delight in. At Dear Doctor, I did not understand at this time what her allusion meant, but it was followed by the doctor stooping forwards, kissing her, and, I have no doubt, tonguing her too. He first thrust a hand below her beauteous bobbies, and then pulling up her chemise, began foraging between her legs. She put down her hair brush, and laid hold of his cock, but quickly said, Don't excite me, my dear, you see this poor fellow can do nothing without a rod, and we have none here, so be quiet and go to bed, that is a good boy. Obeying her, he rose, threw off his robe, put on a nightcap, and tumbled into bed, and was sound asleep before his magnificent spouse had finished her toilet. When it was concluded, she took off her stays, and drew her chemise over her head, I doubt if it could have fallen over her enormous buttocks. She then walked across the room in my direction, stark naked as nature made her, and strikingly magnificent in the firmness of her tread, and the glorious uprightness of her truly superb grandeur of form. I was positively awestruck. I could imagine her to be Juno in all her glory before Jupiter, and well he might be tempted to stray to the forbidden path of love, if Juno had such a backside as the enormous and glorious one my aunt possessed. She again squatted down, naked as she was, and poured out another torrent into the pot. I felt overpowered at the sight, and staggered back to my bed, and for the first time in my life felt constrained to rack off by self-pollution the excess of lust the gazing on such superhuman beauties had engendered. I could hardly refrain from shouting out to relieve my till then suppressed excitement, especially when nature gave way, and there spurted forth a jet of sperm, actually from the bed against the door towards which I had pointed my prick while wildly frigging it, and in imagination shoving it into ant anywhere, for if ever the saying that there was plenty of good fucking about all these parts was applicable to anyone, it was supremely so in my glorious aunt's case. Anyone might shove his prick against any part of her body, and spend at once from excess of lust, at her very beauty and splendor of form and exquisite color and fineness of skin. Never, never have I met her equal. Her power of fuck, too, was on a par with the immensity of size, and of a quality to please the most fastidious, or the most lustful. Such were the first experiences that I had of my aunt's person and as my narrative extends, the reader will become more intimate with her person and proceedings. I sank to sleep, to dream of possessing her in every way, rivaling Jupiter with Juno, and Mars with Venus, mere visions of the night, but which were in after days converted into sweet realizations of the most voluptuous and rapturous nature. The next day, at our hour of recreation, Miss Franklin walked out with us, and seeking a retired part of the grounds, while the girls amused themselves, I recounted to Miss F all I had seen and heard. She at once came to the conclusion that I was destined to fall into the arms of my aunt. I am so far pleased, my dear Charlie, that it will be into those of an extraordinary fine woman, you must, after your present experiences with me, have had someone to go to, and certainly you could not have a finer. There will, evidently, be every facility, for I read those hints, which have puzzled you, as intimating anything but reserve once you are admitted into the inner arcana of their lives, or I am much mistaken. There is one point I must strongly caution you about, and your general prudence and great good sense will make you appreciate its importance. Your aunt is evidently much experienced in erotic pleasures. If at once she found in you the extraordinary adept you are, she would never cease tormenting you until she discovered who had been your instructress. Now it must be evident to you that if she thought you and I were intimate in that way, she might draw evil inferences with regard to your sisters, or if not going so far as to think we had equally corrupted them, it is probable enough she might seek to remove me from their society. So you see, my darling boy, though it may be very difficult to do, you must, for all our sakes, 
determined to appear quite innocent and ignorant of everything connected with indulgence in amorous passions. You must not let yourself appear excited, but leave her to take all the initiatory steps, and I much mistake if she will not be extremely ready to do so, but all the more so if she finds you apparently innocent. However much you now know of love's proceedings, you must keep a guarded check upon your feelings, so as not to let your knowledge become apparent in the smallest degree. She will, eventually, be twice as well pleased if she fancies she has had your first fruits. Before you leave I shall give you some short hints as to how to conduct yourself. All this time I was getting rampageous, so begging her to stoop forward upon a stump, I tilted up her petticoats and fucked her from behind, fricking her delicious clitoris, and making her spend at the same time as myself. It was a hasty fly, but very sweet nevertheless, for we were both conscious that it was necessary to make the most of the short time I had yet to remain at home. I mentioned my aunt's remark about having no rod at hand, and it was agreed that Miss Franklin should put one on an upper shelf of her wardrobe, and accidentally leave the key in the door. As this wardrobe remained in the room uncle and aunt were sleeping in, woman's curiosity was sure to induce an examination of it. This answered a double purpose for Miss F so arranged things that some excellent books full of little bits of paper inserted here and there, at highly moral or religious passages, led both uncle and aunt to have a very high idea of her moral character for these were works that apparently could only be for her own private reading. The rod was placed, and the bait laid next day. Meanwhile, that afternoon, the doctor called me aside, and put me through a conversational sort of examination. I was studiously modest, but being very fairly grounded by the admirable system of teaching pursued by Miss Franklin, I not only satisfied him, but he took occasion to compliment Miss Franklin very highly for the admirable groundwork she had laid. I fancied also, as he continued in conversation with her, that he grew more kindly and unctuous, as if the spirit of lust was infusing itself in his veins as he continued to converse with and gaze on that most engaging and lust-creating creature. That night I watched, as before, their preparations for sleep, and heard their conversation. This time the doctor was profuse in his praise of me, but Aunt thought I was timid and lifeless, there seemed no spirit about me, as there ought to be, she added, at his age, but this education by females makes girls of boys. I thought to myself, I guess, I shall very soon undeceive you on that point, my dear aunt. The doctor went quietly to bed, and stripped and used the bidet, giving me a most exciting and voluptuous view of all her full-blown charms. No sooner was her light out, and she in bed, than I slipped out and crept up to my sister's room, where three randy cunts were impatiently awaiting my advent with an equally randy and inflamed pigo. We indulged in every complicated combination of lust and lubricity, and never ceased until daylight forced my unwilling retreat. Before leaving, as the rod was to be put in the wardrobe, and the key left in the door, it was arranged that the next night the girls, and Miss F, too, if she could, were to endeavor to sleep soundly before I came. For if our stratagem succeeded, I should remain to see the result which would probably occupy more than an hour or two, and I would awaken them by applying Moses's rod to their water courses as doubtless I would be in a rampageous state, if our expectations of the doctor's and aunt's tendencies that way were realized. I kept myself awake until aunt and uncle came to bed, and then I immediately placed myself and vidette. At first no notice was taken of the key being in the lock. Aunt continued her operations, and uncle became somewhat more tentative than usual, when aunt, finding by placing her hand on his prick that it was mere useless desire, rose and scolded him. He grew more emboldened, and followed her up, wishing to feel her splendid cunt. It so happened she had drawn back as far as the wardrobe itself, until the key actually hurt her back. Ah what have we here, she cried and then turning round, said that as the key had been left in the lock, 
there could be no harm in looking in. Her husband became as curious as she. Of course, the first things they saw were the prearranged books. They were seized upon with avidity probably with the expectation of finding something smutty, but to their surprise, and especially that of the doctor, it was quite the reverse. Well, I should never have thought this, do you know, my dear, I had begun to suspect that, under a demure exterior, there was lurking an enormous deal of animal passion in that Miss Franklin, but if so, these works prove that it is under complete regulation. More's the pity, for she is made for the real enjoyment of the passions. Oh you have been speculating in that quarter, have you, you old lecher? Well, my dear, you know we have both liberty to stray now and then, and you, yourself, have not a little availed yourself on our mutual understanding. Now, doctor, you are too bad. Do I not quite overlook all your weakness for the younger members of your own sex, and do I not lend myself to your fantasies in that way, when chance deprives you of any opportunity of pederasty? Well, well, my love, I was not upbraiding you. You are too dear and too kind to me to permit of anything beyond a joking illusion, but what have we here? A birch rod. By all that is holy. Reaching up to the high shelf, he drew down the rod. At first they suspected Miss Franklin operating on herself, but the perfectly untouched state of the rod proved that it was there in reserve only, and had not yet been used. What a lucky chance, cried my aunt. I shall now be able to birch you into something like a fit state to fuck me and you shall birch me afterwards, if it will only produce a second fuck, back or front, whichever you like. You are an angel, my darling wife, and I shall try to content both orifices, it is an abominable shame that with such a gloriously made magnificent woman as God has given me in your noble form, I should ever require any other stimulant than a glance at your exquisitely exciting proportions, but I suppose it is age that weakens our sensibilities. You are right, my dear John, for I, who used to think your dear old cock was enough for me, find I require the excitement of younger ones to give me the real excess of pleasure my constitution demands, it would be a shame if I did not humor all your little caprices, when you so readily throw opportunities in my way. I only wish this nephew of mine had been more worthy of us, we should have made him a glorious bone bouche between us, equally to his satisfaction as to ours. Well, my dear, the heir of Kent, and more manly treatment, may yet develop his somewhat stinted growth, and under your tuition, he may yet prove not so bad an object as you seem to think, at all events, he may serve as a pies aller, until a better turns up, but you must proceed with caution, for he seems as modest as a maid. My dear John, your modest ones always make the best, when once broken in. I only wish his physique had been more to my liking, but we shall see, we shall see, meanwhile let us both strip to the buff, and proceed to make the most of this happy discovery of the rod the very thing we most wanted and wished for. Aunt rapidly twisted up her magnificent tresses, and as rapidly stripped to the skin, the doctor likewise. I assure you he was a well-made, muscular, portly, handsome man, with a large well-filled pair of cods. His pico still hung down his head, but had a certain amount of size, doubtless stimulated by the exciting nature of their conversation and reminiscences. His skin and his cock were beautifully white, and the ball of his prick of a tempting scarlet. I felt at the moment that, if I dared, I would have bolted into the room, and sucked it into such a stiffness as would have instantly satisfied the insatiable cunt of my glorious aunt. This was a delight to be left for a future day when I allowed the doctor all the credit and pleasure of persuading me to do that which I was burning with desire to do. But I digress. No sooner were both fully prepared than my aunt, in a stern voice, ordered the doctor to approach. Come here, sir, I must whip you, you have not done your duty as you ought lately, and you are a very naughty boy. 
The doctor, putting on the air of a schoolboy, begged to be excused this time, but his inexorable mistress was not to be moved, and seizing him by the arm, pulled him over her broad and massive thighs, and with one arm round his waist, seized his cock in her hand, and began whacking away at his backside in such real earnest and, apparently, with all the force of her powerful arm, that I began to think the doctor must cry out in earnest. But he took it all without a murmur, only wriggling his fat and smooth buttocks about in a way that rather inferred satisfaction than suffering. Presently my aunt, who, doubtless, knew by the grip of his prick that matters had arrived at the point her own passions had most at heart, lifted him up, and said, Now I must put you in pickle, but as your great red buttocks are too large to be pickled, I shall pickle your prick instead. So come here, sir, and let me put this rampant fellow into my pickle tub, where, I promise, the salt brine will soon bring down his pride. I suppose this was the sort of childish yet lascivious talk which pleased them both, for uncle, who had risen, and who now presented a much finer weapon than I had given him credit for, pretended to fear this further punishment, and begged and entreated to be let off he had been punished enough, and see, and see and, however, leading him by the prick to the bed, threw herself on the edge, and lying back, drew up her enormous thighs almost to her belly, and showed to my gloating gaze her tremendous salmon-colored gash, all covered with spunk, for the operation had made her spend profusely. I never saw so large a cunt, nor such an extensive triangle as lay on the side of each lip between it and the commencement of the buttocks, beautifully covered with the fairest curls. There, sir, is your place of punishment, stoop and kiss it before I imprison your indecent cock within it. The doctor, nothing loath, stooped and Gama hutched her so well that her mighty backside wriggled beneath his head, and made everything in the room jingle, her hand pressed his head until I thought it would have been pushed in altogether. At last, she spent with a shout of delight. He hastily gobbled it all up, and rising, without more ado, thrust his stiff standing weapon up to the hilt, I might almost say cods and all in her longing and magnificent cunt. Here, he soaked for some minutes, and I could see by the convulsive movements of her backside how much Aunt was enjoying it. They soon became bent on more active movements, for throwing her splendid legs over his back, she began an up and down movement, much more active than I could in any way have given her credit for. They went at it in real earnest for a longer time than I expected, but when the mighty crisis came, it was with an energy, and passionate struggles worthy of the strength and substance of the two love wrestlers. I could see her cunt all foam again around the roots of the increased size of uncle's very respectable prick, and then they lay in apparent apathy for full twenty minutes, but one could see by the convulsive throbs of their whole bodies what delicious transports of rapture they were enjoying. Uncle was the first to rise but only to stoop and to greedily lick up all the foaming spunk which the widespread entrance to her glorious cunt exhibited. This being done, she, too, rose, and throwing her arms round the doctor's neck, drew his mouth to hers, and seemed to suck his slimy lips, and gain for herself as much as she could of the delicious spunk the doctor had been reveling in. This lasted some minutes. Then my aunt turned him down on the bed, and took a long suck at his prick, now hanging limp, but still of a goodly thickness. Then she thanked him for the great satisfaction he had given her, and declared it was almost as good as the first days of their union. Then after toying and cuddling on the bed for a time, she said they must now proceed to a little further castigation, on her bottom this time, as he had promised to give her a double dose. Yes, my love but you know you promised I should take my choice of which temple I should make my sacrifice at. My own John, you know, that after being once well fucked, the hinder hole is my preference, that is understood. They accordingly rose, and uncle, furnishing himself with the rod, desired aunt to kneel on the edge of the bed, 
and present her magnificent backside projecting out fair for his birching. This she immediately did, and being directly before my eyes, I had a full front view of her gloriously large wide open cunt, and all the pinky brown aureola around her charming bottom hole, over which the little fair ringlets showed in great beauty. I need not say that my own John Thomas was in all the pride and panoply of prickdom, and ready to burst with excitement. My uncle took the rod in hand as soon as Aunt was in position, and placing himself on one side, while his left hand passed under her belly to frig her clitoris, he had his right hand free to inflict any amount of whipping. And, I must say, neither one nor the other spared the rod, they laid it on right soundly, but drew forth no word or sign of complaint. My aunt soon began to wriggle her stupendous backside, in a way to show how very exciting the birching was to her. Her exquisitely creamy white skin began to see the scarlet of the blood rushing to the surface under the infliction received. The redder it became, so did the evident palpitating movement of her two resplendent orbs increase, until uncle, too, showed how the glorious sight was stimulating his less easily excited system, by the stiffening and uprising of his pico. Aunt's hand slipped down to it, and being well acquainted with its habits, pronounced it to be as equally ready as herself. Turning her body lengthways, but still on her knees, the doctor scrambled up behind her, and first stooping, licked up the foam on her cunt, for she had already spent once, and then, rolling his tongue about the beautiful indentation leading to her delicious bottom hole, he thrust it in as far as he could there. Then rising on his knees, he first plunged his jolly good prick into her cunt for two or three shoves, and then drawing it out well lubricated, presented its point to her exquisite bottom hole, and plunged it up to the hilt at a single thrust. Aunt gave a cry and shudder of delight as she felt it penetrate to her very entrails. The doctor, satisfied for the moment, lay soaking in the exquisite pressure that Aunt's sphincter on e was applying to his happy prick. He looked down upon her glorious buttocks, handling them with evident pleasure. I saw Aunt's hand steal down to her cunt, and could observe that she was actively frigging her clitoris. She shortly cried out to uncle not to be so idle, but to commence the delicious movements she expected from him. He did. They did, and such a scene of excitement it was to see so magnificent a woman with such a mighty backside in all the agonies of enjoyment that I could hold out no longer, but seizing my bursting prick in my hand, two or three rapid movements up and down, and tight graspings of the shaft, brought on the ecstatic rapture of so lascivious a spend that I actually fainted and fell heavily on the floor. It was fortunate that aunt and uncle were so hotly engaged that an earthquake might have shook the house without their being conscious of it. So as I only fell from my knees it never disturbed one moment of their pleasure. I must have been some minutes without consciousness, for when I came to my senses, and was able to resume my inspection, I found their crisis was past, but that uncle still lay soaking in the narrow cell he so delightfully occupied. He was gazing with evident pleasure on the still palpitating buttocks of the divine backside immediately below him. Neither was in any hurry, but they dwelt for a considerable space of time in this repose of lubricity. At last, his cock, reduced in bulk, slipped out of its close quarters. Then, rising, and helping Aunt out of bed, they warmly embraced each other, kissed and tongued, and Aunt thanked him for a most rapturous fuck. Aunt then sat down on her bidet, and Uncle used the wash basin. After purifying themselves, and Aunt showing all the extraordinary fine development of her glorious form, they put on their night dresses, blew out the lights, and tumbled into bed. I immediately hastened to gain my sister's room with my cock standing stiffer than ever. I entered gently they were all asleep. My two sisters lay reversed, with their heads between each pair of thighs, they had evidently fallen asleep after a mutual gamma hutch in the very attitude in which they had spent. Miss Franklin had apparently waited for me, but feeling drowsy, had thrust her very fine hairy backside right out of bed, 
ready to attract my attention the moment I should come. So gently approaching, and bringing the light to bear on the beautiful sight, I spit upon and lubricated the end of my prick, and very gently introduced him into her ever delicious cunt. I managed to fully engulf it before applying my finger to her bottom hole, and my other hand to her clitoris. She had already in her sleep involuntarily squeezed me with her usual force. Then, suddenly applying all my energies, I began an active movement, which instantly awoke her. She was as ready for the sport as I was, and in a very few minutes we ran a most rapturous course of intense delight, and spent with an energy which proved the strength of the excitement I had been under. As I was standing by the bedside, and she lying on it with her fine bottom projecting beyond the edge, it was not a position to remain long in, besides, I was still dressed. So, withdrawing, I undressed myself. My sisters had slept through all this, so first preparing everything for an excessive orgy, by getting out dildos and birch rods, we awoke the two darlings, who, rising, stripped to the buff. The three dear creatures were all curiosity to know what had kept me so long more than two hours and a half, and what had been done. I recounted all the proceedings, except in so far as they had talked of initiating me, for neither Miss Franklin nor I wished my sisters to be acquainted with that matter. They laughed heartily, and little Lizzie said she must act and, first flog me and be fucked, then be flogged by me, and have my darling prick up her bottom hole to follow. We laughed and humored her, and that scene came off with considerable eclat. Miss Franklin fucking Mary, for whom she had a great ledge, in the cunt first, and in the bottom, after my example on Lizzie, in the second place. Lizzie and I then laved our parts and prepared for fresh encounters, and we then began a more regular course of the most lascivious lubricity, in which dildos and rods played conspicuous parts, both becoming necessary under the excessive indulgencies of these last few nights. I stole to my room long after daylight, and slept soundly for an hour or two. You may be sure our lessons were of the lightest in these few days that were left us, and I was allowed to doze off during school hours. Miss Franklin again walked with me alone in the garden, to give me, as she thought, last lessons in the way I should act with Aunt, who she now felt more certain than ever would very soon attack and carry my person when she reached home and had the place and time all to herself. I listened with apparently great attention, as the reader knows, I was already an adept in the art she wished to indoctrinate thanks to the admirable advice of my ever charming real first instructress, the lovely Mrs. Benson. But I could not help thinking how completely these two admirable women had the same wisdom and knowledge of the world with which they were so anxious that I, too, should become conversant. The next night the doctor and aunt went quietly to bed, the doctor declaring that his previous night's doings would prevent any more that night. So I only had one more gaze at all Aunt's magnificent beauties, which had a never-failing effect on my excitable weapon, and which she sent away when her light was put out in a perfectly fit state for the work that awaited him in my sister's room. I came upon them sooner than expected, and found the three rolled into one body, two gamma hutching each other, and Miss Franklin's clitoris in Mary's bum hole. For a wonder they did not hear me as I gently opened the door, and I patiently waited till the lascivious crisis brought down a delicious spend from them all. When clapping my hands applaudingly, I cried. Bravo, bravo, encore. I was so far glad, for to confess the truth the pace was telling, and I began to require more and more of the rod. However, we had but this and the next night at our disposal, and the knowledge that we must soon cease our delicious orgies nerved us all to increased efforts. Again our passions raged furiously, and broke out in spurts of foaming sperm. Every desire our lascivious lubricity could suggest was carried out to increase our pleasures or renew our exhausted resources, until time warned us again to separate. The next day there was no school time it was spent in packing and preparing for departure. 
My poor mother took it much to heart she was a most affectionate creature, as innocent as a babe. I often wondered where we three got all the natural wantonness of our characters, for mama had nothing of it. I suppose it must have come from our grandparents, as aunt had it in the fullest degree, and was almost the equal of the adorable Miss Frankland, who only excelled her in having Greek blood in her veins, which, doubtless, accounted for the extreme heat of her lubricity. Some day I will recount the chief events of her romantic story, which she herself, in after time, fully related to me. The day was a sad one for us all, even sadder than the next, the actual day of departure. As often happens, the anticipation of evils is greater than the reality when they come. That night my aunt and the doctor had another whipping bout, but this time she only succeeded in getting a single course out of the doctor. As before when all was over, I slipped away to pass the last delicious night with the dear creatures with whom I had now carried on the most rapturous orgies for more than two years past. My sisters were rapidly developing into remarkably handsome fine young women, especially Mary, who, having the advantage of a year and a half over Lizzie, was naturally more filled out and formed, although Lizzie promised in the end to be, and in fact became, the finest woman, and had also by far the hotter temperament of the two. We passed the night in orgies the most refined, interspersed with tears of regret at our parting, and soft endearments leading to perfect furies of lubricity, until I was nearly fainting with exhaustion. We tore ourselves asunder with difficulty, and the three angelic creatures held their door open, and with streaming eyes watched my receding form, twice, on looking back, I could not help returning again and again to throw myself into their arms for a last loving embrace, but like all things human it came to an end and I reached my bed and sobbed myself to sleep. It is needless to dwell on our parting next day. My mother accompanied us to the town where we were to take a coach. It drove up. My poor mother could hardly utter her blessing and farewell, and I saw the tears coursing down her venerable cheeks as she waved her handkerchief before the coach turned the corner that shut us from her view. Of course my heart was full whose could be otherwise when quitting home for the first time. My aunt put her arm round my waist, and laid my head on her ample bosom, and comforted me as well as she could, but a full heart must vent itself. Fortunately, we had the inside all to ourselves. My aunt was very tender, and so was the doctor. I soon sobbed myself to sleep. Even in the bitter grief of the moment I had some slight comfort in the idea of pressing those glorious orbs. My aunt frequently kissed me, and I returned it with full pouting lips, which I fancied rather pleased her. I slept until the coach stopped for supper, ate heartily, and, as may be supposed after my late week of hard work, soon again slept like a top. I did not awake until it was broad daylight, and, like all heavy sleepers, was awake and sensible of what was going on before opening my eyes. I became conscious that a hand was gently pressing and apparently taking the size of my standing pigo, which the pressure of water on my bladder had occasioned to be in an erection of the hardest. I lay quite still, continuing to breathe heavily, but unable to prevent sundry throbbings of my pigo, occasioned by the soft hand of my aunt who was gently following its form from the outside of my trousers. It appeared she had only just commenced her manipulations, not having previously observed the bulging out of its large dimensions under my trousers. She pressed her knee against that of the doctor opposite, who I presume, was dozing off, and in a whisper I heard her draw his attention to my extraordinary development. Feel it, my dear, but very gently so as not to waken him, it is the largest prick I have ever felt, and altogether beats the late captain of grenadiers you used to be so jealous of. The doctor did feel, and I think Aunt would have unbuttoned my trousers, had not the coach suddenly pulled up at the inn we were to breakfast at. So perforce they shook me up. I acted the suddenly awakened sleeper very well. As soon as we were out of the coach, I whispered to the doctor, 
If you please, uncle, I want to piddle very bad. Come here, my dear boy. And taking me behind some wagons in the inn yard, where we would not be seen, he said. Here, we can both piss down this grating. And, forsooth, to encourage me, pulled out his own standing pigo. I saw what he wanted, and out with my own in all its length and strength. Good heavens, Charles, what an immense cock you have got does it often stand like that? Yes, uncle, every morning it hurts me so until I piddle it gets worse and worse and bigger and bigger it was not half so big a year ago. I don't know what to do to cure myself of this hardness, which is very painful. Ah, well, I must speak to your aunt, perhaps she can help you. Have you ever spoken to anybody else about it? Oh, dear no. I should have been quite ashamed, but when I saw you also had the same hardness, I was very glad to ask your advice, dear uncle. Quite right. Always consult me about that part of your body, whatever you may feel. We breakfasted, and I could see, on regaining the coach, that uncle and aunt had a satisfactory exchange of words on the subject. We got to the rectory in Kent in time for dinner, at which I was the object of great and devoted attention of both, especially of my aunt. Our previous long journey made an early retreat to bed a necessity for all of us. They both conducted me with much on pressman to my bedroom, a very comfortable one, having a communication at one end with a corridor, and, on the right hand side entering, another door communicating with my uncle's dressing and bathroom, and these opening into their bedroom, which had a similar dressing room on the other side fitted up with wardrobes for female gear, and dedicated to my aunt's sole use. I was left to a quiet night's rest, which I most thoroughly enjoyed, and slept profoundly until late in the morning. I was awakened by my uncle drawing all the clothes off me. Of course, I was rampant, as usual. He gazed for a moment or two without speaking at my enormous cock at full stand. He then said it was nine o'clock, and breakfast was ready, that he had not liked to disturb me sooner, as I was in so sound a slumber, but now it was time for me to get up. I see, he added, that your doodle, as you call it, has got the hardness you spoke of yesterday. Then he laid hold of it, and gently squeezed it it filled his grasp. He evidently enjoyed the pleasure of handling it, but contented himself with saying that my aunt must see to giving me some remedy the next day, when she should come and inspect it in the morning, so as to see how hard it was, and how it hurt me. I replied that it would be very kind of aunt, but what would she think of my showing my doodle to her, mama had told me, when I slept in her room always to piddle in a corner, and never let anyone see it. He laughed at my apparent simplicity, and said, Your mama was quite right as to people in general, but it is quite a different thing with your aunt, whose close relationship authorizes her doing what she can to relieve her dear nephew, in whom we both take such an interest, besides, I suppose your mama never saw it in this size and hardness. He was gently handling it all the time of our conversation. Oh, no, Mama never saw it but at night, when it was quite shrunk up, and that is nearly a year ago, when I used to sleep in her room, it is since then it has grown so large and hurts so much, and throbs so violently as it is doing now in your hand. It makes me feel so queer, dear uncle and I shall be so much obliged to dear auntie if she will but give me a remedy to relieve the pain I suffer. He laughed again, and said, I shall speak to your aunt, and we shall see we shall see, but get up now, we shall find your aunt waiting for us. So make haste and dress, come downstairs, you will find us in the dining room. He left me, and I could hear him laughing to himself, as he walked along the corridor, doubtless at my apparent innocent simplicity. I saw at once that I should be called upon to show myself a man next day, but I already felt the advantage of the advice both my admirable mistresses had given me, 
as to making all new conquests believe that they had my first fruits. I determined to adhere to the game I was playing, and I foresaw that the pleasure of supporting such a thing would greatly enhance the delight Ant would naturally take in being fucked by my really monstrous cock. I was soon down to breakfast, and was most warmly embraced by my gloriously beautiful aunt, who, in a graceful dishabille, looked more charming than ever. She hugged me for more than a minute in her arms, and devoured me with kisses. I have no doubt the doctor had recounted our interview, and by the sparkle of her eye, and the flush on her face, as she so closely embraced me, she showed that already her passions were excited and she was longing for the hour in which she could indulge them. However, all that day, they were kept under restraint. The doctor had some parish business to attend to, and aunt leaving me for an hour after breakfast, while she attended to some necessary household affairs, afterwards took me all over the house and grounds, and then we had a walk through the village. The house was one of those snug rectory houses situated in their own grounds which abound in England, but few have so glorious a prospect as was seen from the front of the house. Leeds, in Kent, is situated on the ridge of hills running east and west, and commanding views over the rich and beautiful weald of Kent. The rectory faced the south, and the ground falling rapidly beyond the garden left a splendid landscape in full view. Although close to the village and the church, both were planted out by a thick belt of evergreen trees, which extended to north and east, sheltering the house and grounds from every adverse wind. The house itself was very commodious, but unassuming. The south front had a large projecting half-circle, with three windows in it and a window on each side of the half-circle, this formed the drawing room below and my uncle's bedroom, and two dressing rooms above. To the right, looking at the house, there was a wing with an open arched passage leading to a greenhouse and vinery, while above ran a suite of three rooms, each with one good-sized window overlooking the garden. These were the three rooms kept for the same number of young gentlemen who might be taken in for preparation for the university a number the doctor never exceeded. Of these rooms I was at present the only occupant. They were built so as to be shut off from all the rest of the house by a door on the landing, leading into the corridor, from which a door communicated with the doctor's dressing room, and with each of the three rooms. At the end was a water closet for general use. I have already mentioned the first of these rooms had a second door of communication with the doctor's dressing room, and this was appropriated to me. Below these rooms, but looking north, and communicating with the village by a covered way and having a playground into which it looked, was the schoolroom, taking up about half the space of the rooms above. Beyond the covered way to the village was a quiet garden square, into which the doctor's study looked. This study was separated by a passage from the schoolroom, and had double bays doors both on the house and schoolroom sides. It was in fact the doctor's sanctum sanctorum, of which more will be told in the sequel. In this manner the schoolroom part of the house was quite shut off from the rest, and was nowhere overlooked. To return to the habitable part. The west front contained a small library, opening from the drawing room, and beyond a comfortable dining room, communicating with the kitchen and offices, which overlooked the courtyard of the entrance to the house, above these were the domestics' bedrooms, and C. The entrance was from the north into a handsome entrance hall, with a good broad staircase leading to the upper landing, which, turning westward, led to three extra bedrooms above the library and dining room. It was thus a very convenient house and well adapted for a clergyman adding scholastic duties to his other ministrations. I forgot to say that the first bedroom, in the west wing, had a door of communication with my aunt's dressing room which I afterwards found had often served for amorous propensities by making it the bedroom of some favored lover. The grounds were charmingly laid out with a profusion of flowers. There was a perfectly shaded walk in the east shrubbery leading from the greenhouse down to a most charming summer house overlooking the very finest prospect, and perfectly secure from all observation. 
It was furnished very appropriately for amorous purposes, the couches being low, broad, and with patent spring cushions. In the sequel it was the scene of many a bout of lubricity. My aunt took me through all that I have described. When we arrived at the summer house, I could see that it was with difficulty she restrained her great desire to possess me, I would most willingly have rushed into her longing arms, and fucked her. To her heart's content, but prudence withheld. I had undertaken to act a part, and must go through with it. No doubt Aunt was withheld by a similar motive. She and the doctor had resolved that nothing to alarm my modesty heaven save the mark, was to be attempted till the next morning. So with a deep sigh she led me away from the summer house into the village, where we met the doctor, and returned to luncheon. After luncheon the doctor took me for a walk again through the picturesque village along the ridge of hills, to enjoy the beautiful views of Leeds Castle, the doctor giving me very many interesting historical details connected with it. After a most pleasant and lengthened walk we returned in time to dress for dinner. I found that one of the rules of the house was that no matter, whether alone or with company the doctor invariably insisted on regular evening costume at dinner time. This has many advantages. In the first place it gives at least half an hour's occupation, an object in itself worth something to persons living in the country, and then it gives a cachet or rather chic to your dinner party, however small it may be, and is in itself a certain amount of restraint on excessive exuberance of spirits, and thus may be considered as a disciplinary element of education tending to keep up that reserve and self-restraint characteristic of Englishmen. Beyond a marked attention to me in every way, our dinner and evening passed without anything worthy of record. I was evidently high in their favor, probably for the reason that both began to have great hopes that I would serve their purpose in every way. We retired early to rest, and I thus obtained three nights of uninterrupted rest, recruiting me after all the excesses I had indulged in before quitting home. It was so far fortunate that I was thus ready to satisfy the strong passions of my aunt, who was insatiable when once her lust was let loose. I awoke earlier than on the previous morning, and shortly afterwards, hearing a movement in the doctor's dressing room, I feigned sleep. It was as I expected, the doctor coming to me in company with my aunt. They approached my bedside. I had laid myself on my back purposely to allow the thin summer covering to be lifted up and bulged out by my stiff standing pigo. I heard the doctor whisper to Aunt, to draw her attention to it. She gently slipped her hand under the clothes, and grasped it in her soft fat fingers, upon which it throbbed so violently that I thought it politic to waken at once. My aunt was not at all put out, but held it still in her hand with a gentle pressure. She said. My dear nephew, your uncle has brought me to see if I cannot relieve the extreme hardness and pain you feel in this immense thing of yours. Let me see it. She now threw off the coverlet, and brought to light my large prick in all the glory of the stiffest stand. My word, what a monster, she cried. Her eyes sparkled, and her face flushed as the sight met her full gaze. The doctor approached and also handled it with evident delight. My dear, will you be able to put it into your natural warm bath? It is so very large. Oh! I have not the slightest doubt but that I shall be able to soothe and deliver it of all pain poor fellow, how it throbs. Does it hurt much, dear Charles? Oh, yes, your hand seems to make it even harder than before, but at the same time makes me feel so very queer, as if I were going to faint. Do relieve me, dear auntie, the doctor says you can if you like. I will do so, certainly, my dear boy, but the method is a great secret, known only to your uncle and myself, and you must assure me you will never mention it to anyone, or tell how I cured you. It is only my strong affection for you that makes me anxious to do anything I can to relieve you. Do you promise to be discreet? My dear aunt, you may be sure I shall be too much obliged to you ever to think of revealing your great kindness. 
do, pray, do it at once, I feel so queer, and I am bursting with pain. Well, then, make room for me beside you, and I shall lie down, the doctor will cover us up, and I shall soon reduce the stiffness. She got into bed, lay down on her back, pulled the sheet over us, laying bare her splendid belly, and, at the same time, opening her magnificent limbs and desiring me to get upon her, telling me she had a sheath in her body, which, when my hard doodle was put within, would soon relieve it of its stiffness. I got awkwardly upon her. She seized my standing prick, and placing its knob between the already very moist lips, told me to push it in as far as it would go. It glided into its delicious sheath up to the cod piece in a moment. Oh, heavens! I cried, how nice! Dear, dear, auntie, what shall I do now, I feel as if I were going to die. My apparent innocence seemed to add to her pleasure. She threw the sheet that covered us on one side, and with arms and legs clasped round my body, begged me to move my bottom up and down, so as to make my doodle go in and out. I followed her directions, and she seconded me with rare art, squeezing my instrument with wonderful pressures as I withdrew and she retired, to meet again the up and down shock with the most lascivious delight. I felt the hand of the doctor embracing my testicles and gently pressing them. I became aware that the crisis was approaching, and shoved home with a cry of rapture, but remembering my part, I exclaimed. Oh, I am dying, dear aunt, oh, oh, stop, stop. I can't can't bear it. I sank away, but could hear aunt murmuring. Dear, darling, delicious boy, I never had such a glorious prick in me, or a better fuck before. I fear the dear child has fainted from the excess of pleasure, and the newness of the sensation, but his glorious prick still throbs deliciously within me only feel its root, doctor, how stiff it is. I felt the doctor grasping it, making it throb violently as he did so. The dear boy is as stiff as ever. You will get another fuck out of him the moment he comes to himself. I am glad of that, for it is delightful to see you at it especially with so splendid a prick operating upon you it is the greatest treat you have ever given me in that way. I don't wonder at that, my dear, for I never met with such a fine prick in my life before, and little thought my nephew could have had such a splendid one in his trousers when we first saw him. Oh, I am looter than ever, and am spend spend spending. Oh, oh and she poured down another copious hot flow on my enraptured prick. I let her revel in the ecstasies of her second lascivious discharge until I found that her libidinous passions were again excited and longing for more active operations. I pretended not to know where I was, and began a faltering. Oh, where am I? What has happened? I have been in paradise. Lifting up my head, I apparently recognized Aunt in surprise. Oh, dear, how came I here? Oh, remember, Auntie, you promised to relieve my hardness, and it seemed so nice, but I feel it is harder than ever, you will try and relieve me again, won't you, dear Auntie? Certainly, my dear nephew, you must do as you did at first, move in and out, and I shall second you and perhaps we shall succeed this time better than before. Of course, I was less gauche, and she more energetic. I felt the doctor insert a moistened finger up my fundament, and move it in unison with our thrusts. Aunt cried out to me to go on faster and faster, and we soon came to the grand crisis, dying away together in sobs and sighs of delighted enjoyment. I again sank on her noble panting bosom, really overcome with the rapture-giving delights of that most delicious cunt. On lifting my love-humid eyes to the face of my aunt, she seized my head in both hands, and drew my lips to her in a long, long kiss of satisfied lust, and thrust her tongue into my mouth, which I immediately sucked. She then begged me to give her mine. 
After tonguing together for a minute or two she asked if my doodle was in less pain, and if its hardness was reduced. A little, dear auntie, but I feel it is getting hard again you must try once more, if you please oh, it is so nice. And my prick throbbed up and stiffened to prove the truth of my words. But the doctor here interrupted us by saying that he must have his own stiffness reduced, at the same time presenting his really fine prick at full stand before our faces. You must get up, my dear boy, and your aunt will allay your new hardness in another way, in which she will be able to relieve both our hardnesses together. Reluctantly I rose, withdrawing my reeking prick at more than half stand looking down as I rose on the truly large and magnificent foaming gash from which I had just withdrawn, I cried. Oh, dear aunt, what a wonderful sight it is, I must kiss it for the efforts it has made to relieve me. I threw my head down upon it, kissed it, licked its wide open lips all foaming with fuck as they were, thrusting my tongue in as far as it would go. This evidently gave Aunt great delight. But the doctor drew me off, told me to lie down on my back, and made Aunt straddle over me. She took hold of my now completely standing prick, bent it back, and directing it aright, sank upon it until her ample bush of hair lay crushed on mine. She rose up and down two or three times in a slow delicious movement, and then bending forward, glued her lips to mine while I threw my arms round her glorious body. I could feel the doctor getting up between my legs on his knees, and then felt his prick was rubbing against the lips of the cunt fully distended round my large pigo, doubtless for the purpose of lubricating it before thrusting it into Ant's magnificent backside. I felt the rubbing of his prick against mine through the thin partition, as he glided slowly up into her entrails. We then began our joint movements, but Ant beat us both, and spent twice before joining in our final finish, which was ushered in by loud. Cries of delight from all three as the death-like ecstasy seized us, and we sank in that half-unconscious state of supreme bliss. It was some time before any of us spoke a word. The doctor rose first, and without drawing his prick from the delicious orifice in which it had been engulfed, showed by the way it hung down its pendant head, that Ant had at all events allayed its stiffness. He desired Ant to rise also, but I felt by her throbbing cunt, and the pressure she put on my prick, as she rose from it, so that it came out with a loud flop, that she would fain once more have done me the service of allaying any stiffness that might re-arise. However, it was much limper than before, although still of a goodly thickness. When she got on her legs, she stooped forward, kissed it, took it in her mouth, and most lovingly sucked it, saying how delighted she would be to relieve me whenever it was troublesome. They begged me to get up and dress, and we should meet at breakfast. They then withdrew, to complete their own toilets. I lay for some minutes in the dreamy delight of thinking over the delicious event that had just taken place, and amused at the last remark of my aunt, which seemed to infer that she thought I was innocent of the real meaning of the performances that had just taken place. I determined to act as if it were so. We met at breakfast, and kissed me most lovingly. I thanked her for her great kindness in relieving me from pain in so delicious a manner, and told her I could not help loving her more than I had ever loved anyone before and said I hoped she would kindly relieve me every morning, for I always suffered at that time from the painful hardness, though I should never be sorry for that, as long as she would so kindly allay it. I put my hands quite in a childish way on each cheek, and held up my mouth for a kiss, which was given to me in the lewdest way. She called me her dear boy, and told me that she would always help me as she had done that morning, as long as she found I was discreet, and never told how she did so. You may be sure that my promises were most earnestly reiterated. So we kissed again, and sat down to an excellent breakfast with sharpened appetites from our early exercise, and did full justice to the viands set before us. The doctor gave me a book of history, and desired me to read for a couple of hours, and said that at luncheon we would talk over the subject of my reading. 
I studied attentively for the time prescribed, and then aunt came to ask me to walk in the grounds with her. Insensibly or not, she led me to the summer house, and sat down on a low ottoman. I sat down beside her. She drew me to her, kissed me, and clasped me to her bosom, murmuring terms of endearment, and pressing me to her glorious bubbies. Of course, my unruly member fired up at once. To prevent her imagining it was lasciviousness that prompted me, I said. Oh, my dear aunt, I do so want to piddle, my doodle at once gets as hard as wood if I at all restrain the inclination to do so, just feel how stiff it has become, will you let me go and piddle? My dear boy, I will go with you, and unbutton your trousers for you. We went among the trees. Her busy fingers undid my trousers, and helped to bring forward my lordly cock in its glory. Fortunately, I did want to piddle, and aunt held it up as I did so, her eyes sparkling with lust as she handled it, and her face flushed with her excited passions. She remarked what an astonishing size it was, gently rubbing it up and down. Of course, it became more rampant than ever. Throwing my arms round her stooping neck, I asked her if she could not again relieve the excessive hardness and pain it was in. To be sure, my dear boy, come here again into the summer house, where we cannot be observed. We entered. She put a cushion on the floor for my knees, threw herself on her back, and lifted all her petticoats well over her belly, exposing her very hairy cunt, and its splendid pinky gash already moist from her excitement. I threw myself on my knees, and stooping down, said. I must kiss the dear reliever of my pains. I kissed and tongued, until my aunt begged me to raise my body, and come upon her, that she might quickly put me out of pain. I rose, and slipped my stiff member up to the hilt in her longing cunt almost taking away her breath by the suddenness and completeness of the insertion. Her legs and arms were round me in a moment, and at it we went hammer and tongs, until we quickly spent with cries of delight, and sank in momentary oblivion, soon to recover our full sensations, and dash again on passion's furious course, this time aunt pouring down her hot boiling discharge before me, and again when she felt the torrent of my sperm shooting up to the top of her womb. Our final crisis was even more ecstatic than the first time, and we lay longer in the soft languor of the after sensations. The excessively voluptuous nature of her inward pressures soon re-illuminated all my libidinous desires, and refired my prick with renewed force. We soaked for a short time, each indulging in the delicious inward throbbings, until our lust could stand no longer such mere preliminary work, and stimulated anew, we rushed with freshened passions into the fray. The fiery nature of my lustful aunt paid down two tributes to Priapus to my one. This time our sensations were so ecstatic in spending that we really lost all consciousness, and lay for long locked in the closest embrace. I could feel that we were both becoming re-excited, but my aunt begged me to rise, saying that was enough for the present, the stiffness was allayed, and my weight was too much for her to endure longer. I rose but again buried my face in the wide gash of that glorious cunt, and before rising completely, I licked up the delicious foam, and even ventured to give, as it were, an accidental lick to her little knob of a clitoris, for she was not much distinguished in that way, she shivered with excitement, when I touched it, and even pressed my head down upon it, when she felt the pleasure pressure. My dear boy, what exquisite delight you give me, Continue for a little to keep moving your tongue on that hard projection. I did so. Her splendid backside wriggled below in the fullest enjoyment. She rapidly came to the ecstatic ending, nearly thrusting my whole face into her vast orbit, and spurting out a very torrent of sperm, all over my face and neck. She seized me by the shoulders to draw me up, that she might kiss me. My prick had regained its full vigor and could not fail to slip in of itself into that most lascivious and gaping cunt when it reached the entrance. 
My aunt started at such an unexpected result, but was too much gratified to hesitate for an instant. Throwing legs and arms around me, her supple loins were in immediate action. I myself was equally in a state of wild lubricity, so that our course was even more rapid than at first, and we both spent and sank together in the delicious after languor as soon as the ecstatic joy of the first rush of the exquisite discharge was over. My aunt, who could not but be most highly gratified, still kept up the appearance of relieving me, she desired me to rise, and said we must go, as luncheon time was at hand. But, my darling nephew, you must yourself endeavor to keep down your hardness, and not allow it to become stiff so often you will injure me with your violence. Oh, my darling aunt, you give me relief with such exquisite pleasure that my doodle seems to harden only for the purpose of your relieving it see how it is again bulging out of my trousers, for she had buttoned it up. She put her hand upon it, and squeezed it, but said, with a deep sigh, Come along, come along, or I do not know what might happen. She drew me away, but by the manner in which she squeezed my arm, I could feel she was herself still greatly excited. Her prudence alone enabled her to resist further indulgence, as she seemed to think I was still unaware of the real nature of our proceedings. We found the doctor waiting for us at the luncheon table. He guessed by the flushed face of my aunt the nature of our late employment, and asked if I had been again troubled with my unnatural hardness. Yes, poor fellow, said my aunt, it appears that whenever he wants to piddle, and cannot do so at once, it troubles him in that way, and I have had some difficulty in allaying it. I succeeded at last, but I have told my dear nephew that he must endeavor himself to restrain it in the daytime, as it is not always in my power to relieve him. Quite right, my love, my dear Charles, you must endeavor to follow the wishes of your aunt. Of course I promised, and with such a look of innocence that I could see they exchanged smiles at it. We sat down to luncheon. Afterwards the doctor, seating himself by my side, began a conversation on the historical subject I had been studying. Our conversation became really very interesting. The doctor was a man of great erudition, and of varied knowledge and had a manner, special to himself, of making almost any subject most interesting. Hours flew by, and it was only when Aunt entered about five o'clock, to take a cup of tea, as was her wont, that we were aware how time had flown. The doctor praised my knowledge of history, and the pertinency of the questions I had put to him, in a manner highly flattering to me, and I could see that I had risen much in his estimation quite apart from any erotic influences. He proposed a constitutional walk before dinner, and much interested me by his instructive conversation during it. Our dinner was most agreeable. In the drawing room aunt, a most admirable performer on the piano, enchanted us with her skill and taste. The doctor challenged me to a game at chess. He was, of course, far superior to me, but he praised my style of play, saying I should become a great proficient with time and practice. We retired, as usual. About half past ten, the doctor seeing me to my room, and promising to bring Aunt in the morning to see if I was still troubled with that painful hardness. I thanked him warmly, but with much simplicity, as if quite unaware of the real nature of the application of the remedy. He left me to my repose. The quiet nights of sound sleep made my day efforts pass off without any exhaustion, and I felt my erotic powers increasing in force. I slept soundly, and so long that I was only awakened by the caressing hand of my aunt on my stiff standing pico. She had gently lifted off all the coverings, and I lay quite exposed to eye and touch. Oh, my darling aunt, how kind of you to come this early to relieve that troublesome thing. I held out my arms. She stooped down to kiss me. I clasped her to my bosom. Our lips met, and our tongues darted fiery lust into our bodies. She threw herself down by my side, I was on to her in a moment. 
The doctor took hold of my pigo, and guided it into the delicious orbit of his wife. Dear aunt begged me to do as I did yesterday, if I wanted relief. Our action became fast and furious. Her legs and arms wound round me in loving pressures. Her active backside wriggled in delight. The doctor had introduced first one finger, and then two, into my fundament, and added greatly to the fury of my lust, so that I spent in an agony of pleasure, as quickly as the fiery lust of my aunt produced her hot and plentiful discharge. I sank on her charming bosom, panting with the force and fury of our coition, but like all very fast fucking, my virile member hardly flinched from his first vigor, and a very few of Aunt's exquisitely delicious internal pressures sufficed to bring him up to the fullest stiffness. We were about to plunge again with renewed ardor into all love's wildest excitement, but the doctor insisted upon our first changing places, that he, too, might have his hardness allayed. Our change of position was instantly accomplished, and dear aunt, after impaling herself on my upright member, sank on my bosom and was clasped in my longing arms. The doctor scrambled up behind her, and lost no time in sheathing himself in her fine and beautiful bottom hole, and then we ran a double course of delight, dear aunt taking the lead as usual, and deluging us with her hot and delicious discharges before we were ready to pour into her a double dose of delight, which again made her spend with fury and cries of rapturous enjoyment, in which we both joined, and then sank in love's exquisite inanimation. On recovering ourselves the doctor withdrew, but I was already as stiff as before. Aunt began a most effective and delicious movement above me, which soon brought on another grand finale, and we died away in mutual delight. I could feel that the doctor was gently handling my cods, both during and after our last combat. When, by our mutual throbbings, he saw that we were about to become fit to enter on another career, he begged his wife to rise from off me. But the idea of losing her and her extra pressures made my prick immediately resume an erect position, so that when she rose from off it, it was shown in a completely standing state. What, again, Charles, said the doctor. Your member is sadly unruly. My dear, you must again try to allay it, but put yourself this time on your knees, and we shall see if that position be better adapted for the purpose of relieving this immense object. He was gently and admiringly handling it all the time. His wife was quite aware of his object, and, indeed, so was I. Our last bout had helped to restiffen his prick, and although not yet quite rampant, it was evident that when my bottom was in full view, and so placed as to be got it with facility, it would be quite as stiff as necessary. When his wife had knelt down, and by lowering her head had exposed all the wondrous grandeur of the most superb backside that ever met my eyes, my prick bounded with joy. The doctor still grasping it, and feeling it throb so wildly, saw that his game was sure. He pointed out all the beauty of Aunt's second orbit of love, and told me it was in that he had allayed his own hardness, and as the other orifice had not succeeded in quieting me, he recommended my entering within the narrow path of ecstasy. I professed no surprise, but seemed to take it quite as a matter of course in the simplest innocence of manner. Uncle continued to handle my tool as I mounted on my knees behind Aunt. Guiding the almost bursting weapon into the delicious cunt in the first place, to be lubricated there, and then telling me to withdraw it, he directed it to the smaller orifice, and desired me to push gently and smoothly in. It glided in slowly up to the meeting of my belly against the enormous buttocks of that sublime backside. There I paused for a minute or two within the throbbing sheath. Aunt had pushed her bottom well out, and by the action of apparently voiding, had facilitated the entrance. She winced once or twice, but on the whole, as she told me afterwards, took in my enormous tool with less difficulty than she expected. After a few slow movements, during with I caressed and devoured with admiration the glorious orbs beneath my dearest gaze, uncle desired me to lean forward and embrace my aunt's splendid bosom. As soon as I did this, 
and began slowly to thrust in and out of the delicious sheath in which I was so rapturously engulfed, I felt uncle's hands wandering over my buttocks, followed by the introduction of two fingers into my anus. My throbbings on them showed how much he pleased me. He asked if it added to the pleasure I was enjoying. Oh, yes, dear uncle, immensely. Then, said he, as I, too, am suffering from hardness, I shall try to allay it in your bottom, as you are doing in my wife's, don't be afraid, if I hurt you I shall stop. Do just as you like, dear uncle, both you and aunt are so kind as to do all you can to relieve my pain, and I should be very ungrateful if I did not do all in my power to relieve you. You are a darling boy, and I shall love you dearly. He knelt behind me, and spitting on his cock, presented it at my bum hole, and pressing gently forward, soon sheathed it to the utmost depth. He did not hurt me at all, as I was too much used to be dildoed there to have felt any difficulty of approach, but I deemed it politic to beg him to be gentle from time to time, as if it were a virgin veil he was entering. He fancied as much, and that was just as good. When once he was fully within, after a few throbs, which were felt most deliciously on his delighted prick, we proceeded to more active work. And, in the meantime, by more pressure on my prick, and by fricking her own clitoris, which I was quite aware she was doing, had spent profusely, and, as the case with all the mucous membranes of the body which sympathize with the cunt's discharge, her bottom hole became quite moist and deliciously heated. The doctor and I then went at it with fiery force, and soon gave down nature's tribute, and mutually poured a flood of sperm up the entrails we were respectively belaboring. We lay for some time after in all the luxury of soaking in the delicious apertures. I fell to nothing, and reluctantly withdrew. I had again become rampant, and keeping myself more erect, with a hand on either immense hip, I devoured with greedy eyes all the glories beneath my gaze. Fired by such a truly magnificent sight as these huge buttocks were, when in an entire state of wriggle, I again spent with cries of agonized delight, and in all the ecstasy of fully satiated lust, sank almost insensible on the broad and beautiful back of my aunt, who herself had spent several times, squealing like a rabbit, and eventually falling flat on her belly overcome with exhausted lust, drawing me with her still held a willing prisoner in her glorious and exquisite bottom hole. We lay entranced for some time, until the doctor, who, during our last bout, had purified himself, told us we must now get up. With difficulty I tore myself from out of that delicious sheath, and rose with my cock at last pendant. The doctor congratulated me on the success of the last move. His wife lay still panting with all the delight of satisfied desire, and we had to help her up. She threw herself into my arms, and hugged me close to her heaving bosom, kissed me tenderly, and hoped she had relieved me of all pain. I was her own darling boy, and she would always be truly happy in relieving me of that inconvenience whenever it troubled me. I was internally amused at their continuing to keep up this idea, but I humored them, and appeared the most innocent simpleton, notwithstanding all that had occurred. The day passed much as the previous one. After two hours reading, Aunt again proposed a walk, which, of course, ended at the summer house, where again a pressure of water brought on the painful hardness, which Aunt succeeded in allaying after four most exquisite bouts of love varied by a thoroughly good double gamma hutch between the last two acts. Aunt must have spent at least ten times, and appeared thoroughly contented, but continued to attribute it to her gratification at having relieved me of my painful hardness. Again I passed hours in instructive conversation with my learned uncle and after a similar evening to the last, retired at our usual hour. Next morning I was awakened by uncle alone, who told me that my aunt was somewhat poorly, and could not come. I am sorry it is so, for this little fellow is as hard as usual. Oh, I am so sorry dear aunt is poorly, both on her account and my own. 
What shall I do, dear uncle? It is so hard and painful. Well, my dear boy, I must try to allay it myself. I love you too dearly to leave you in this state. I am not so good at allaying this painful attack as your aunt, but as you know you were successfully relieved in her bottom, and I in yours, yesterday, we shall try today if I can accommodate this huge fellow, of which I have some doubts. Take off your nightshirt as I do mine, it will be more commodious. In an instant we were both stark naked. We threw ourselves into one another's arms and lovingly kissed each other. Our tongues met in a delicious sucking our hands took each a prick, and we had a most exciting and loving embrace. The doctor then took my prick in his mouth, sucked it a little, and well lubricated it with his saliva, spitting on the lower part of the shaft and rubbing it round with his finger. He then knelt, and presenting a really beautifully rounded bottom of the fairest hue, he pushed it out, showing a light brown corrugated bum hole, most tempting to look at. He desired me to wet it with my saliva. I stooped and applied my mouth and tongue to the appetizing morsel, and thrust my tongue in as far as it would go to his evident delight, leaving it well moistened. I then brought my prick to the entrance, he shoved his backside well out, and acted as if he desired to void himself. A firm but slow pressure quickly engulfed the knob. The doctor desired me to rest a moment, and drop some spittle on the shaft. Again it was firmly pushed forward, and gradually it won its way up, the belly against the buttocks, without much flinching on the doctor's part. After resting a while, he desired me to bend forward and feel his cock while I should move backwards and forwards in the sheath until I was relieved. I had a most delicious fuck. The doctor's bottom hole was quite hot internally. His pressures with the sphincter were exquisitely delicious, and he had acquired the charming side wriggle so exquisite in quim fucking. Of course this was an old ledge of his, which his position as schoolmaster had given him so many opportunities of indulging in, and the still greater pleasure of initiating others in it. At this very moment he was delighted with his delusion about me in that respect. Of course I never undeceived him, and he had all the extra delight of the idea. My younger and hotter passions had made me spend before he could, so after indulging me in a delicious soak after the ecstasy of the discharge, he drew my attention to the rigidity of his own member, which, he said, I must now allow him to allay in turn. Of course, my dear uncle, I am too sensible of your great kindness in relieving me to hesitate about giving you the same relief. I now withdrew. He rose for a mutual loving embrace, and then I stooped, and taking his fine milk-white prick with its lovely vermilion knob into my mouth, most deliciously sucked it, making my tongue tickle the entrance to the urethra, to his infinite delight. He murmured out soft terms of endearment, then getting exceedingly lewd, he begged me to kneel down as he had done. He then kissed and gamma hutched my bottom hole, making my prick stand and throb again with delight. Then spitting on his prick he quickly sheathed it in my glowing backside. After pausing to enjoy the exquisite pleasure of complete insertion, he stooped, and passing a hand round my belly laid hold of my stiff standing prick with one hand, while he gently pressed the ballocks with the other. We then proceeded to active measures. He soon made me spend, which I did with loud cries of delight, giving him the most exquisite pleasure by the pressures the act of spending made me exercise on his pleased prick. He soon resumed his thrusts, and eventually we both spent together in the most ecstatic joy. I sank forward on the bed, dragging the doctor with me still embedded in the rapture-giving aperture of my backside. We lay long in all the enchantment of delight. At last he withdrew completely reduced, but was surprised to see me still in a rampant state. When I got up he took my prick in his hand, praised its noble proportions, and again stooping, took it in his mouth, fricking the lower shaft with one hand, he then introduced two fingers into my bottom hole,
continued his suction and movement on my prick in unison with the working of his fingers up my bum hole, and in this manner quickly produced a delicious discharge in his mouth. I had placed my hands mechanically on his head, and I nearly choked him as I thrust my prick halfway down his throat as I spent. He greedily swallowed every drop, and then rising, embraced me lovingly, telling me I had given him the greatest treat in the world, and he loved me dearly. After this he invited me into his dressing room, and we both entered the bath together and mutually laved each other. Then dressing we joined aunt at breakfast. She had not the least air de un malade, but with a sly smile hoped the doctor had proved as efficient as herself. Oh, yes, my dear aunt, and I am so much obliged to both of you for your solicitude to relieve the pain I suffer in the morning, but it seems to me that it more frequently and more severely attacks me than ever. I only hope I shall not tire out your kindness by such frequent appeals to your aid. Oh, my darling nephew, do not imagine anything of the sort. We are but too happy to be of any service to you. This was accompanied with a knowing smile cast at each other, caused by my apparent uncommon simplicity, but which they were evidently glad to see. We sat down and enjoyed a capital breakfast. The day passed quite as the two preceding ones. Aunt asked me to walk with her, and as before ended by leading me to the summer house, where, after relieving my distress symptoms, as she called them, three times, and finding that the relief was still inefficacious, she proposed to try if by adopting my uncle's position she could not be more successful. So kneeling on the low ottoman, and throwing her clothes over her back, she exposed all the glories of that most splendid backside, and dazzled my sight with its huge magnificence and ivory-like surface, perfectly milk-white, the pureness of which was equally perceptible through the rich light curly hair that spread bush-like between her legs, and wandering beautifully upwards between the cheeks of the enormous orbs, stole round the charming corrugated aperture that I was about to penetrate. The rosy circle of which appeared all too small to admit my very large virile member. I threw myself on my knees, and first licking out the wide open lips of her wondrously fine cunt, and taking care to pay my respects to the small knob of her indurated clitoris, I transferred all my attention to the smaller and most charming orifice. After kissing it most lovingly, I thrust my tongue in as far as it would go, and rolled it about to her infinite delight while with my left hand below I kept pressing and frigging at her excited clitoris. She wriggled her glorious backside in all the agonies of the delicious excitement until she spent most profusely, actually hurting my tongue with the tightness of the squeeze her sphincter muscle gave as she poured down her plentiful discharge over my chin and neck. In her grand excitement, and wild with the fury of her lust, she cried out. Oh, fuck me, my darling and shove your glorious prick into my bottom hole. Oh. Fuck 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 me directly. Inwardly delighted at this natural outbreak of her passions, naming matters by their more appropriate terms, I replied by acts, without any words at the moment. It may well be imagined I was myself in the most rampant fury of desire. So bringing my raging prick up to her magnificently large cunt, all foaming as it was with her recent discharge, I plunged with a furious bound up to the cod piece at once. She met my forward lunge with a backward push and a cry of delighted satisfaction. I moved a few times in and out, so that my prick was white with the foam of her delicious cunt. Then suddenly withdrawing, I presented it at the entrance of the more secret temple of Venus, and more gently pushed it home she helping me without thrust buttocks and outward straining of the entrance, so that I most charmingly glided slowly into the glowing furnace that was awaiting with such lascivious desire to engulf and devour my longed-for prick. For, as I have before observed, my dear aunt was gluttonous of a bottom fuck, after being so fucked in cunt as I had already served her. It was so deliriously tight and hot that I lay in the exquisite rapture of complete insertion for some minutes. I had seen my aunt's arm move in a manner to convince me she was frigging her own clitoris, in fact, 
the movement of her hand frigging herself was felt by my cod piece. I let her continue, until finding by the involuntary wriggling of her bottom that she was about again to spend, I aided her with my prick, and had hardly made many moves before she poured down another tribute of lust, with a squeal of delight, and with such pressure on my prick as nearly drove him at once to a similar discharge. I did my best, and succeeded in not following suit. My aunt was insatiable, and I was glad to let her spend as often as possible, and I so managed matters that she spent again before joining me in the final crisis, which seized us together, and we died away in joyous cries of thoroughly, though but momentarily, satisfied desire. I sank on that magnificent back, as the languor that follows the ecstatic moment overtook me, but it was only for a short time. The exquisite internal pressures that my amorous and glorious aunt was exercising on my delighted prick were too exciting not to rapidly produce a reaction, nonetheless rapidly that it was in such a delicious retreat as the pleasure-giving aperture of that gloriously exciting backside. I was lying down on her broad back, so passing one hand round to her large but firm bubby, I took its nipple between my fingers. The other hand sought the knob of her still stiff clitoris. I excited both while making a very gentle move with my hardly fully standing prick. I felt at once how this gratified her, indeed, she often afterwards assured me that such frigging, with the movement of the softened prick gently working within her, was most exciting, and almost better than when it was in full force. I soon made her spend again. Another of her delights was to have a stiff prick shove away into her the instant after she had spent, when she herself was at the moment incapable of action on her part. She in after days proved that her greatest pleasure was to have a fresh standing prick near, to take the place of one that had made her spend, and had spent itself, and have it thrust into her with all the vigor and lust the sight of the previous fucking had inspired and fired it with. At this moment, as I had not spent, it was the exact counterpart her libidinous imagination could have desired. I fucked and frigged on until we both gave down in cries of joy our united tribute to Venus. We both sank this time down on the couch in utter forgetfulness of all but the ecstatic bliss with which we were overcome. We long lay soaking in all the delightful sensations my adorable aunt's convulsive clutchings of my prick with her delicious close pressures excited. At last she begged me to withdraw, although she could feel me now restifening under the delights of that exquisite interior. I would fain have recommenced. You must not, my dear boy, it is more than nature can support, and I must consider your youth, you have delighted me even beyond previous delights rise then my love, and let me embrace, thank, and love you as I shall always do. I rose and we threw ourselves into each other's arms, lovingly kissing and tonguing each other. Aunt then buttoned me up, first kissing and taking a mouthful of my prick for a moment between her lips, and then putting him away, calling it my pretty doodle. I seized the expression, and said, Dear Aunt, you called it my prick just now, and begged me to fuck you, and to shove it well into your cunt. Are these the real names for my doodle and your fanny, and what does fuck mean, my darling aunt? Do tell me, dear auntie, and teach me the language I ought to use when you are so kindly relieving me of the pains of my now so frequent hardness. I don't know whether you have observed it, dear auntie, but I never enter this summer house with you, but it becomes painfully hard at once to be sure you give me such exquisite pleasure in relieving me that I could wish to have constant hardnesses as long as you were near to calm them. Is this natural, dear aunt, or a disease? Pray tell me, and teach me all the endearing terms you so lavish upon me while I am reducing my hardnesses. My apparent simplicity evidently pleased her. She probably thought, too, that as I must sooner or later really thoroughly understand the nature of our intercourse, it would be much better she should, as it were, make a confidant of me, and attach me more securely to herself. She begged me to be seated and she fully explained everything to me. 
Of course I was even better acquainted than herself with all she communicated, but I confirmed the idea she evidently entertained of her being my first instructress by various naive remarks on all she was telling me. Of course I proved an apt scholar, and by my close put questions brought out all her own knowledge, and left nothing for me to learn. At the end, I said. Do all women have such a delightful sheath cunt I mean between their legs as you have, dear aunt? Yes, my darling, but you must never stray to others, you will find none so fond of you, or I may add, without vanity, so capable of satisfying this dear fellow, but come, I see it will be dangerous to allow him to stay here longer. She rose, but I quickly unbuttoned and produced my prick in an almost grander state than ever. I begged of her to let me have one more fuck now that I knew what it all really meant. I put it into her hand. Her own previous descriptive lesson had aroused her lasciviousness. She fondly grasped it, and stooping down, kissed it, saying she could not resist its eloquent look. Throwing herself back on the couch, with her clothes up, her feet on the edge, and her legs apart, her glorious cunt lay open in its moist magnificence. I threw myself on my knees and Gama hutched her until she spent, and now, knowing her greatest ledge, I instantly brought my bursting prick up to her foaming cunt, plunged in and began a furious movement, accompanying it with all the most endearing body phrases she had just, as she thought, taught me. Oh, my most gloriously cunt aunt, do I fuck you? Wriggle your arse faster that's it. Do you feel my prick up to the hilt in your delicious cunt? Oh. What pleasure you do give me. She replied as broadly. Passing her hand down she pressed my cods, and asked if thus squeezing my ballocks added to my pleasure. Oh, yes, my love, your cunt, your arse, your bubbies, are all delicious. Oh. I never before knew there could be such additional pleasure to our fucking as using these endearing words produce. We were both so excited by the body terms we so profusely used that we went off in the utmost excess of ecstasy, and died away thoroughly satiated with our libidinous and most lasciviously delicious fuck. It was time to finish. So sliding off her, I again buried my face in her delicious gaping and foaming cunt, my mouth, lips, nose and cheeks were covered with sperm, she drew me to her lips and licked it all off. Then repairing our disordered dress we returned to the house, and found the doctor impatiently awaiting us. Our flushed and excited faces at once showed that we had been indulging in the greatest excess. He joked aunt upon her skill in allaying such frequent attacks as I now appeared subject to. Aunt informed him that she had inadvertently in her lust made use of expressions which had betrayed so much to me that she had found it necessary to leave me nothing more to learn, and I was now fully aware of the true nature of our connection, after luncheon he himself might further enlighten me, for she was certain that complete confidence would be the best policy to pursue, it must come about, sooner or later, and it was far better it should come from him than that I should learn it. Elsewhere. He said she was quite right, and that he would further instruct me after luncheon, so we set to work on the viands before us, to which I did ample justice. I was thus, as they supposed, newly initiated in the mysteries of the coition of the sexes. I shall reserve further details of our more intimate and expansive experiences for the third volume of this true romance of lust, and still of early experiences. End of Volume 2